Show Me a Second Chance. A Cowboy Crossing Romance. Written by Alexa Verde. Text, Copyright 2020 by Alexa Verde. Production Copyright 2022 by Alexa Verde. Chapter 1. Hitting the steering wheel with her forehead wasn't in Kimberly Bird's intentions. But with her eyelids heavy as if filled with lead, it seemed like only a toothpick in each eye could keep them open after a mad drive from Chicago to rural Missouri. She should have flown in, of course. She pulled her tired shoulders back as she peered at the road winding among sprawling emerald green hills. Nearly the same shade as her first love's eyes. Her heart, the traitor, fluttered, and she shook her head. No thinking like that. She wasn't returning to this small town over two decades later because she wanted to see Mac. Not at all. She'd closed that chapter of her life and placed it into the furthest corner of her mind's bookshelf. Anyway, after she'd broken her promise to return here at 18, even if for a good reason, he wouldn't want to see her. Her heart squeezed. She tipped her chin up and took a deep breath of air freshener with her favorite peach scent. Since childhood, the fragrance reminded her of her uncle's B&B in Cowboy Crossing, Missouri, and the taste of his wife's peach cobbler. Her aunt by marriage, but everyone in town called her Mrs. Annie, so Kimberly did, too. Longing for the happiest times in her life and regret for all she'd lost waltzed through her. An inseparable couple, unless guilt stepped in. The sun's warm golden glow basking the horizon promised not only a new day but also a new life. Or the possibility to stay alive? She shook her head again as her insides went cold. The stalker was part of her hyperactive imagination. It had to be. Her life as a brand manager, soon hopefully to become an advertising executive, was as exciting as watching paint dry. Besides, with her plain looks and extra pounds, any new pounds were noticeable on a petite frame, okay, a stalker would have to be bored out of his mind to follow her. She blinked, redirecting her focus. The show-me state's peaceful landscape was so different from the skyscrapers and rumble of Chicago she'd left behind. Nostalgia stirred her. She'd missed these luscious fields and the quaint small town she'd reach in a few minutes, her uncle's B&B where she'd spent blissful summers when she'd been a kid, then a teen. Her heart made a strange movement in her chest. She also missed Mac, his easy smile, his ability to make her laugh, his rare green eyes lighting up as they looked at her, and his gentle arms as he'd held her for the first time. Her fingers tightened around the steering wheel as she put more miles between herself and her imaginary stalker. She couldn't afford any distractions, and Mac was just a beautiful memory with a bittersweet flavor. It should be much easier here to notice a tail than in Chicago. She shivered as she glanced in the rearview mirror. No cars had passed her in the last hours, and no vehicles trailed her now, besides a tractor far away. A chuckle escaped as she twisted her grip on the steering wheel. She didn't have to worry about someone chasing her in a tractor. Finally, a sign announced Cowboy Crossing was ahead. Just in time. She frowned at the arrow showing her tank was on empty. Her stomach growled. On empty, too. As she entered the quiet town and passed familiar establishments, she zoomed in on the gas station. She needed gas and might as well buy a cup of coffee and a pastry at the little convenience store inside. While her uncle would have something for her to eat, she'd rather not impose. After all, she was arriving unannounced. After over two decades of absence. Good thing her uncle and his wife were the most hospitable people she'd ever met. She pulled up to an empty pump and waited a few seconds before getting out of the car. The last few days had taught her to watch over her shoulder and check before she left vehicles or buildings. A black car pulled up to the convenience store, and she tensed. Then her uncle's elderly neighbor, Mrs. McGuire, wobbled out of the old sedan, and Kimberly released a nervous laugh. She hesitated before paying with a credit card because she didn't want to leave a paper trail. But she'd bought this prepaid card at a grocery store, so it should be okay, right? Ugh. She'd watched too many TV detective stories and law dramas. Really? By now, she'd likely learned enough to be halfway through getting a law degree if she wanted. She swiped the card and pumped gas, inhaling familiar car fumes that tainted unfamiliar fresh air. 
Unlike her father, who'd made avoiding his issues an art, she was so not made to be on the run. Didn't want to be on the run. Hopefully, being in this town would help her regroup, figure out who'd been pursuing her and why, or whether indeed the stalker was a figment of her imagination, so she could return to her successful corporate career in Chicago. After all, her life revolved around that career and now the coveted promotion. She pulled her shoulders back. Most likely, the events of the last days were a string of coincidences. This was the worst time for her to leave Chicago, and she couldn't stay in Cowboy Crossing for long. Her stomach growled again while her head bobbed down. She jerked her head up. After the signal that the tank was full, she replaced the handle, looked around, she really needed to switch from detective stories to romantic comedies, and dragged her exhausted self to the convenience store. Ah. Uh. For the first time in days, her lips curved up. The scent of freshly brewed coffee was as sweet and welcoming as her memories of this town. Her insides warmed as if her stomach already greeted that delicious liquid. After many sleepless nights spent on urgent projects, coffee could have become part of her blood. Well, a coffee addiction wasn't nearly as bad as the other one. She winced and marched forward. A few minutes later, she paid for the warm cup of coffee in her hand and eyed the chocolate-covered donuts. The donuts would go straight to her already ample waistline, but she deserved them after hours on the road. In Chicago, she'd frequented a deli that offered excellent low-calorie salads and lean meats, more in order to stay healthy than to be in shape, and a compromise to occasional, but yummy, deep-dish pizzas and chow mein. But she doubted an establishment, like that, deli had opened here. She glanced at the couple of tables and chairs placed near the front of the store for customers to sit at while consuming their treats. Would she be safer there than locked in her car? Before she decided, someone placed a hand on her shoulder, making her flinch. Her recent training in defense techniques worked before her mind had a chance. She stomped her high-heeled foot on a cowboy boot and drove her elbow into a flat stomach. Her coffee flew somewhere in the process, but she didn't care as she rushed forward. She glanced over her shoulder to make sure she wasn't pursued. And stopped in her tracks. No. No, no, no. Even decades later and seeing him with his cowboy hat drawn low, she easily recognized Mac. It would be difficult not to. She turned around, her heart sinking to the tile floor at her mishap. He was a mountain of a man who usually towered over other people. His shoulders were much wider than when she'd last seen him, and now Muscle stretched his charcoal gray t-shirt and leather jacket while a black beard covered his face. Specks of dirt dusted his cowboy boots, and the family ranch insignia, a tad worn out now, blended into his buckle. Still, he was more handsome to her than any of the stunning cowboy-attired male models in the Cologne advertising photo shoot she'd managed. Regret, excitement, attraction, and guilt flooded her bloodstream as she gasped. She was used to men who sported tailored suits and sleek hair with not a single hair out of place, as well as those models who were supposed to take women's breath away. They never had any effect on her. Mac, with his rugged cowboy looks, took her breath away every time she looked at him. Like now. Her heart was slamming her rib cage. Apparently, she'd just taken his breath away, too, and not in a good way. As his hand pressed to his stomach, his shoulders hunched inward. Kimberly, I just wanted to welcome you back. So sorry. Embarrassment heated her neck and ears as she hurried to him. Considering she'd broken her promise of coming back to Cowboy Crossing, it was a shocker he even spoke to her, much less wanted to welcome her. Guilt, a familiar companion, twisted her gut. She straightened her height to its full capacity and tucked in her stomach, wondering how he saw her now. She wasn't a free-spirited, slim teenager any longer. She'd called her figure generous instead of plump and learned to walk in high heels and wear clothes that flattered her curves. And while she had a lot of issues, she'd grown comfortable in her skin. Yet, feeling strangely vain now, she wished she'd skipped ten years of Chinese takeouts and the great Chicago deep-dish pizzas. Okay, fine, make it twenty years. A girl of about five or six years old, dressed in cute overalls, met Kimberly halfway and started hitting her, her pigtails going up and down. You hit my daddy. You hit my daddy. Daddy? This was Mac's daughter? 
But how? When? Well, sometime in those twenty plus years I didn't see him. I'm sorry, sweetie. Kimberly didn't try to defend herself as tiny fists pummeled her legs. Max scooped the girl up. She didn't mean to hit me, honey. Right? He raised an eyebrow in her direction. Did he even doubt? Right. It was purely an accident. She stared at the small family as people started gathering around them. This was a public place, after all. He stepped aside, and she did the same. He smiled at the onlookers, then waved them to move on, and strangely enough, they obeyed, though they sent them curious glances. But then, something about his silent but confident demeanor, slightly dirty cowboy boots, nonetheless, showed he was used to people obeying his orders. She'd kept in touch with her uncle over the phone, and he'd mentioned Mac had managed the large ranch he'd inherited with his siblings after his father's death. Her mind told her she needed to leave. But her legs seemed to be glued to the floor as she kept staring at him. With each passing second, she picked up on things he'd probably like to keep hidden. His impossibly broad shoulders looked as if he carried the world on them. He'd become the head of the family far too young, and she hadn't been there to support him. He hid it well, but traces of hurt dimmed those chameleon green eyes that used to change color, depending on his mood. He was a man of few words, none of them about his feelings, so she'd learned to read his emotions by the shade of his eyes. They'd been light, salad green when he'd been curious about something, brownish green when he'd been at peace. And emerald green, fired with passion, before he'd drawn her close and kissed her. Blood surged faster through her veins. Then she looked at the little girl again, and her heart joined the coffee spilled on the floor. He was married. Married. He didn't wear a ring, but that didn't mean much these days. The mother of that little girl had to be somewhere around. Kimberly's stomach twisted. Why did him being single or married matter? Really? She'd only returned to Cowboy Crossing for a brief time, and after her disastrous engagement two years ago, Romance was the last thing on her list of priorities. No, it wasn't even on the list. Still, her body shifted toward him, and she had to clasp her hands not to reach out to him. It's been a long time. His eyes, once so bright and cheerful, became grayish olive. So he was putting up a fence between them, as if one was needed. Yes, it has. He drew his arms tighter around the girl. This is my daughter. Danica. Darling, please meet Kimberly Bird. We used to be friends when we were teenagers. What? Used to be. Friends. Her eyes widened. They were much more than friends. This was the first boy she'd fallen in love with. Ever. The only guy she'd ever loved because her fiancé had turned out to be one big mistake. Friends? Turmoil roiled her, but she plastered a smile in place, one thing she understood was advertising. She could advertise herself as not hurt. Or interested. After what she'd done, she should be grateful he called her a friend, even if a former one. Shards hit her heart as if she'd dropped a glass instead of a paper cup and it had sent shrapnel inside her somehow. Nice to meet you, Danica. A frown and tight lips met her plastered smile. At least, the fists were gone as the little girl studied her with eyes as green as her father's. The eyes were becoming lighter. She was calming down. Good. A few more people stopped and gawked, but after one movement of Mac's eyebrow and an acknowledging nod, they moved on. Apparently, he was a man of even fewer words now, and he didn't need even those. She'd loved summers at her uncle's B&B, especially in her teens after she'd met Mac. At 18, she'd looked forward so much to the summer when she'd return to the small town and see Mac again, counted days, even hours. Okay, minutes, too, but only because she was good at math. Then, without warning, she was back there. The sound of crashing metal assailed her ears, and the odor of something burning assaulted her nostrils. She'd prefer to die herself than the person who had. Pain sliced through her. Breathe. 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 Still, a moment passed before she could breathe again. 
before she struggled out of the past and into the present moment. Before the coffee aroma and Mac's signature scent of leather, horses, and his cologne replaced the burning rubber and gasoline stench she wished she could forget. Mac's enticing scent used to turn her insides to mush. Still did, and she had no right to feel this way. It was as if he was a skyscraper made entirely of magnet, and she was a needle drawn to him. His eyes narrowed until he almost looked intimidating. Yet she was drawn to him as if over twenty years hadn't passed since they'd seen each other, as if she hadn't disappeared out of his life, as if she didn't have a secret that needed to remain hidden even in this small town where everyone knew everything about others. Oh, and don't forget that she'd not only done him wrong, but he'd also married now. Guilt knifed her in a practiced gesture, taking one of the knives Kimberly had sharpened herself over the years. He was off limits. She licked her lips, craving the familiar taste of the liquid that could always, always make her feel better, even if at a cost. She shifted forward, eager to ask the question burning on her tongue with the same sting as that liquid. Mac, are you? Mr. Clark, I need to talk to you. A female voice made her look in that direction. An attractive tall twenty-something blonde hurried to them. Belatedly, Kimberly registered that the woman's path was where her coffee puddled. Be careful. Mac and she said in unison as they jerked forward. Too late. The blonde's foot slipped, and she landed on the floor with a thwack. People started gathering around again. Some of them were familiar faces. Most Kimberly didn't know. I'm so sorry. I dropped that coffee. Kimberly cringed as she and Mac helped the woman stand. More guilt piled up. If she hadn't been gawking at her first love, she would have asked someone to clean it. Are you okay? The blonde rolled her eyes. Except for a big brown stain on my behind and a few bruises, I'm doing great. I'll get this cleaned and have a wet floor sign set up. And, um, if you'd like to have my jacket, it'll cover the stain for now. Mac placed his daughter on the floor and shrugged out of his leather jacket. Mac in a t-shirt was a sight to see. Warmth of embarrassment and guilt for having the woman fall mixed with a totally different heat inside Kimberly. Those impressive biceps and washboard pecs should be illegal. He'd look great on a poster for that expensive cologne. Men and women alike would be falling over themselves to buy it, men for themselves, women for the guys in their lives. Kimberly swallowed saliva. Congratulations. She just slipped to a new low. She was salivating over a married man. People at work had called her cold and unaffectionate, and her fiancé had, too. They'd all be shocked to find out she was melting into a liquid pool to join her coffee on the tiled floor right now. She should hightail back to Chicago, as tired as she was. Meeting with a stalker couldn't be all that bad, right? When Mac introduced the blonde as his daughter's babysitter, the girl lifted her chin. A former babysitter now, I have to add. I'm so sorry, Kimberly said again, this time in Mac's direction. Apology flashed in Mac's eyes, too. I'm going to add a nice bonus and give you great recommendations. Danica tugged on his sleeve. Don't feel bad, Daddy. She was gonna leave soon, anyway. As my kindergarten teacher says, no one survives me for long. Compassion for the little girl tugged at Kimberly's heart. Oh dear. Mrs. McGuire fanned herself as she approached carefully. If it were me, I'd have a broken hip. I'm sorry, Kimberly said for the third time, suppressing the urge to fan herself, though, for a different reason. She couldn't have made a worse arrival back to Cowboy Crossing even if she'd tried. Chapter 2 After making sure the last of Danica's babysitters was okay and the coffee spill was taken care of, Mac wrapped his arm around his daughter's shoulders as she clung to his leg. Danica wasn't a clingy type, really, but since his wife had left them, succumbing to an alcohol addiction, he'd begun to feel extra protective of his gem. Heading a large ranch for many years, he was used to being collected and calm, even in dire circumstances. But after one flutter of Kimberly's eyelashes, his thoughts were in turmoil. How? Why? When? What? 
he hadn't expected her to return two decades after leaving with the promise to be back next summer. Didn't need this reminder of his broken heart or the strange feeling she was causing him now. His heart was galloping faster than spirit could. His favorite thoroughbred he'd refused to sell. Kimberly had obviously forgotten about him while he'd never forgotten about her. Besides, his daughter was his world now. But the frightened look in Kimberly's blue eyes, the slump of her fragile shoulders, didn't let him walk away. What had frightened her? When had she come back? Why had it taken her this long? He moved closer as if to shield her from the crowd, getting a familiar whiff of her peach shampoo. She'd changed a lot. The girl who'd once been so desperate for her parents' love had more confidence in her blue eyes, and her chestnut-hued hair, ironically so close to his daughter's, was cut just below her chin in a stylish way rather than reaching way below her waist. Some fancy highlights shimmered in her hair, too. She was petite but grew curves in all the right places, but strangely enough, she still used the same shampoo, the scent he always remembered her by. Something that couldn't, shouldn't, be attraction unraveled inside him and he barely stopped himself from stepping even closer. Her cream-colored blouse offset her dark hair, and black slacks hugged her legs while she teetered in ridiculous heels that wouldn't be able to make many steps on the ranch. Probably looked professional enough as a brand manager in Chicago, he hadn't checked about her job, but her uncle volunteered that information. Huh. That outfit more suited the office than ours on the road, but what did he know about women's outfits? Navigating girls' outfits with Danica was difficult enough, though his daughter usually made it simple by choosing tomboyish things, like his sister. Fatigue shadowed Kimberly's features, and sensing something weighed her down, he suppressed a frown. Even all these years later, he was still tuned into her. Maybe a hearty farmer's breakfast was in order. Partly due to running prosperous cattle ranches, his family always thought a lot of things could be resolved with a good steak or braised ribs. Good thing this was Saturday. As he had a day off from ranch work, he was taking his little girl for the breakfast she'd requested. His heart leaped at the idea of spending time with Kimberly, but his mind protested. He should leave the past in the past. But he knew her well enough to guess she was frightened of someone or something, and he wasn't the kind of man to leave a person in need to his or her own devices. Danica and I were going out for breakfast, he said before he could change his mind. How do you feel about a cup of coffee instead of that one? He gestured where the spill had been. And something to go with it? Thankfully, the small crowd started dissipating. Tongues would start wagging soon, but he didn't care. Since his wife had left, Cowboy Crossing's best matchmakers had tried to set him up with different women, and rumors had been abundant when he'd made a few half-hearted attempts to find Danica a new mother. But none of them had worked out. The women had been interested in him, yes, but he'd always remembered how the two women he'd given his heart to had just given up and left, shredding it in the process. Plus, Danica hadn't made it easy. A few of them had been glued to chairs, one had been stuck in a tree, and another one had been coughing up her lungs after a spicy meal. Then there was the one who'd chased the Newfoundland he'd been pet-sitting for his brother when the large but astonishingly fast pet had stolen her shoe. After he'd started inquiring of the women he reluctantly had asked out whether they had good health insurance and whether they wouldn't mind signing a no-complaints-of-hurt-by-a-child agreement, for some reason the pool of volunteers had dwindled fast. Besides, beautiful or not, none of those women could make liquid desire run through his veins like Kimberly had done. Lord, why have you brought her here again? Please help me resist her, because I don't know how to do it on my own. Her gaze roamed the small store, as if she were on the lookout then flicked, to Danica. I don't want to impose on you. Danica pouted. I don't want her to go with us. I don't wanna. She hit you. He squatted in front of his girl. He must have been in a real stupor to ignore his gem like this. Darling, Kimberly lives in a different place. A big city. It's not like our town. There are bad guys there. She thought I was a bad guy when I startled her. She just tried to defend herself. Right, Kimberly? He pushed doubt aside as he looked up, his stomach tightening over Kimberly's reaction to a simple touch. What had made her react like that? 
had something happened to her? His tightening stomach twisted. Right. She lifted her arm as if to shield her eyes, and the sleeve of her cream-colored blouse rolled back. A glimpse at bruises, before she pulled the sleeve into place made him wince. Somebody had hurt her. He fisted his hands as if to hold back the lava-hot anger rupturing inside him. It's okay. No biggie. Thank you for the invitation and welcoming me back. But I should be going. Kimberly made a step back. Besides, your wife might not like me joining you, either. The reminder wasn't a sharp turn of a knife anymore, but a dull pain. She left us a long time ago. She. Well, she has an alcohol problem. Hold on, please. He looked into his daughter's eyes. Sweetheart, Miss Kimberly didn't hit me on purpose. And remember, we should be welcoming to other people. While his child was little, he'd learned to talk to her like she was a grown-up. It was better that way. He set his jaw. Besides, his daughter had to grow up way faster than he'd wanted her to. But you ain't a bad guy. The pout became smaller. You're good, daddy. He coughed a little. And because I'm good and you're a good girl, we need to be kind to people who visit our town. Visit. That was the key word. Kimberly had never intended to stay. She was a big city girl with her mind set on a big career, while he was a cowboy who happened to own a very large ranch now. But his heart didn't want to understand. Danica blinked. I'm a good girl? That's not what our neighbor said when. She was wrong. He scooped her up again, indulging in the opportunity to hide his face in her soft hair that smelled of her favorite papaya shampoo. Things hadn't been easy for his daughter, and she dealt with them in her own way which was often difficult for adults to comprehend. Then he lifted his face and pressed on her upturned nose. How about we get some food in your tummy? Kimberly's stomach growled, and her neck pinked. Um, I really should be going. Thank you for the invitation, though. He narrowed his gaze on her. I understand. Your husband must be waiting for you. Hurt flashed in her eyes. I'm single. Why that made him light with relief, he had no idea. The image of bruises appeared in front of his eyes. He wasn't the type to hold a grudge. If she needed help, he couldn't let her go like that. No matter that she'd promised to come back after the best summer of his life and never had. But he couldn't hurry his daughter, either. She had to make the decision herself. I told you so's didn't work with Danica. Yeah. Danica sighed out resignation. Her tummy needs food, too. Down, daddy. He placed her on the floor and took her tiny hand. Kimberly's gaze roamed the room again as she walked beside them to the exit, and when he opened the door for her, she hesitated before stepping out of the convenience store. He tensed. What was all that about? Chillin' and grillin' serves great breakfast, he said as they walked outside. Might be crowded right now. But no reservations needed. You're welcome to follow me. Oh, okay. I remember how to get there. Something flashed in her blue eyes. Regret? Nostalgia? Guilt? Wistfulness? Or all of them? They'd frequented that place as teens, when they hadn't been busy, her helping her uncle at the B&B or him working at the ranch. They'd spend every free moment with each other, but he shouldn't be remembering that. I'll meet you there. She strolled to her car. He had difficulty looking away. The shift of her hair above her shoulders still made him want to run his fingers through it, breathe in that enticing peach scent, and draw her near, like he'd done so often before. Daddy? A tug on his hand jerked him to his senses. Yes, darling. We're going. He picked up his daughter and bolstered her in the booster seat in his mud-splashed truck. Rich or not, he'd never been much for appearances. Then he stole a glance at Kimberly's shiny luxury car, its aquamarine hue matching her eyes. It wouldn't stay so shiny long here, but he kept that observation to himself. 
she was always a city girl with complicated emotions and high ambitions while he was just a country boy whose biggest ambitions were to have a few horses, to be a good member of his family and community, and to help their ranch prosper. He'd achieved it all, and he gave thanks to the Lord for that. But something was missing from his life all these years, and now he knew what. Or rather, who. Too bad the woman who made his pulse race was as elusive as the smoke from his barbecue grill. And just like that grill, if he became too close to her again, if he as much as touched her, he'd get painful burns. Can I have hash, browns, and eggs? Danica stared at him with her large green eyes that held too much sadness for a child, and his heart melted as always when he looked at his daughter. Even if he could understand his little girl's mom, Cassie, leaving him, understand her addiction being stronger than her love for him, how could she leave this gem? Maybe some people just weren't meant to stay. Including Kimberly. He'd be wise to remember that. Of course, darling. You can have all the hash browns and eggs in the world. He climbed into the driver's seat, watching Kimberly's aquamarine showstopper take off with a growl. Then he turned the key in his ignition, and the motor revved to life. Don't be silly, daddy. I can't eat all the eggs in the world. The small voice reached him from the back. My tummy isn't big enough. He chuckled as he drove off the gas station's parking lot. Sometimes he forgot Danica took all things seriously. That's okay, darling. You just eat as many as you'd like. And then you can ride your pony in the afternoon, all right? Yay! The voice perked up. He glanced in the rearview mirror and smiled. God might have taken his wife away, but he had left him with this precious, precious child. Something to be grateful for, especially when Mac had suddenly started to wish for things that weren't meant to be, despite learning otherwise the hard way. Minutes later, he opened the restaurant door for his gem and was met with delicious scents of fried bacon and potatoes. His stomach perked up at the idea of being filled soon. Kimberly waved from a booth in the back. With her luscious hair framing her features and large expressive blue eyes, she made more than one cowboy's head turn her way. His heart shifted. Not good. Not good at all. He'd been drawn to her beyond measure before, and she'd walked out of his life with an ease he hadn't expected. He couldn't make the same mistake twice. Especially now when he had his little girl to consider. He pulled up one of the pigtails that slid down as he led her to the table. Kimberly and Danica hadn't started on the best foot, and even if they had, Danica already had one mother leave her. If something, anything at all, happened between him and Kimberly while she was here and Danica got attached, her little heart would be crushed when Kimberly left. What if Kimberly considered staying? Would he give her a second chance? The voice in his head made him still. Daddy? His daughter tugged at his hand. Yes. Right. Sorry. He moved forward. No use entertaining that idea when there was no possibility anyway. Besides, too much history, too much hurt stood between them already. He wouldn't have taken their family estate to the level it was now if he'd given in to his weaknesses. He wanted to be like his father, a prominent man in the community who his family could rely on. As the oldest son, Mac owed it to the man. His stomach clenched. He'd never stop missing him. His father had left big cowboy boots to fill, and if Mac could continue in his legacy, he was going to do his part. As he and his daughter walked to the booth, Vivian strolled his way, her hips in a skirt that threatened to pop at the seams and moving in a way that he didn't want his daughter to see. All the makeup she was wearing could be divided between three women, with some left over, while her perfume could have doused another ten. Well, hello there, sugar, she sing-songed. We're pretty busy, but I'll make sure to find a table for you. Thank you, but we already have a table. He waved at Kimberly. Vivian's eyes narrowed as she sauntered to the table and smacked the menu on it. Welcome back, Kimberly. Nice of you to remember about our existence after all these years. His protective streak reared like an untamed stallion. He and Danica sat down and he opened his mouth to say something in Kimberly's defense. But she beat him to it. 
After a flash of hurt widened her eyes, she gave Vivian a bright smile. Thank you. It's great to be back among such friendly people like yourself. I'll take coffee with cream and sugar, please. And this place is special, plus whatever fresh fruit you have, no sugar. Suppressing a smile, he cheered her on. Huh. Coming right up. Huffing, Vivian turned to him. What about you, honey? What would you like, darling? He leaned to his girl. Hash browns and eggs, right? No. I don't want to eat those now. Orange juice. She named her favorite drink, and he could have guessed it. Then came the dreaded pause. Danica needed a long time to form her thoughts sometimes, and he didn't hurry her. While Vivian rolled her eyes and tapped her foot against the tiled floor, Kimberly shifted toward the girl. Would you like me to read you the menu? There are lots of yummy things here. I know. Danica's mouth pursed. Daddy and I eat here. A lot. She usually liked bacon, eggs, and toast at this restaurant. Okay. Orange juice it is, sweetheart. And maybe bacon and toast, if you don't want hash browns? He ruffled her soft hair, tenderness filling him. Being a father wasn't easy, but it was the most rewarding job in the world. Danica shrugged and stared into space as if going into one of her moods when she'd shut the world, and him, away. His stomach tightened. He'd taken Danica to child specialists several times, relieved beyond measure to learn that her mother's alcoholism hadn't seemed to affect her, at least not to the degree he'd been afraid. Though his daughter's social skills left a lot to be desired, her mental development was fine. Every day, he could only praise God that Danica was healthy. She was just different from other children, right? More silent and less sociable. While he and his family adored her the way she was, life wasn't going to be easy for her. Worry pinched the corners of Kimberly's mouth as she looked from him to his child, and his stomach clenched a bit tighter. He'd have to add one more requirement to the woman he could love and one day call his wife. She'd have loads of patience and understanding. Lord, does such a woman even exist? It obviously couldn't be Kimberly. Well, make a decision. Vivian's pencil tapped on the notepad. I have a lot of other customers waiting for me. She snorted as if she'd heard something funny. Waiting for the waitress. How about that? No point to ask Danica again. She was clamming up. Farmer's breakfast and water for me, he said. Bacon, eggs, toast, and orange juice for my daughter. Huh. Fine. Vivian stomped away, muttering under her breath. What was it? With a mother like that, no wonder the kid is stupid. That did it. Blinded with anger, he shot to his feet and reached her in a few quick strides. He'd never hurt a woman and wouldn't start now, but he couldn't leave it like that. My child is not stupid. She's just different, he said in a very low voice, but enunciating every word. Vivian visibly swallowed. I meant no offense. He took several deep breaths to calm down as she left and he returned to the table. How could he lose his temper like that? Vivian had given him hints she'd love to go out on dates, but he'd turned a blind eye on them. There hadn't been a single spark of attraction on his side, and later he was glad he hadn't taken her advances. While Vivian was well-built and probably attractive under all those layers of makeup, his heart had stayed silent in her presence, and she wasn't exactly a mother figure for Danica. His gaze moved to the pretty brunette in front of him. With her career-climbing attitude and a busy job, would Kimberly even want to be a mom, especially to a child she hadn't given birth to? He chastised himself. Many women combined a career and a family and did it great. But those women generally lived with their husbands and children and hadn't left after professing forever love and then never returning. It's good to see you again. Her soft voice touched something deep inside him, despite his best intentions. And your little girl is adorable. Danica looked up, and a hint of a shy smile appeared on her dear face, making the corners of his mouth move up a bit, too. For his daughter's smile, he was ready to forgive a lot. 
but not everything. Chapter 3 It's good to see you, too, Max said grudgingly. Never mind this turmoil of emotions, having Kimberly back, even for a short time, spread warmth inside him, too. Even if nothing could be between them again, time spent with her meant something to him. Once, it had meant the world to him. He resisted the urge to cover her hand with his. Too many eyes were watching them already. I'm sorry I didn't come back the next summer like I promised. I really am. Things happened. A shadow passed over her lovely features. Yeah, probably university preparations, the first step to her big career. But how busy could one be to not even return his calls? As the beginnings of resentment re-emerged, he said a prayer asking God for peace again. Resentment and regret could destroy something important inside a person, and he'd seen it too well in his younger sister's life. He said a prayer for liberty, too. Anyway, he hadn't fit into Kimberly's well-thought-out life, but he didn't want to think about it then. He was wiser now. Her eyes followed one of the ranch hands and widened, and her hand jerked to her purse. Who? Who is that? D, do you know him? He followed her gaze and glanced back at the broad-shouldered man built like a linebacker. Oh, that's one of our new cowhands. Oh. Okay. Her features relaxed somewhat, and her hand moved back on the table again. Worry closing his throat, he leaned forward, maybe closer than he should have, but he didn't want people to overhear, and that included his child. What's going on? Is someone following you? He kept his voice low while getting a whiff of her intoxicating sweet scent. How could a simple scent wreak such havoc on his senses? Was it because it caused too many memories of tasting her lips, holding her close? He shifted back before he could do something silly like reach out and touch the smooth outline of her face. Not anymore. I hope not. Her hand flew to her purse again, and she seemed to check something inside it. She glanced at his daughter. She obviously didn't want to talk about whatever bothered her in his daughter's presence, and he appreciated it. Still, he didn't like that answer, and concern tightened his windpipe further. But the breakfast tray arrived surprisingly fast, accompanied by the wonderful scents that made his mouth water. Maybe because he knew the cook well, or maybe because Vivian felt guilty for her outburst. He'd have to talk with Kimberly about what's going on later, without curious little ears nearby. If any violence was involved, he didn't want his daughter near it. As a toddler, Danica had been exposed to too many of her mother's drunken outbursts and while the child might not remember them, they could be the reason for her playground fights. Danica frowned at her plate. I don't want a bacon, toast, and eggs. I want a pancakes. He bottled up a wave of irritation. Then why didn't you say that? Instead of voicing that question, he prayed for patience. This place wasn't exactly famous for pancakes. Meaning they simply didn't serve them. She pushed the plate away and pouted. He frowned at her plate. His little girl had suffered enough, and he probably wasn't doing such a great job of being a father and a mother at the same time. If Danica wanted pancakes, then he needed to find a way for her to have pancakes. Yes, he was spoiling her rotten. But children didn't come with manuals, and he was navigating the country of parenthood the best way he could. How could it be that he could manage hundreds of employees and many acres, but stumbled when it came to his daughter? Well, he'd set boundaries on some things with her. He really had. A tender smile on her face, Kimberly bent to his daughter. How about you eat a little bit of the egg and a little bit of the bacon now? Then I'll see if Mrs. Annie can make pancakes for you at the B&B. During another pause, he held his breath. Then Danica scooped up a piece of egg. Okay. Huh? Okay. A wave of gratitude swept him up. He said grace, and when he was done, Danica added an amen. Kimberly kept silent. What had happened to her? She'd been a believer in their teens. So now God didn't fit into her busy schedule, either? He said a silent prayer for her. Then he remembered something. But your BNB is closed down for renovations, 
and I think it includes the kitchen. Kimberly's mouth opened and closed, and her face pinked. Oh. I didn't know about the renovations. She was here because she was afraid of somebody in Chicago. The thought formed quickly, but he couldn't pressure her for details now. A violent ex-boyfriend? No pancakes then? Danica's voice rose, and she blinked fast. Tears and a public tantrum would be next. His mind whirled. He couldn't give his daughter everything, he couldn't even give her a mother, but at least he could give her pancakes. Darling, I'll make you pancakes later. Honest. She took a sip of her drink, her forehead puckering. Daddy, I don't like burned pancakes. I like fluffy pancakes. Well, I don't always burn pancakes. Relieved she was considering it, he gave due to his food, the hash browns, and bacon, hitting the spot. Now she swallowed another piece of her breakfast and shook her head, sending those pigtails flying. Only when you cook them. Kimberly chuckled, then drank some of her coffee. Your daughter is quite a character. Ain't it the truth? The idea appeared in his head, but he pushed it away as he wiped a piece of egg from his daughter's face, then put a dent in his breakfast. This place must serve the best bacon and eggs in the world. Okay, so maybe he hadn't been outside of Missouri, didn't need to be when everything he wanted was right here, but he was still sure of that. Everything he wanted? He stole another glance at the woman whom he'd once wanted to marry. She hadn't wanted him, and it was better to find out right away than after years of marriage. Though to think about it, if he hadn't married Cassie, he wouldn't have had Danica, and she meant the world to him. Hmm, how about I cook pancakes in your kitchen together with your father? Kimberly finally scooped a bite of her hash browns. I'm not a great cook though. Yay! Danica clapped, sending a piece of egg sailing into Kimberly's hair. Let me get it. He reached toward Kimberly. No, that's fine. Their hands met halfway, and her pink lips parted. The lips he'd kissed so many times. Having her hand in his, lacing his fingers through hers felt so achingly familiar that he took a few moments to pull his hand back, while his body shifted toward her as if for muscle memory. His pulse raced, and his breathing went shallow. Daddy, can I show Miss Kimberly my pony? Now his daughter was putting a dent in her breakfast. He hid a smile. Apparently, the morning episode was forgotten, and Kimberly was winning his child with a simple promise of pancakes. Or maybe his daughter felt something was special about this woman who still had the ability to attract him. Hopefully, the danger Kimberly might be in was perceived rather than real, because he couldn't put his daughter at risk. As it was, he'd been doing his best to take care of his little girl, but he wasn't sure his best was enough. Something more than the food weighted the pit of his stomach. Danica had outbursts he had no clue what to do about. Not many of his friends could give advice about raising little girls. The ones who had daughters didn't have any similar issues. But neither could he leave Kimberly in danger. His gaze moved to her bare ring finger. Two years ago, he'd heard rumors about her engagement to some big shot corporation boss. Matt grimaced as he took a refreshing sip of his cold water. His heart hadn't crushed that night, no. It had just grown a harder shell than before. Maybe she could find happiness with a guy who shared her same goals and could help her get where she'd wanted to be in life. Something Mac could never do. The fact that she was single now meant. I'm sorry about your divorce. He wiped toast crumbs from Danica's face. Okay, he wasn't exactly sorry Kimberly was single, but he'd never wanted her to suffer. Pinched little crinkles edged her eyes, before she smoothed her expression. She poked at the huge plateful of fried food Vivian had presented her with, then bit into an orange segment from her fruit plate instead. I'm not divorced. His brows shot up. No? But you said you were single. Oh, I broke off the engagement. We had an argument, and he hit me. And when I told him the wedding was off, he hit me again. Her voice void of emotion, she took a few sips of her coffee, then finished her hash browns. For the second time today, anger like hot lava bubbled over and engulfed him. 
Then maybe, he remembered to lean toward her and lower his voice to a whisper, he's the one. Who followed me? I don't think so. I'm old news to him. He started dating someone else two days after I broke things off with him. She swallowed a few pieces of eggs, then turned to his daughter. Tell me about your pony, please. Danica beamed. He's brown and kind, and he likes apples and carrots and when I brush his mane. You must love animals very much. I can tell you're very kind, too. Do you have any other pets? Kimberly's soothing voice loosened the knots in his muscles almost as much as the true sincerity in her baby blues. She spoke as if she really cared. Go figure. Danica sighed. I did, but daddy keeps giving them away. Aha. Uh -huh. That didn't sound good. He sat up straighter, ready to defend himself. She attracts all the stray animals around. We have more barn cats than we can handle. But Danica and I do find them good homes. Well, after we research who could use a puppy or a kitten and have my veterinarian sister check on the animals and give them any necessary shots. Show Miss Kimberly how we do it, pumpkin. Danica lifted an imaginary kitten, her lower lip trembling and her eyes pleading. This kitten needs a home. Everyone says how nice and kind you are. Please help. Right, Daddy? Right. He chuckled, tenderness spreading through him. Okay, that approach might be emotional blackmail. But people had often thanked him afterward. Plus he didn't have twenty cats waking him in the morning and along with a reputation as a crazy cat guy. The Newfoundland mix, however, was a challenge until his younger brother had agreed to adopt the pet due to his little son's pleading. Kimberly's lips curled up. You must have great success. I mean, how can any person resist that sweet face? Oh, and I had a parrot, too. Danica perked up, loving the attention. But Daddy gave it away, too. Not his proudest moment. He coughed a little, then drank his coffee. Grandma needed company, he said loudly for his daughter's sake. Then he shifted to Kimberly and whispered, that parrot came from an old lady. She'd moved in with her children, and they wanted peace and quiet. The parrot was loud and had, um, a rich vocabulary. He also shared some details about the lady's life that were rather, colorful. His neck and ears heated. How did that bird even learn all those words? Okay, maybe the real reason he'd given the parrot into loving hands and patient ears was because he didn't want it to blurt out his secrets later. Not that he had many, of course. Smiling, Kimberly shook her head and took a bite of her bacon. Wow. Daddy was dating Ms. Tucker then. Danica was eating her food with gusto now. But not for long. Kimberly glanced at him with a strange look in her eyes. Jealousy? Nah, she didn't care for him, ask him how he knew. Even if she apologized now, it didn't change things. Oh, Daddy, tell Miss Kimberly about all the chicks. The girl grinned. They were so cute. Chicks. Kimberly sat up straighter. Cute, huh? He nodded as he helped his daughter wipe her hands. I'd even say adorable. I liked them a lot. Kimberly made a strange sound. Adorable. You liked them a lot. How many chicks did you have exactly? He lifted his eyes to the exposed ceiling beams, doing his best to remember. I think, about twenty. Yeah. Danica saluted with a bacon strip. Chicks loved daddy, too. Her lips pursing, Kimberly pushed her half-eaten plate away. I'm sure they loved your daddy. All twenty of them, right? Yeah. The girl nodded. They followed him everywhere. Huh. Kimberly tapped her fingers on the table. I bet they did. I love them, too. He smiled. Those little fluffy yellow cuties touched a soft spot in his heart. Kimberly made that strange sound again, almost like a squeak the little chickens had made. Yeah, but then they grew up into these big hens, and we gave them to people who needed them more. 
you know, to have eggs to make things like this. Danica pointed at her plate. As tension left her shoulders, Kimberly's whole body slumped forward. Then her cheeks pinked. Ooh hoo. You're talking about chickens. When the realization hit him, he barely contained a chuckle. Of course. What kind of chicks did you think we were talking about? Kimberly tipped her chin. Those kinds, of course. Then she leaned to his daughter. About stray animals. I think it's best to ask your veterinarian aunt for help when you see one. I picked up a stray kitten when I was a kid. It turned out it was sick. I had to have a lot of shots in my tummy. Right here. She pointed at her stomach. The girl listened, her eyes big. Did it hurt? Kimberly nodded. A lot. Danica turned to him. I'm sorry, Daddy. I don't want you have shots in your tummy. Or me. She sighed. But the kittens are so cute. He relented. You can get one. Eventually. Yes, he was officially a pushover. She must be taking after her Aunt Liberty, if not in appearance, then in character, though Liberty claimed a slightly upturned nose and freckles, too. Though Danica hadn't declared yet, unlike her cousin, she'd be a veterinarian like Auntie L, she'd already proclaimed she was going to build a big shelter for all stray animals because their human mommies had left them. Something his little girl could relate to so much. His heart ached. Like her aunt, the girl was outspoken and stubborn, and a part of him was glad she was Liberty's mini-me, hopefully, the girl wouldn't inherit such traits as her mother's alcoholism. He stilled and stared at Kimberly. She'd once admitted that her father had been drinking too much, something that had angered a teen Mac. Could it be that Kimberly, too? No. He shook his head. Look at her. So well put together and, according to rumors, successful. Kimberly leaned to the girl again. Maybe one of these days a cat of someone in town will have a litter, and you'll get your pick. Would you like that? But you'll have to wait. The girl beamed at her. Yeah. Hmm, Kimberly had always found interesting solutions. When she'd visited, he knew he could run things by her. His brothers were hot-tempered in their teens, but she'd been level-headed even then. Talking to her had been so easy, except that after some time he'd wanted to keep kissing her instead of talking. A wave of awareness zapped through him. Man, he didn't realize how much he missed her. No. He pulled his shoulders back. He couldn't afford a second heartache, couldn't afford for his little girl to come to care for someone who could betray her so easily. Danica drained her orange juice. Daddy, let's go. You promised to read to me about a little pony. He finished the food on his plate fast. Darling, wait. Kimberly is our guest today. Let her eat, please. The familiar pout appeared, but then she nodded. Okay, daddy. Huh. Amazing. How is the ranch doing these days? Kimberly asked as she munched on bacon. Great. He brightened. He'd never claimed this land. It had been the opposite. For as long as he could remember, this land had claimed him. Unlike his younger siblings, he'd never searched for anything else. This was it for him. Since he'd been a boy and his father had first taken him out and showed the endless green land with cattle, so vibrant with life, it seemed to breathe joy into his little lungs. His father had explained how these hills and meadows and trees had been here long before people appeared and would stay here long after. His dad had also shown him the importance of bringing food to people's tables and caring for the land, protecting it, nurturing it, and passing it on as thriving as when he first saw it. A little Mac had wanted to keep that sense of joy and wonder forever and do his part to make things on this land better. Future generations needed to inherit this richness and vibrancy. Now, when the ranch had expanded beyond his wildest dreams, he thanked God for all this. Something akin to apprehension moved through his limbs. He'd worked well with documents and animals, had a good eye for hiring people to work on the ranch, and had managed to work with them well enough. 
His personal life? Max got burned. Maverick, Liberty, and Cassie had blamed him for being inflexible, unable to understand other people's issues, to compromise. Mac inherited his father's high moral principles and was proud of it. But when he tried to apply the same principles to other people, it didn't work well. You've done very well then. As I expected. She smiled. I know how much you love this land. Her praise warmed him. Thanks. I wish I'd done better with my family, though. She raised an eyebrow, but didn't ask. Instead, she said, sorry about your dad. The genuine compassion, peering back at him, softened hard things inside him. Thank you. After their father's funeral, his younger brother, Maverick, had returned to auto racing as fast as he could instead of staying on the ranch to help like Mac asked. His sister, Jenna, had returned to Europe, they'd lost track of all the countries she'd lived in, and had barely spoken to him in years. All, because he'd insisted Jenna should think about her legacy instead of herself. Regret tightened his chest. He'd been young then. Angry, lost, and heartbroken. He'd said things to his siblings he shouldn't have. Maverick had come around, visiting for vacations often enough and supplying generous donations that had allowed the ranch to prosper. Jenna never had, and his soul still ached for the rift he'd caused. Was he inflexible and uncompromising with Cassie, as well? He'd done his best to make their marriage work, despite her alcoholism. In the end, that had been what she'd accused him of, too, before leaving and never coming back. Danica was the one who'd paid a high price for that. I'm almost done. Kimberly picked up a napkin. How about I make you a pony from paper to keep you company while you wait? A paper pony? Danica's eyes widened. Kimberly's fingers moved quickly, and the napkin took the shape of a pony indeed. Here we go. She gave Danica her handiwork. Wow. The girl ran her tiny fingers over the shape. Kimberly took a few more bites of her toast and pushed her plate away. Then she drained her coffee. I'm ready. He waved to Vivian for a check, and soon they were on the way out, Danica's tiny palm swallowed in his large one. Interestingly enough, his daughter had a skip in her step now, and her pigtails bobbed up and down in an adorable way. Had she, started to like Kimberly? That would be a first. All eyes seemed to be on them, and he nodded to the patrons he knew, which meant pretty much every person at every table. But he schooled his features in a way nobody asked any questions. Where did you learn to do origami? he asked Kimberly as they approached the exit. You'd be surprised by the things you learn while on boring business lunches. Just kidding. I learned it when I was a kid. She flashed him a smile while he held the door for her. Just like that, his heartbeat went into overdrive as they stepped from the air-conditioned building into hot summer air. He should be immune by now to that smile, to that coy flutter of her eyelashes, or to that intoxicating peach shampoo scent that brought so many wonderful memories. Yet he wasn't. Even if she'd left and hadn't come back until over twenty years later. Even if she'd broken her promise. Even if she'd changed a lot. He could recognize the facial features, but gone was the perky, free-spirited girl who'd once claimed his heart. The girl who could start dancing to her own tune in the middle of the field. The girl who'd laughed easily and made him laugh just as easily. The one who'd loved to kiss in the rain. Man, the memory shot a wave of awareness through him. They'd spend hours in his truck bed, watching the stars and talking, while he exercised his willpower to keep his hands to himself. He'd told her about his dreams to make their struggling ranch a prospering one, to change it from dairy farms to cattle ranches, to bring in new efficient equipment, and she'd listened to him. She'd said he could do it all, though he hadn't been sure at the time. They'd already had to sell more and more land to keep afloat. She believed in him when she looked at him with those trusting blue eyes as welcome to him as sunny blue skies in haying season. Yes, she believed in him, and her believing in him had made him believe in himself. That might have been the moment when he'd surrendered his heart to her without realizing it. Or maybe it was when she'd talked him into sneaking out late at night to go swim in the lake. They'd both been wearing conservative swimwear, 
but he'd never forgotten the shining of her blue eyes in the moonlight, the silky feel of her skin and her bathing suit fabric as he lifted her in the water. Going deliriously dizzy, he'd kissed and kissed and kissed her again until only his promise to God could make him stop. Those memories still made his pulse skyrocket, and his pace slowed. The woman who came back was different. Calm, composed, and poised. Gone was the mile-long tousled hair, torn jeans, or easy laughter. Maybe that was the way corporate ladies looked these days. He didn't know. It made him miss that dream girl more. He straightened his spine as they approached her swanky car. One could never relive the past. A black sedan with tinted windows pulled up into the parking lot. Kimberly winced, and her hand slipped into her purse again. She started pulling out something, but slid it right back in at the sight of Mrs. McGuire, getting out of the car with her grandson's help. Sorry. Kimberly clicked the purse closed before giving him an apologetic smile. I overreacted. It's just. A similar car followed you before? He lowered his voice and threw a concerned glance his daughter's way. Thankfully, Danica was too occupied with her paper horse to notice the commotion. Dread coiled in the pit of his stomach. Would he have to choose between helping the girl, a woman now, he'd once loved and was betrayed by or protecting the daughter he adored, now and always? Chapter 4 After they all visited the grocery store to get the necessary ingredients for pancakes, Kimberly followed Mac's truck to the outskirts of Cowboy Crossing, cringing. It wasn't a great idea to offer to cook. In fact, it was a bad idea. Her cooking skills equaled her spaceship operating skills, no, she could probably learn to operate a spaceship easier than she could learn to cook. People had claimed they'd gotten indigestion after having her meals. Severe indigestion. Something about her using too many spices, that was for flavor, or forgetting to add certain ingredients. After a while, she'd needed either to stop trying to cook for anybody or to ask them to sign the release from responsibility form. For office potluck dinners, she'd always shown up with takeout. She sighed as she made a turn. Nobody would touch her food otherwise. On the other hand, she was a great microwave operator. No kidding. She'd had lots of experience with that. Probably not far off from operating a spaceship, or at least cooking on one. So why had she suggested cooking pancakes? A longing woke up inside her, quiet and soft, like one of the kittens Danica had given away. Then it roared like a tiger. Because looking into Danica's sad eyes had tugged at her heart. Kimberly's mother had never bothered to make pancakes for her, no matter how many times little Kimberly had asked. It had always been cereal, cold as the woman's heart. Her mother hadn't cared for Kimberly's origami art or her drawings, and getting a kitten had been out of the question. Her father. Kimberly closed her eyes before flinging them open as if she could still smell alcohol. He did care when he was home and sober. It had been a rare occasion for both things to happen simultaneously. They did, however, care about her sister, the beautiful and talented of their two children. Kimberly hiked her chin as nostalgia and guilt danced a tango up her spine and interrupted the tragic dance only to throw daggers at her heart. No time, or need, for sad memories. She looked around as she drove up to the L-shaped hickory-hued ranch house with wide eaves, rectangular windows, and a gabled roof. A practical, no-nonsense home, exactly where she'd imagined Mac living. She turned off the engine and clicked her seatbelt open. As much as she'd wanted to spend time with Mac, she forced herself to find the B&B's phone number online and called her uncle. His wife picked up, thrilled to hear Kimberly was back. After promising to be at the BNB later, Kimberly disconnected. Mrs. Annie was the reason Kimberly didn't have many hang-ups about her weight, despite often supervising photo shoots of size zero models who seemed to live on air. She preferred the famous Chicago deep dish pizza, thank you very much. Mrs. Annie was far from size zero and always said that nobody trusted a skinny cook. So Kimberly had found clothes that worked on her figure, good quality shapewear and let her best friend and former colleague, Kansas, drag her out to jog in the park from time to time. Kimberly winced, remembering the mugging. Nobody believed her when she'd said that exercise could kill you. 
If that wasn't the proof, she didn't know what was. Never mind. She drew a shaky breath of peach-scented air. She wouldn't be jogging again. Stalker or no, there had to be other, safer, ways to keep healthy. She may not worry about her weight, but she did care about her health. She'd actively sought out campaigns that promoted diversity, including body diversity, and had also done a few pro bono. After one campaign focusing on a clothing line for plus-size women, she stayed friends with the company's executives who were full-bodied themselves. Not too close, but enough friends to meet up for lunch every other Friday. One of the women, who had a Russian background, told them a saying, men are not dogs. They don't go after bones. The rest of them agreed wholeheartedly. Smiling, Kimberly looked up Kansas's work phone number on the internet. They'd started out as competitors but had become fast friends when he'd discovered her secret and she'd found out about his predicament. They could be more than friends, and she tried so hard to fall in love with him. She couldn't. She closed her eyes and pushed out a deep breath, pushing out her regret along with it. He had his own advertising company now and frequently asked her to work for him. But she declined, voicing gratitude every time. She wanted to make it on her own, even if it might be more difficult. Her heart heavy, she stared at the luscious greenery surrounding the house. How had her life started to revolve only around her career? Was it to give her parents what she'd taken away from them, as they'd claimed, to buy their forgiveness? Or to buy their love eventually? Arg. She should have copied the phone numbers from her contacts when she'd bought a disposable phone and thrown away her old one, but she'd been in such a hurry to get out of Chicago, she hadn't had time. Good thing he had his business phone listed. Thankfully, Kansas answered fast. Hello. It's me. You can reach me at this phone number. Finally. Are you okay? He breathed out. Oops. Her tummy tightened. I know I should have called you earlier. I've arrived safely, and no tail so far. Good. His heavy exhale reverberated down the line. I still don't think it was a good idea for you to leave. I can't help you when you're far away. You've done more than enough for me. I appreciate it. He snorted. Getting you an urgent session with a self-defense personal trainer was the least I could do. That would be the trainer who taught her how to elbow Mac in the stomach. Not that she'd tell Kansas that. It meant a lot. You've been super kind already. That reminded her of another person who'd been kind to her, an elderly woman neighbor who moved in last month. Despite the age gap, they'd become unexpected friends. Would you mind stopping by Mrs. Becker's place and telling her I'm okay? She lives in the condo below mine. She wasn't home when I left. I wrote her a note telling her I was going, but I don't want her to worry about me. And please get me her phone number. I can't remember it. Sure thing. Okay, I've got to go. Bye, she said fast before he could ask any questions. Oh, must be something about that Mac guy for you to be in such a hurry. Kansas chuckled, before disconnecting. Hmm. Could be, Kansas was right. She hadn't bothered to ask him how things at the office were. Working in the same building and keeping abreast of the elevator chatter, her friend would know whether her company had one that coveted account. She searched inside herself for curiosity and excitement and found none. In the beginning, She'd loved her job so much, had wedded it in a marriage of convenience. With the long hours and few promotions, the job didn't return her feelings. Still, she'd felt like she was on a Ferris wheel, could see far enough to imagine the possibilities as she'd worked hard. Almost twenty years later, the job had started falling in love with her, lavishing her with promotions, praise, and high salaries. However, after so many years of loveless marriage, she'd lost her passion. The Ferris wheel had become a hamster's wheel, and the hamster was tired. She had to hold on to it, though, because wasn't it all she had left? Back to the present matters, which, unlike her job, made her heart beat faster and filled her with warmth, despite her common sense and regrets. Mac and his little girl, who could steal Kimberly's heart if she wasn't careful. After checking her surroundings, she got out of the car, 
breathing in fresh air with the scents of hay and leaves. The scent that filled her with joy and memories of her and her sister running in the fields when they'd been kids, gathering flowers. So naive, so trusting, so unsuspecting that and later. The door to the recollection slammed shut, making Kimberly flinch as if her fingers had been caught in the process. Not now. Mac and Danica stepped out onto the ranch house's wide porch, the roof supported by posts as large and sturdy as the man himself. Somehow, since Kimberly last saw Danica, she'd gained a large orange stain on the front of her overalls. The girl grinned. Come in. Come in. Come in. The kid must really want those pancakes. Kimberly's tummy did a nervous roll. She should have taken some culinary classes, as Kansas had hinted on numerous occasions. He usually added the helpful encouragement that, if she did, the instructor might quit. Mac's lips widened. Yes, come on in. Oh, how she missed that welcoming, open smile. She didn't even realize how much until now. He hadn't forgiven her for disappearing, though he could have called, really. But he'd welcomed her back nonetheless, opening his home if not his heart to her. That was the man he was. Once, she thought she'd deserved him. Now, with the secret of her addiction, former or not, burning in her gut, she wasn't so sure. Yet her heart flip-flopped, just from looking into his eyes, dark green now, from breathing his familiar woodsy scent as she passed him to enter the house. As she stepped inside, she took in the scents of wood and leather. The walls here had a lighter shade, a tortilla hue, and the wood floors and rustic pine furniture with a clear lacquer coating showcasing the wood's beauty appealed to her on a deep level. Oil paintings with horses and rustic furniture reminded her of her uncle's B&B, stirring nostalgia. A plush pecan-colored sofa stood out in the rustic place because it was covered with stuffed toy animals, including a pony, of course. A fireplace mantle displayed family pictures. She recognized his younger brother she'd met in her teens who'd apparently gotten married and had a boy, the younger sister with her signature green hair, and the family matriarch. From the people's expressions, she could see Mac and his daughter were thoroughly, deeply loved. Longing whispered through her. The majority of the pictures were with Danica, of course, and she looked even more adorable cuddling different pets, those chicks had truly turned out to be fluffy yellow chickens, or sitting there with her face painted. How would it feel to be part of such a family? Kimberly's heart shifted. She'd never know. He stepped to her. Make yourself at home, please. I'll drop the groceries in the kitchen, help Danica to change after her OJ incident in the truck, and then we'll be right back. I'm in no hurry. She did her best to dismiss a sting of envy as she walked through the living room. Her place, a condo, held much less character. She'd worked so hard to get that expensive condo and pay it off, a status symbol of sorts, the fact that she'd achieved something despite her mother saying she'd never amount to anything, unlike. Stop. Despite the growing addiction, Kimberly had put so much effort into keeping a secret. Shortly after moving into the condo, she'd hired a designer to decorate it. To this day, she couldn't figure out what the cubes and lines on the abstract paintings meant, or why she kept a metal charcoal gray table with sharp edges she stumbled against every time she went to the kitchen for a glass of water at night. Or, well, a glass of a different liquid. No, that part of her life had to be in the past. She'd gone through counseling, Alcoholics Anonymous, and a lot of bowls of ice cream, and then fat-free sherbet to do her best to cope in a different way. Wasn't it ironic that Mac's wife left them because she was an alcoholic? One more reason why Mac and Kimberly couldn't be together. Even if he could forgive Kimberly for not coming back, but again why hadn't he called or come looking for her, he'd never allow an alcoholic, even a former one, close to himself or his daughter again. Her throat became parched, and she craved the familiar consolation. Since she'd begged her father to let her have a few sips of his whiskey at 14, and especially after the accident when she'd been 18, it had become her friend. A dear, tender, much-needed friend. It had soothed the pain inside to make it bearable. It had let her feel like she had something in common with her dad. And when that pleasant dizziness swept her up, she didn't care that her mother had never loved her to start with and resented her over what she'd done at 18. Kimberly needed that comfort. 
oh, how much she needed it. But the friendship was a dangerous one. Her sister would have helped her with it, would have seen the warning signs, before Kimberly admitted them to herself. But losing her sister, being the one to blame for Serena's death, was the main reason Kimberly needed sweet oblivion to start with. Another irony, wasn't it? A lump grew in her throat, and she considered sinking onto the soft sofa, but remained standing. Even after four completely sober years, every cell in her body craved it. Just the touch of the bottle's smooth, cold surface was like a caress every time, anticipation building inside her. Confidence she'd feel light soon and the pain would go away. The first sip was almost a kiss. She'd hold onto the bottle and sip slowly as if she'd been holding the hand of someone who cared. Because after her sister died in that crash, Kimberly had lost the only person in the immediate family who cared about her. And she knew God didn't care any longer. She'd been drinking only on weekends, but the quantity kept getting bigger and bigger with time until she had difficulty stopping. She'd known she was slipping into the abyss. Still, it had taken Kansas finding her drunk, crying over a broken second bottle of wine, her palms cut by the shards, to try to stop. They'd been competitors then, and she'd been sure he'd out her to her boss and she'd lose her job. Instead, he'd scraped her off the floor, cleaned and bandaged her hands. The next day, he dragged her kicking and screaming, literally, to an Alcoholics Anonymous meeting, despite having to pay extra so his son's babysitter would stay late. That was real friendship. And the meeting went better than she'd expected. She'd even found a friendly familiar face there. Her father. A spontaneous family reunion. How about that? She shook her head. Enough of that, too. She slid along the smooth wood floors as if she could spontaneously break into dancing like she had in her teens. She wouldn't do that, of course. Wouldn't even think about that. Her condo floors consisted of practical checkered tile that should work well the day she'd get a puppy. That day hadn't come yet. She didn't even have a plant. As for family photos, ten years later, she still hadn't gotten around to displaying them. Maybe because displaying them would remind her that, after her sister's death, the family had fallen apart, and it was all Kimberly's fault. She nearly snorted as she ran her fingers over the poplar mantle's smooth surface. Remind. Like she could ever forget it was her fault her sister died and her father had left. A familiar pain sliced Kimberly's insides. She'd hoped so much that, if she'd worked herself to the bone through days, nights, weekends, holidays, if she'd become successful and bought her father the expensive electronics he'd loved so much or bought her mother the house she'd wanted so badly that things would become better. That she'd earn their forgiveness if not her own. She hadn't. Would the promotion she'd been killing herself over change that? Maybe not, but it was her last hope. Was it too much to ask to be loved by your own family? Stop. She looked out the window, edging aside curtains, matching the sofa's shade. Nothing suspicious, just lush green lawn and placid blue skies. And two cameras on the ceiling. She nodded to herself. Good. Could the assault in the park and the car she'd thought were following her for the last week be a coincidence? The police thought so. Taking some well-earned leave could jeopardize her chance at the promotion, no matter what her boss said or promised. Susanna would take any chance to get ahead, and Kimberly had just handed her co-worker that chance. She froze. Hold on. What if Susanna was behind the stocking? To drive Kimberly out of Chicago and receive the coveted promotion? She groaned and turned away from the peaceful landscape. Her hand flew to her forearm, and her fingers found bruises. Should she head back to Chicago? Chapter 5 No. It was too early. Kimberly had a week of vacation, and her boss usually kept his word. Usually. Her uncle might need her help in renovations, and. Though Mac had never mentioned it, he might need her help with Danica, too. Kimberly's heart did a slow flip just from the thought about him, knowing he was in the next room, breathing the subtle woodsy scent of his cologne. He'd been the first boy she'd kissed. For a long time, she'd wanted him to be the last boy she'd kissed, too. Her insides warmed at the memory, 
and her hand shot up to her lips as if she could still taste his lips, feel butterflies in her tummy. Oh no. She needed to keep her emotions in check and hightail it out of here at the first sign of danger. At fourteen, she'd been so mesmerized by the image of him when she'd been standing near the B&B's third-floor window that summer day, the sunlight illuminating new, unfamiliar feelings growing inside her. Thankfully, an honest character and moral principles solidified the youth behind those rugged handsome looks. She'd met handsome guys before, but she'd learned to grow careful of males after men at her father's drunken parties had started leering at her. Strangely, unlike teen boys, those guys had no desire for her beautiful ethereal sister but had an earthly pull toward Kimberly. When one of the guys had come on to her, it had taken her sister standing between his large form and Kimberly's cowering one, a kitchen knife in Serena's hand, for Kimberly to be able to escape. Once Kimberly met Mac, she'd found no threat but rather the solidness and stability she'd craved and lacked in her life. He'd become her universe, her sun, her world, cloaking her in the bright milky way of admiration and promise. We're back. Danica ran to her, wearing green sweats, a t-shirt with the inscription, Daddy's Girl, and pink slippers. Kimberly smiled at the girl, whose right pigtail was ask you again. How about I braid your hair and then read the pony book your daddy mentioned? She turned to Mac. That will give you a chance to put away the groceries. Danica cocked her head to one side, a habit that likely kept that pigtail slipping, and her face scrunched with thought. Ten braids. Kimberly blinked. She had in mind one braid. Her experience of braiding hair equated her experience of cooking and operating a spaceship. She should have just pulled up that pigtail. Well, too late now. Oh, okay. Ten braids it is. I'll need something to hold them with. I'll get you something. Mac sent her a grateful glance. Well I think I mastered the art of braiding, I never excelled in it. Oh, I know. We gonna braid my pony later, okay? After pancakes. Danica looked at them pointedly as if to make sure nobody tried to forget about her pancakes. Um, sure. Kimberly swallowed as Mac left the room. She hadn't been around horses for decades, and she sure hoped Mac had a very patient pony who didn't mind someone braiding her mane. Especially someone who had no clue what she was doing, with horses or braids. Yay! Danica clapped. Then she dragged a tiny upholstered stool to the sofa. I sit on it when Daddy braids my hair. Only he ain't too good at it, she said in a whisper that probably could be heard in the other part of the house. Sorry, darling. Mac entered with a pack of scrunchies and handed them to her. It's okay. You're still a good daddy. The girl gave him a bright smile. As he returned that smile, Kimberly couldn't help her own lips widening while she accepted the pack. Something was so endearing about this little family that she wanted to freeze the moment in time to carry with her and cherish when. Well, it was best not to think about it. She sat on the sofa, and the girl plunked herself on the tiny stool while Mac disappeared in the direction of the hall. As Kimberly's hands moved along the child's soft hair that smelled delightfully of papaya shampoo, she recalled the wonderful feeling when her mother had braided her hair. Once upon a time, she'd still seem to love both her children and not play favorites. The amazing time of being loved. The only other place and time she'd felt loved again was in her sister's arms and in Mac's company and at her uncle's BMB. Kimberly winced. She should have gone directly to the BMB, and her tired muscles screamed she could use some rest. A lot of rest. But as she worked on the child's braids, she didn't want to leave this place. Not yet, please. After all, she'd promised pancakes, hadn't she? Though it might be best for the child's safety if Kimberly didn't try to make them. Mac entered the room and sat near her, his proximity making her pulse buzz. You've done a great job. Let me see, Daddy. After wiggling the final braid, Kimberly hastily tied free from her hands, Danica ran up to a mirror in a carved poplar frame. Oh, pretty. Yes, you're very pretty. Laughing, he scooped his daughter up. How his laughter sang to Kimberly's ears. Her own family hadn't shown each other many emotions, 
probably because her parents had been brought up that way. Dinners together were rare, and outings were even less frequent. She swallowed a bitter taste. Let's read that book. He brought his daughter back to the sofa and studied Kimberly. Are you okay? You didn't receive a scary text or anything? No the reminder made her sober up. She couldn't get distracted by his easy laughter or the child's braids dancing around her darling face. She needed to figure out who'd been after her, or if it all was only a false alarm, and then her road led back to Chicago. Even if her condo seemed cold and uninviting compared to this place. She couldn't run away from her issues again, like her father always had. His job changes because he'd start missing too many days due to his drinking, constant moves from one place in the city to another hadn't exactly helped keep friends or make new ones for a girl who didn't have great social skills to start with. Would you like to read my daughter the book? He brought a colorful book with a pony on the cover. Sure. I promised it, didn't I? And I always keep my promises. She stumbled as his gaze became sharp. Okay, not always. She didn't keep her promise to come back. As she took the book, the air between them charged with awareness. She could stare into his green eyes forever, but she shouldn't. He'd taken off his Stetson and boots, but this cowboy had already branded her heart as his. And even decades apart hadn't changed that. She'd thought that, after so much time apart, she was over him, over his quiet strength and understanding, the caring look in his brownish-green eyes, or the ease with which he could lift her off her feet and make her melt with his kisses. He was still as intoxicating as alcohol, and coming back was a mistake. Like even breathing the scent of a drink that contained alcohol made her crave it with all her being, the woodsy scent of his cologne made her crave to be with him. Just the thought of kissing him nearly made her tremble with anticipation. But kissing him would be like drinking a shot of whiskey. Even one sip would make her an addict again. So unfair. She'd met so many handsome men in her line of work, from dashing executives in elegant suits to male models wearing scant clothing for photo shoots. None of them had made her heart flutter like Mac did. None of them made her desperate to drink in his kiss as if only he could quench her thirst. It was like he was some brand of alcohol already in her bloodstream, already part of her, and she craved, craved, craved to be with him, just breathe the same air, just look at him. She couldn't believe this, and she couldn't show this. Years of training to keep her emotions in check in the corporate world came in handy now. What a pity nobody opened Love Addicts Anonymous yet. She'd be the first to sign up. No, wrong. That should be Mac Addicts Anonymous. Looked like a lot of women in this town could benefit from those meetings, but she'd be the longest standing member there. With an effort, she turned her attention to his daughter. Well, pretty girl, let's get you on the sofa, and I'll read you this story. You're pretty, too. Right, daddy? He made a weird sound. Um, yes, of course. Very pretty. Heat rose inside Kimberly as he sat down near her then pulled his daughter on his lap. You probably say that to all your chicks, she whispered low so Danica wouldn't overhear. He chuckled. Nah, only the pretty ones. She started reading the tale, her pulse humming from him being so close to her that her knee could touch his if she wanted to. As she read, the scary thought lingered in the back of her mind. How to make pancakes. She was drawing a blank. During her work time, she'd relied on pizza deliveries and healthy meal delivery services, plus business lunches in between. The stove at her condo hadn't been used once and served rather as a kitchen decoration. Videos She released a breath she didn't realize she was holding. When she finished reading and Mac turned on Danica's favorite cartoons, she pulled up the internet and videos on how to make pancakes. Danica frowned. You Donna how to make pancakes either? Kimberly faced the girl's gaze as she left the internet and placed her phone into her purse, right next to her gun. She winced as her fingers brushed its cold, smooth surface. Well, no, but I hope to learn. I'm sure you'll do great, and I'll help, Max said. She gave him a wobbly smile, grateful for his encouragement. But touching the gun reminded her of her predicament. 
the one she might be putting Mac and his daughter in. She jumped to her feet and rushed to the window and peeked outside. Only fields and trees met her gaze. So she returned to the sofa, the unsettling feeling in her stomach not as strong, but not gone either. It was all part of my imagination. Wasn't it? I checked the inside and outside camera several times and didn't notice anything suspicious. He leaned to her as he whispered the words in her ear, keeping the statement out of his daughter's earshot. His hot breath caressed her skin, and the woodsy scent wreaked havoc on her senses. Surely, he didn't know what he was doing to her because, otherwise, it would be just cruel. I'm glad you have cameras. She did her best to keep her mind on the subject, but it wasn't easy with him this close. If she turned her head slightly, she could meet his lips with hers, feel again the incredible sensations of his kiss. Not that she'd allow herself to do it, of course. Well, at least she didn't bring danger to his doorstep. So far. I take my little girl's safety seriously. His hot whisper caressed her ear again. Close, so close. Her breathing became shallow. Th, thank you. Heat rose inside her. She hadn't started cooking, yet she already felt as if the room temperature was rising. Let's go, okay? He led her to the kitchen. Um, sure. She sighed since she didn't share his confidence in her culinary abilities. Why again had she suggested making pancakes? Well, besides other reasons, because the little girl had been so distraught, reminding Kimberly of herself when she'd been forced to eat food she didn't like. In fact, Kimberly's mother had a strict rule that the food on the plate had to be eaten or she couldn't leave. Kimberly squared her shoulders. It could be worse. The little girl could have asked for creme brulee. Kimberly couldn't pull that one off. But pancakes? Well, maybe. As they entered the kitchen, her eyes widened. Huh. This didn't look like a bachelor's kitchen. Cute towels, some with ponies on them, some with apple pies, draped over a towel rail and a stove handle. Plates with Bible verses decorated marmalade-hued walls. Different appliances rested on granite counters, while containers labeled sugar, flour, and cereal, in the shape of three bears, huddled in one corner, plotting against Goldilocks? She huffed. She may not be Goldilocks, but she did badly enough in the kitchen on her own. She didn't need ceramic conspirators banding against her. Three aprons hung on some hooks to the left, the largest one a chocolatey color, a smaller one papayish, and a little melony one with a pony applique. The little apron obviously belonged to Danica, but whose was papaya-colored one? This place had a woman's touch. But he'd mentioned his wife had left when Danica was two. Did he keep everything the way she'd left it for years? He seemed to have understood her unspoken question. My mom comes sometimes to help with Danica, and she loves cooking. How kind of her. She suppressed a sting of envy. Her mother was far from a good cook. If Kimberly had found out about her fiancé's abusive ways only after marriage, had a child, and divorced him, she'd be on her own as a single mother. She doubted her mom would babysit, and she wasn't sure she'd let her, either. She still remembered getting yelled at for bad grades and forcing cold lumps of oatmeal down her throat. She'd never forget the taste of them, though she hadn't eaten a bowl of oatmeal since leaving her childhood home. Determination settled in her gut. If she could help Mac with his child, she needed to. But how? She scowled at the flower packet, egg box, and milk cartons Mac had purchased in town, gathered on the granite island. Obviously, he didn't believe in pancake mixes. Pity. On the other hand, she was perfectly capable of ruining a pancake mix, too. Ask her how she knew. Good thing she'd watched that video. Now, if only she could remember all the instructions. They were simple, really, so how come most of it slipped from her mind? Probably because certain things distracted her, Max green eyes and broad shoulders and that woodsy scent being some of them, and all the memories that were going to become her undoing being the rest of them. No need to worry about some possible stalker, she wasn't likely to survive an hour in Max's kitchen. 
he stepped to her, and she had a totally unreasonable idea to wrap her arms around his neck and lift herself on her toes so she could stare in his dark green orbs for as long as she wanted while his hands would circle her waist and he'd dip his head. I'll get directions on my cell phone. His thumb caressed the phone's surface, invoking a memory of it caressing the outline of her face. She nearly moaned. I can do it. She pulled her shoulders back. She wasn't a hormone-charged teenager. She was a confident, calm, professional woman who shouldn't be so affected by a summer fling many years ago. Someone just needed to remind her heart of that. Okay, then I'll pull up the living room camera to make sure Danica's all right. He pressed some buttons and put the phone near the bare container with sugar written on it. The image of his little girl hugging a toy pony and giggling at cartoons appeared on the screen. Tenderness stirred her as she looked at the screen, and the feeling increased as she took in the adoring expression on his handsome face. She'd admired him as a teenage boy for his tenacity, hard work, and loyalty to his land and his family, and okay, those chiseled features didn't hurt either. But now, seeing him as a caring father, a rugged cowboy, and an accomplished ranch owner, she was drawn to him even more. She'd worried he might look at her differently since she wasn't a slim teenager anymore and had gained too many pounds. But she couldn't be mistaken about the attraction in his eyes. What were they supposed to do? Kiss. No. Pancakes. Chapter 6. I'll whisk the eggs. One couldn't mess up that too much, right? Only one way to find out. Kimberly retrieved some eggs from the container, broke them into a bowl, and threw away the eggshells. Here's the whisk. He took it out from one of the drawers. Right. She stared at the foreign object. You should know I'm a disaster in the kitchen. She was probably a disaster for him in more ways than one. It's okay. We'll do this together. As he handed her the whisk, his hand covered hers. Emotion darkened his eyes, and he leaned to her, giving her a more distinct whiff of his woodsy cologne. It crushed me when you didn't come back. I missed you. I didn't want to, but I missed you so much. Breathing became difficult. Those were the words she wanted to hear so badly. Except for the fact that she'd crushed him. That had caused a knife to turn in her heart. Rational thinking. Rational thinking. She'd never been one to act on emotions, just like her mother had taught her. So she should be able to find that rational thinking somewhere, shouldn't she? She couldn't let him know how much she'd missed him or how much he meant to her. She could try to deal with these returning and growing feelings alone. If she let him know, it would be like trying to quit drinking while hanging around a bar. Finally, she found enough willpower to remove her hand from his and concentrate on whisking eggs. She needed to make things clear between them. The last thing she wanted was to hurt him a second time. I... I'm sorry. I really am. I never meant to hurt you. But we can't pick up where we left off years ago. Her heart did a slow and painful flip. You're different. I'm different. You have a little girl to consider. We have separate lives in different parts of the U.S. It. It wouldn't work out. But oh, how much she wanted to, against all logic. She was getting that pleasant buzz in her body simply from being near his big frame, his large capable hands that she absolutely needed to have around her waist, his green eyes she ached to find approval in. In the pause, her hand stopped moving. Her heart dipped at the hurt expression in his forest green eyes. Why didn't you come back the next summer, as promised? Beneath his beard, that, yes, took some getting used to, a muscle moved in his square jaw. I was going to. I really was. She needed to busy herself with something, so she measured two cups of flour and added it to the eggs, then measured and shook in baking powder. I'll add sugar. His voice was flat as he scooped several tablespoons from the baby bear container. After adding the sugar to the bowl, he looked at the phone screen to check on his daughter. You don't have to tell me if you don't want to. On the contrary, she should have told him years ago. But she hadn't wanted him to drop everything and come take care of her instead of going to college to get his agriculture degree. 
not like he'd called to check up on her either, and after some time, she'd had no choice other than to agree with her mother that Kimberly had been just a summer fling to him. Then she'd been too afraid to open the wound by calling him, but by the looks of it, that wound had never healed, anyway. I'll melt some butter. She put a pat of butter in a tiny container and then placed it into a microwave. After all, she had a lot of experience with the microwave. After one too many accidents microwaving things on full power that needed low, she knew to change the power settings for this. She pressed on the screen. 30 seconds. When the microwave beeped, she checked the container, lifted it from the microwave, and poured it into the batter. The mundane movements did nothing to calm her turmoil. She plunked the ceramic container on the counter and turned to him, indignation heating up like that butter. She'd let guilt consume her for years, had tried to drown it in endless bottles, but maybe it was enough. At least, when it came to Mac. The weekend before I was supposed to leave for Cowboy Crossing, I asked my sister to go to the store. I didn't have a car then, and I wanted to buy perfume and a new lipstick. She took a deep breath that smelled of bread and his cologne. She'd wanted to look pretty for him when she arrived, to smell nice. She'd paid a high price for that vanity. A car t-boned us on the driver's side. She closed her eyes as the image of her sister covered in blood, motionless, but still breathing, just, was too much to bear. The scent of blood in the air, the metallic taste of it in her mouth, the sticky feel of it on her face and hands. Tears burned, but she couldn't let them spill. My sister died before the ambulance got there. And her? She'd watched her sister give her last breath and couldn't do anything to help because she couldn't move herself. She forced herself to open her eyes. I made it, but with many broken bones. A few didn't heal right and had to be rebroken and put together again. It took me the entire summer and then some to recover. He tipped her chin with his fingertips and made her look into his eyes, so much compassion and understanding in them that her heart squeezed. Why didn't you tell me? Didn't you know I would have wanted to be with you in that difficult time? Precisely because of that. She could get lost in his eyes at sixteen, and she could get lost in them now, that forest lake where she could drown so easily. I made my uncle vow he wouldn't tell anyone in Cowboy Crossing about the accident, about my sister, about my injuries. I didn't want you to miss out on college. You worked so hard to get in. Why did you make the decision for me? Didn't you feel anything for me? And why didn't you call or take my calls? Anger edged his words, cutting like the broken glass from the windshield had. Didn't feel anything? She flinched as if he'd slapped her. She felt too much for him. More than she'd ever wanted to. And while she stared in his eyes, she could believe again that they could have a future. But she wasn't a naive teenager. She moved back. Hold on. Take your calls? You never called. She glared at him. You didn't bother. I figured I didn't mean enough to you in the first place. You didn't pick up your phone, but your mother did. Every time she said you were busy, but she'd give you the message. After some time, I realized you didn't want to talk to me or see me. She also hinted you found someone else, but I didn't want to believe it. Her legs went weak. Her hand flailed for the granite countertop, and she leaned on it, the smooth surface cool beneath her palm, her pulse throbbing against it. Maybe he'd called while she was in the hospital or rehabilitation facility? Or later, she must have been at doctor's treatments and left her phone outside with her mother. More guilt knifed her. Maybe it was best to leave it as it was. She gestured to the counter. If we work like this, Danica will never get her pancakes. Go ahead. Escape the question you don't want to answer. His expression guarded, he poured milk into the batter. Did she do that? Maybe she was more like her father than she knew. How about adding salt? Talking about this was easier than about their past. Sure. He added a little. She started stirring the batter, her emotions, just as stirred up. I didn't call later because my life spiraled out of control. I had no chance of coming back to Cowboy Crossing. 
my father couldn't deal with the loss of his favorite daughter. His drinking got worse until he just up and left. My mother was depressed. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to. She stopped him with a wave of her hand. I couldn't leave her. Maybe she should mention the little detail about her drinking habits. No, she couldn't say it. I started working a part-time job to support us. Dad didn't visit. My mother said it was because, if he had, he'd only see the reminder in me of why his older daughter, the apple of his eye, was dead. Her throat closed up, and she couldn't push the words out anymore. He covered her hands with his. You don't blame yourself for her death, do you? It was an accident. A shudder passed through her, despite his reassuring touch. If I hadn't asked her to drive me to the store, she'd still be alive. This is crazy. It wasn't your fault. How could you have guessed what would happen? But I'm alive. Though inside the words were a wail, they emerged calm and flat. You suffered nearly as much. Somehow, he saw the pain behind her calm facade. His support soothed her. Didn't erase the pain, but soothed it nevertheless. Just like alcohol had. And both were bad for her. As she was bad for him. In his teens, he'd held everyone to high standards, especially himself, and she was as broken as they came. He'd judged her father for drinking, and she'd done the same. Later, she'd understood her father well. Something inside her shifted, like a curtain opening to the simple truth. Nobody could live in pieces for long, and alcohol was the glue that seemed to put the pieces together, even if only for a few hours. It might come at a high price, but like many people before her and many people after her, she was desperate to feel whole again, even if for a little while. Her heart shattering all over again from the memories, things so hard to relive while sober, she continued stirring the batter to make sure there were no lumps in it. She'd learned early in life that, no matter how heartbroken she felt, things needed to be taken care of. And I'm very happy you're alive. I'm sorry about your sister. I really am. But you need to continue living your life, preferably guilt-free. Easier said than done. She turned on the stove and placed a frying pan on it. Do you have a non-stick spray? If not, we can use a piece of butter. Yes. I mean, I have a non-stick spray. He retrieved a can from the kitchen cabinet and handed it to her. This time, he seemed to make sure their hands didn't touch. She dismissed a stab of regret as she sprayed the pan. My mother taught me how to know if the pan is hot enough to fry food on it. He opened the faucet and sprinkled a few droplets on the pan. They danced on the surface. If it sizzles, it's hot enough. Another stab of regret cut deeper this time. Once upon a time, their love sizzled, too, and her heart had danced every time she saw him. But even if those emotions returned, wishing for things that couldn't be was useless. I want you to lead a happy life, even if it's far away from me. He leaned to her as he poured the first pancake on the pan. Oh. He didn't even touch her, and still, a wave of awareness swept her whole. My life is a mess, and I don't want to drag you into it. Especially now that you have a little girl to take care of. Was she trying to persuade him or herself? She looked up at him. His brows were drawn together. My mother wants to take Danica this evening and have her spend the night. I can stake out the B&B to see if your stalker shows up. That was what you were talking about when you said your life was a mess, right? Well, yes. No. His brows drew together. I also need to know who might want to harm you. Any details you can give me. Why you think you're being stalked? I want an investigation started. Oh no. No, no, no. He was a man of action, so when she complained about something, parts of him needed to take action. I think we might need to turn over that pancake. She pointed at the frying pan, little bubbles popping atop the pancake. If she didn't try to distract him, and herself, she might give in to the urge to kiss him. Being so close and resisting touching or kissing him was proving nearly impossible. Let's see. Okay, 
there are bubbles on the surface that don't close up. You're right. Time to turn it over. You seem to know how to make pancakes well. How come you burned them the last time? She flipped the roundish concoction on the other side. Danica distracted me. He waited a little, then checked the pancake and removed it from the pan into a large deep bowl. And he was kind enough not to point that out to his daughter. She couldn't take advantage of his kindness. He was a simple, hard-working man who took care of those he loved and kept his promises. She'd failed to take care of those she'd loved and broken her promise to him. She resisted the urge to close her eyes again and wished for a sip, just one sip, of whiskey. He poured the second pancake on the frying pan. I don't think you should be alone. I'll come up with something. Also, I can let the local police know. They'll send a patrol car. She cringed. Just great. She didn't need everybody in town to know her predicament. Private things should be kept private. Like her shameful alcohol addiction. That was what her mother had always said. The reason why it was forbidden to tell anyone that her father had issues with alcohol, too. That issue, however, didn't remain private for long. Kimberly lifted her chin as she watched for bubbles and flipped the pancake over. No matter. After the many expensive rehab stays she'd paid for, her father seemed to be doing much better, and that was what mattered, wasn't it? She didn't need Mac to find solutions or risk his life. He had enough already. As he poured more batter on the pan, she shrugged as nonchalantly as she could. You know, I don't think I have a stalker. Really. People get mugged all the time, especially in big cities. And the car that followed me. Well, it was probably going in the same direction. I made a big deal out of nothing. It's not like you to make a big deal out of nothing. He studied her, then glanced at his daughter on the phone screen. Are you sure? Yes. She wasn't, but she did her best to school her features into a neutral expression as she flipped the next pancake. Her heart squeezed. Kansas had once told her she'd pushed people away. But she wasn't pushing Mac away. She had good reasons to keep him at arm's length, no matter how much she wanted otherwise. Even if she might need his help with the possible stalker, even if she yearned to drown in his forest lake eyes again, pushing him away was for his own good. His and his little girl's. Right now, however, he wasn't at arm's length. As the stack of pancakes grew, so did her desire to forget about all those reasons and walk into his embrace, have him hold her one more time, kiss her one more time. As his gaze settled on her lips, more than a few times, she knew he had the same ideas, and her blood heated up. Every time their hands brushed against each other, something akin to an electric current, but a pleasant one, sizzled through her. Old sensations came back, stronger than ever. No, no, no. This couldn't be happening. This shouldn't be happening. Think rationally. Oh yes. She needed to make sure her cooking didn't fail miserably, as always. She snatched one of the pancakes and munched on it like it was, without butter or syrup. No cheating. Despite his words, he laughed. She chewed the pancake. Surprisingly, it was edible. She was barely able to believe she participated in creating this yummy fluffiness. I've got to try this. If after about a quarter of an hour I'm still alive, we can serve them to your daughter. His eyes widened. You're kidding me. Wish she was. Mouth full, she wagged her head and swallowed. I'm a bad cook. If there was a competition between the worst chefs, I'd take the grand prize. I'm shocked the pancakes look okay. I think you're just being hard on yourself. He tucked a strand of hair behind her ear. And just like that, her breath went shallow. Concentrate. Seriously. It even tastes good. I guess there is a first time for everything. Maybe because he was with her. Her throat suddenly parched, she licked her lips and stared in his eyes longer than she was supposed to. Something inside her went liquid like the wine she still craved so much. He tried the pancake, too. 
you've done a marvelous job. It tastes great. His gaze moved to her lips. Kissing him would taste great, too. Her breathing became shallow. No. She couldn't be thinking about kissing him, even if she suspected his kiss could be the glue to put her whole again for a little while, like alcohol had. Just like her addiction, the kiss would come at a high price, too. She did her best to distract herself with brutal honesty. My cooking skills are bad. Though once my boss asked me to bake a cake. I was very proud of it until I found out it was for his mother-in-law. Before he could reply, she shifted fast and knocked the small bowl where the butter used to be. It crashed to the floor. Memories flooded in, unwanted. Dishes broken in the kitchen, her aching as if their shards could slice her inside. Loud screams, displaying her mother's fury at the father for showing up drunk again. The taste of her own tears as a little girl. Her sister hugging her, guiding her to Serena's own room, which smelled of her signature coconut shampoo and her favorite coconut cookies. Serena had given her headphones and turned on upbeat music and started dancing. The first time, Kimberly could hardly believe it. She didn't feel like dancing. She'd felt like howling, and the tight band around her lungs had made breathing difficult. But then she joined in. Every single time, and there were many such times. While she'd still been hurting, she could breathe. She needed to. Then they would sit on Serena's bed, her gentle arms around Kimberly, eating the cookies Serena always had stashed in her room. When the cookie packs emptied like Kimberly's heart, Serena would hug her tighter, rock back and forth, and whisper in her ear that she was going to be all right. By that time, the screams had usually stopped. Max scooped up the shards. Are you okay? It's just a bowl. She told him about her memories, and this time it was him hugging her, rocking her back and forth, telling her she'd be all right. While she could breathe again, while every cell in her body wanted to lean into the familiarity of his embrace, this time she knew, with all certainty, that if she stayed in this small town for long, she'd hurt him as much as she'd hurt her sister. We're almost done here. She eased out of his embrace and glanced at the empty batter bowl. And every bit of her felt as shattered as the broken bowl, but she didn't want these moments with him to end. But they were done indeed. Many years ago. Despite her best intentions, her hand shot out to him. She didn't even know why. Was she trying to stop herself from leaving again? Or stop him from getting close to her? She caught his gaze flick to the phone screen. Oh. Our quiet time's up. Danica is climbing off the sofa. He headed to the hall, and she was left with only the granite counter to hold her up. Might as well. She'd been the one to insist on the distance between them. Besides, his daughter was his priority, and she should be. Deflated, Kimberly removed the last pancake from the stove and placed it on the plate, then found dishes in the cabinet and stacked them on the counter. He returned, carrying his child. A big smile bunched up the girl's round cheeks. Daddy, I smelled pancakes. Oh, yes, you did. They are ready. He put her on a tall wooden chair in the breakfast nook, then opened the fridge. Do you like your pancakes with maple syrup, whipped cream, or chocolate? Yes. Danica clapped. Kimberly's lips curled up. All of them then. A slight wave of cold from the fridge reflected the cold in her soul. What about you? He turned to her. She managed a smile. All of them, too. But even maple syrup, whipped cream, and chocolate combined wouldn't be able to sweeten the bitter taste in her mouth. She breathed in the delicious scent of pancakes and helped carry dishes to the table. Let's dig in. Busy at her job. She hadn't felt her loneliness as sharply in Chicago as she did here, looking at these two and knowing she could never be a part of this close-knit family. Even her own family didn't want her to be a part of it. It might be just her and her stalker tonight. Chapter 7 Late in the evening, after an afternoon spent painting walls with Uncle Bob, Kimberly huddled on her bed at the B&B. Not where she'd stayed before, unsure she could deal with the emotion of being in the old room, She'd asked to be placed in another room, but with the same peach walls. 
It smelled of her favorite peach scent, thanks to an air freshener plug-in. Her uncle and his wife had accepted her as if she were their own daughter, instead of a niece who hadn't shown up for years. Nostalgia unraveled her with a force she didn't expect as she stared at the ceiling. How easy to close her eyes and wish this room could be some time machine to transport her back to the summers she'd spent here. With all her being, she ached to relive those magical summers and then change things that happened afterward. Oh, if only she could. She'd have given up her entire life for one more dance-off with her sister, one more coconut cookie shared. For one long glance and breathing out, I'm so sorry. She'd learned later that Serena had stopped coming to Cowboy Crossing with her those last few summers, because their mother wanted someone to stay behind to take care of her. As always, in their family, things were back to front, the child expected to care for the parent. As always, her kind, caring sister had done what was best for the family. She'd been the one person who'd loved Kimberly the most in the world. Probably, the only one who'd loved her unconditionally and forever. Even Max's love had dissipated enough to let him marry a different woman. A lump clogged her throat as she hugged the pillow. Everyone said God never made mistakes. But that tragic day, the wrong sister died. Tears burned Kimberly's eyes, and she let them slip. There was no time machine, even in this quaint B&B where, despite the Rennes, so many things stayed the same as if captured in film. She couldn't undo what she'd done. She couldn't have even a single moment with her sister again. She couldn't take back the hurt she'd caused Mac, either. Her insides burned, begging for the comfort she could have. Alcohol. It wouldn't take away the pain, but it could make it bearable. And she needed it. Oh, how much she needed it. Who'd think that, even after years of being sober, every cell in her body would yearn for that sweet, shameful oblivion? For some time, she tossed and turned, her gut burning, demanding, begging. Finally, empty as a finished wine bottle, Kimberly slipped out of bed, took her phone from the nightstand to use as a flashlight, and tiptoed across the green, like the grass outside, plush carpet to the corridor, and onto the dining room. It stayed the same, too, with round tables the color of pancakes, round white dishes, round rugs on hardwood floors, oval mirrors, oval picture frames with flowers and fruits, and arched windows. Something was soothing in that familiarity and the fact that so many things here didn't have sharp angles and corners, just like their hospitable owner, Mrs. Annie, with her round face, contagious laugh, and pleasant plumpness. Really, she should call her aunt by marriage Aunt Annie, but the BNB was known as Mrs. Annie's and everyone in town called her that. So Kimberly had, too. Taking a deep breath, she thought she could still distinguish the faint aroma of her aunt's signature peach cobbler. She hesitated to stop, indulge in its melt-in-the-mouth taste, but her mission was more tempting. She climbed the stairs, the cool smooth feeling of the wooden railing greeting her like an old friend until she made it to the third floor. Only two tiny rooms, perched here. Rooms that, to her knowledge, were never offered to guests. One of them was her and her sister's favorite. Unrest pooled in Kimberly's belly as she opened the door. Then she was truly transported into her past. Okay, a fresh blindingly white paint coated the walls, and a new rug covered the floor. But their favorite book still waited on the antique coffee table, the same two peach-hued quilts they'd used covered the small beds, and the view. Her pulse spiking, she rushed to the window, then stopped herself and stood near it, considering the last few days' events. Her heart ached from beauty and memories as the spectacular view drew her into it, sweeping her up until she could almost see it again through the eyes of the naive, hopeful girl she'd once been. The moon touched the pond's smooth surface, and it gleamed like a polished silver coin while darkness hid the multitude of flowers that morning would awaken on the fields and rolling hills. Deep and dark and misty, the forest was so magnificent it just had to be enchanted. When she was six, she and her sister hadn't ventured far since most of the land already belonged to Max's family there. But they could look, and they could dream. This was their castle. She'd seen many horses from that window and plenty of cowboys, and she knew with all certainty one of them was bound to be her prince charming one day. She and Serena had dreamed up their own stories, enacted their own fairy tales. Of course, they gave due to the classic ones, too. 
With her beautiful blonde hair and the lovely blue dress Mrs. Annie had made for her, Serena was Cinderella, of course. Kimberly was Rapunzel, due to the long hair she'd grown below her waist at the time and her tendency to stay in this room, her tower, and read, make up stories, and dream. So full of love, coziness, and splendor, this place was so different from where they'd been growing up, it had to be magical. Kimberly and Serena blossomed here every summer, like carefully tended flowers in Mrs. Annie's garden, and counted days, to come back. By then, her sister had already discovered her love for dancing, and she'd showcased it to the guests, with either their uncle or his wife present, of course. People were enthralled. Her blonde hair flowing, slim arms high, Serena barely touched the floor as she danced, like a little fairy. Something extraordinary. Something you weren't supposed to see. Something so incredible, she just might be a figment of the imagination. With time, Kimberly found herself spending more and more time with her uncle, who'd done accounting, repairs, and redecoration. She discovered she had a good head for numbers and an equally good eye for what people might like. She'd helped him run the books and make subtle changes so the interior and dishes were more appealing. By 15, Serena had become a magnet to the people around her as if they already felt she wouldn't be with them for long. Except Kimberly. She had no clue. They were still best friends and each other's world, and that was the way it was supposed to be. Imagining herself without her sister would be like imagining herself without her lungs or liver, impossible. Kimberly had carried that love like a luminous crystal inside her chest. She drew a deep breath of damp night air heavy with the scent of hay, as if she needed to know her lungs were still there. As much as she'd loved her sister and had missed her the summer she'd come to this BMB as a teen, She'd been dizzy with gratitude then that her sister hadn't come because of meeting Mac, her very own fairy tale, her very own Prince Charming. Guys their age had fallen for her sister easily, drawn to the beauty, mystery, and something so elusive it had made them want to capture it, hold on to it oh so desperately. Pain grew in Kimberly's chest, tightening despite the fresh air. She'd been a wretched sister. She didn't deserve a sibling like Serena. The sharp shards of guilt, the remainder of that luminous crystal, cut her lungs, spread through her blood to carry pain to all her body, including to the tips of her hair. A growl of a motor outside made her look down, her heart beating faster. Probably a passerby, right? Or someone who didn't know the BNB was under renovations. The motor stopped instead of growling in the distance. A shiver ran down her spine. No, it had to be her overactive imagination. Carefully, she looked outside from behind the curtain, and her breath caught in her throat. A dark sedan parked outside. She waited for it to move on once the driver understood the BMB wasn't open. There was a sign about it, after all. Well, the car didn't move. Instead, the lights turned off, but nobody appeared from inside. Cold traveled down her back. Maybe her stalker wasn't all in her imagination. But how had they found her already? Her mind whirled. Should she call the police? Then what? Tell them someone parked outside the BNB? Big deal. She didn't want to wake up her uncle and his wife and frighten them. Should she take her gun and confront her stalker? She shuddered. No thanks. The car didn't move. It appeared settled there for the night. She rubbed her hands over her suddenly cold forearms. The motor revved up, and the car moved, so she exhaled the breath she'd held. But minutes later, it returned, and she barely suppressed a groan. It had simply circled the BNB. What to do? In Chicago, she'd call Kansas. She had nobody to call here. Yes, she did. Mac. Her heart shifted at the thought. Danica was going to overnight at her grandmother's, wasn't she? The longer Kimberly stared at the car, unmoving, both her and it, the tighter her stomach knotted. It wouldn't be fair to disturb Mac, to wake him up. She had no right to. She staggered as if from a punch in the gut, like when the mugger had hit her. She couldn't let something like that happen to her uncle and his family. Already as it was, she only brought bad things to the people she loved. She found her throwaway phone with trembling fingers. 
he'd given her his new phone number today, in case anything happened. This should qualify, shouldn't it? Her nerves raw, she punched in numbers. He picked up on the first ring, almost making her drop the phone. Kimberly? Shouldn't he be asleep? She swallowed hard. I'm sorry to disturb you so late. But someone's parked in front of the BMB. Chapter 8 Kimberly's insides trembled. Um, that would be me, Max said. All her pent up apprehension burst out in nervous laughter. What? Well, I wanted to make sure you were safe. I didn't mean for you to think it was someone stalking you. I probably should have tried camouflaging. But then, it's the first time I've done this. She should have guessed he might have more than one car. Relief loosened the knots before guilt started tying new ones as she drew a much needed breath of air with the sweet and comforting peach scent. She'd hurt him badly, she knew that, and still, he'd dropped everything and staked out for the night to make sure she was okay. I. You. Um, thank you. You didn't have to do this. She did her best to find the right words as she sank onto the small bed that shifted under her weight. I don't know. Would you like some coffee or something? I could steal some pastries from the kitchen here. He laughed softly. It's okay. I came prepared. I know you're tired, and I want you to get some decent sleep. Well, unless you want to talk about the people you suspect? A fist squeezed her heart. It was silly, but talking about people who might wish her harm could make all this real. As though if she didn't mention it, she could still hope that the mugging and the burglary were a coincidence. She shook her head as if he could see her. I'll tell you. Just not right now. Please, be careful. You, too. Have sweet dreams. He paused, then disconnected. Her tired limbs begged for rest, despite the nap she'd given them in the evening. But the urge to be near him was more overwhelming. She was still drawn to him beyond measure. She should take him some coffee, anyway, stay in the car, breathe in the enticing scent of his cologne, simply thrive in his presence. Her pulse hummed. After all, he was right. She did need to tell someone about the people she suspected could want to harm her. Could Mac and she have another chance? Her heart jumped in her throat at the memory of him holding her, enveloping her in those large arms like a warm blanket, her pulse pounding. Then another memory, of her parents arguing, of dishes being broken cut the pleasant blanket, sliced it together with her skin, leaving scars. How many times had her father promised to quit drinking and gone without alcohol for some time? Too many. She could be the same. She still had the craving in her blood, as demanding as ever. Mac deserved better than marrying an alcoholic again, okay, a former one, but who could relapse any time? Reluctantly, she placed the phone on the nightstand. But. But. The least she could do was bring him some coffee, right? She'd just have to keep her emotions in check. She'd done a good job of it for over two decades. She slipped off the bed, returned to her room, changed her pajamas for jeans and a light sweater, and tiptoed into the kitchen, lighting the way with her phone flashlight. There she turned on the light and made instant coffee, black, the way he liked it. Her pulse picked up speed, just at the thought of seeing him soon. The air was cool and fresh as she stepped outside and hurried to the car, careful not to slosh hot coffee over herself. The moment she was inside the car, she regretted her decision. Arg. Being alone with him at night, breathing his woodsy scent in the limited space only reminded her of all she'd lost and was so desperate to have again. He wouldn't try anything inappropriate, of course. As passionate as their teenage kisses had been, every time, he'd somehow managed to stop before they'd gone too far, even if she'd clearly lost her head but it would be impossible to be near him and not want things that could never be again. She handed him the cup of coffee. Here. One of the few things I can do without ruining it. Another one is boiling water, though I'm not so sure about that. He chuckled and saluted with the cup. Thank you. I'm glad you're here. Yep, she was melting already. He took a sip. 
I need you to give me more details about your possible stalker. Really? I'm not going to let it go. I want to hire a private investigator, if you're okay with it. Disappointment, cut deep. That was the reason he was glad she was here? It's okay. I think I overreacted. She lifted her chin. It's fine. You were mugged, and you were followed for several days. You took a self-defense course, bought a gun, and drove across the country. I wouldn't call it overreacting. I want to know details, and I'm not taking no for an answer. His voice was compassionate, but a note of steel bracketed each word. Running the ranch had trained him to change his voice in a way people obeyed. Then he added, please? She might as well tell him. Okay, a week ago, I went jogging in the park late in the evening. I know I should be aware of my surroundings, especially considering it wasn't the best time to be in the park to start with. But I was listening to music and was sort of in my own world. Then, she shuddered, a tall man in a hoodie jumped from behind the tree and threw me to the ground. I'm sorry. I understand it must be painful for you to recall it. The back of his hand brushed against her, sending a comforting wave. She took a deep breath of air filled with leather and the woodsy scent of his cologne. I'm fine. Her inside still trembled, so she corrected herself, I mean, I'm fine now. The guy ripped away my little purse and started choking me. I couldn't breathe, and everything got blurry. My lungs starved. My mind became foggy. Then. I could gasp for air again. I was pulled off the ground. He shifted to her as he thanked the Lord aloud for her being okay. Thankfully, my friend, Kansas, was jogging in the same park. We work on the same floor, and our condos are in the same building. We often jog together, but he'd been running late, literally, that day. Did he go after the, mugger? He sipped his coffee. He chose to stay with me rather than run after the guy. Neither one of us got a good look at his face. He had a hood drawn low. Do you remember his height and his build? Tall, though not as tall as you are. Then, very few people were. Broad-shouldered. A bit stocky. He had sneakers on his feet. She struggled to remember more. Any tattoos, scars, jewelry you might recall? No she did her best to dismiss a sting of disappointment. That wasn't much to go on. Did you go to the police? We did. She grimaced. They told us they'd call us if they had any leads. Did they call? Well, yes, they called me a few days later to say they still didn't have any leads. They thought it was a mugging. I thought so at first, too, though, frankly, I didn't have much in that purse. He'd have gotten more if he took my sneakers. But then, he found her hand and covered it with his. A warm feeling spread over her as if his support could make it all better again. Two days after the park incident, a black sedan with tinted windows followed me to my condo. She described the make and model. He seemed to file the information in his head. Did you notice the license plate? Was the sedan old? No. Any scratches? Dents? Didn't notice the license plate. Really what was wrong with her? Why hadn't she taken note? The car seemed new. No dents or scratches. That's it. I'm sorry. Watching all those court dramas and mysteries hadn't served her as well as she'd thought. She should have had way more detail, especially considering her well-being was at stake. It's okay. If they were after you, most likely, the license plate was fake, anyway. Not that I'm saying they were after you. He obviously didn't want to frighten her, but her fingers did jump at his words. When I was leaving a restaurant the next day, a similar sedan pulled out of the parking lot. It didn't follow me home, so I hoped it was a coincidence. There are plenty of sedans like that in Chicago, after all. Still, why hadn't she taken a photo? What was she thinking? Instead, she'd rushed to her car and driven off. When I was loading groceries at the grocery store parking lot the day after that, what appeared to be the same black sedan with tinted windows drove by. 
This time I tried to get their license plate, but mud covered it. They didn't try to harm me or anything, though. She chuckled, without mirth. Maybe it's just me getting paranoid. Or not. His Adam's apple bobbed. I'm glad you told me. Was this all? No she removed her hand from under his and missed it immediately. She wrapped her arms around herself and rocked back and forth in the small space of the car. He squeezed her shoulder. A simple gesture, but it gave her the courage to continue. Then I came home to find my condo was ransacked. I have some expensive electronics, but nothing valuable was taken. That was when I realized I'd enough and drove here. Cold traveled down her back. What if she'd spooked off the intruder when she'd returned to her condo? She could have been shot. You did the right thing coming here. His voice was firm, reassuring. Now, do you have any idea why all this is happening? What were they looking for? I have no idea. Her insides trembled. The next moment, he placed the coffee cup in the cup holder and took her into his embrace. He held her, stroking her shoulders. She needed to ease out of his embrace, really, she did. But she couldn't. She needed him badly, and maybe, just maybe, a small part of him needed her. Could it be possible that, with his support, she could let at least some of her past go? Something was changing inside her, changing forever. When he released her, disappointment stung, but, of course, he needed to pay attention to their surroundings. Especially considering she didn't. Can you recall any strange events before that? Even insignificant ones? Like what? Still slightly dizzy from his embrace, she couldn't even recall how to think. Maybe an argument with a colleague or a neighbor. I know I asked this before, but could this be your ex trying to frighten you and get back at you? What's his name, by the way? She shrugged, puzzled. Larry Davis. The last I heard, he was happily dating. We didn't part on the best of terms, but I don't think he's interested in me any longer. He typed it in on his cell phone. How about people at work? I get along with them. She cleared her throat. Okay, there's Susanna McKenna. She wants the same promotion I do. We remain civil toward each other, though. Susanna, with her sleek blonde hair always pinned carefully on her nape, her gray or brown suits with ironed slacks or knee-long skirts, was always impeccable. Suspicions grasped Kimberly's throat with cold fingers. Susanna was the only person who benefited from her leaving Chicago. Susanna was ambitious, yes, and office rumor promised the next promotion would go to Kimberly, not her. Susanna was single, two years older than Kimberly, and hungry for that corner office. But would Susanna go as far as hiring someone to mug and burglarize her co-worker? An even more tragic question, would Kimberly become as bitter and desperate as Susanna in a few years? What about your neighbors? Mac's question interrupted her sad thoughts. The corners of her mouth curved up as she thought. I only know Mrs. Becker, and she is a sweet old lady. How old? Seventy, I guess. I don't know. She's kind of young and old at the same time. She has white hair she keeps in a messy bun. A face full of sweet wrinkles showing she's laughed a lot. She stoops when she walks and moves with a cane's help. And often complains about aches and pains in her bones, poor thing. She talked about the need to fix her dentures. Not that this detail will be useful, right? One never knows. Where does she live? She might know more about your neighbors than you do. She chuckled. Yeah, she likes to gossip. Technically, she isn't even my neighbor. She's condo sitting for her nephew who's on a temporary assignment in another state. He lives on the floor below me. He wrote down more things on his phone. Got it. She makes the best mint tea in the world. She sighed as if she could still taste and smell it. And her crochet doilies are so lovely. We sat and talked for ages. I miss her. I'm sure you do. His voice softened. 
It was nice of you to befriend an older lady. Or maybe it's the other way around. I need to buy her a gift before I return. She gave me a beautiful old brooch as a thank you gift for being her friend. May I see it? She stared ahead of her. I was wearing it the day I left Chicago, so I can give it to you some other time. You don't expect me to wear a brooch with a t-shirt, do you? Fair enough. Anyone else you know in your building? What about your friend Kansas? You don't have him in your will, by any chance? She stiffened. Neither he nor Mrs. Becker would wish me harm. I don't have a will, so everything, including the condo and car, would go to my parents. Well, except that I pay for an annual scholarship to three people with a dancing major. I have a separate fund set up for it so it will continue if anything happens to me. There was a pause. In honor of your sister? Sadness fisted around her heart. Yes. That's admirable of you. Even if his praise touched something inside her, she knew she wasn't doing enough to compensate for Serena's death. Back to the present matters. With the exception of Mrs. Becker, I barely ever see them and don't know most of their names. Her stomach turned sour. What a difference from this town, where people knew each other's names and often could guess what the person wanted or who they dated before the person knew himself. His relatives had probably already received multiple inquiries whether he was dating Kimberly again and how serious that was. A few women might have already planned out their wedding. Another reminder of how different their lives were, and it left a bitter taste. Could it be connected to your work in some other way? Maybe an unhappy client? He found her hand again. She felt warmth as if it traveled from his heart to hers. A client would have to be very unhappy to do this. Seriously, didn't her clients love her? She'd given them every bit of her remaining heart and soul. Her throat closed over, her voice dropping. I don't remember any complaints. Could this be one of your competitors? To make you step back from bidding on a project, for example? His fingers tightened around hers. I don't think they'd go to such lengths. Though, she paused. No. Tell me, please. Even if it doesn't make sense now. His thumb caressed hers ever so slightly. Right, one caress and nothing made sense now. How was she supposed to think when he made her heartbeat skyrocket? But think she must. When we went a bit a month ago, the representative of the competing company muttered something like he wasn't going to let this happen again, she said slowly, unwilling to divulge that. Let me guess. His fingers, calloused and comforting, tightened around hers. You started working on a bid for the same project he did right before the so-called mugging attempt. Yes. But they wouldn't go to such lengths to try to scare me into leaving the city. Besides, now Susanna's stepped in to work on the project. But she might not be as good as you are. I need the names of the company and that representative. Frowning, she gave them to him. He brought her hand to his lips and kissed every finger. Thank you for telling me. Her thoughts in turmoil, she wished she could tell all this to the one person who'd always understood, who could give her good advice. Memories consumed her. Since they'd been girls, it was clear that her older, by one year, sister was going to be the beautiful and the talented one, but Kimberly had never held a grudge. It was impossible not to love her only sibling. Serena loved dancing and danced as easily as she could breathe. They'd both danced when they'd cleaned or when her sister cooked, whirling around the kitchen, and Kimberly had brought her the ingredients. They'd sung together, studied together, shopped together, and overall stuck together because their parents didn't seem to pay much attention to them and making friends was difficult with all their moves. Everybody in the family knew her sister was destined for greatness, that she'd be dancing ballet on the best stages of New York. She'd been taking classes and praised by her teachers since childhood. Their mother had bragged about it to anybody who'd listen. Serena was supposed to start a Juilliard after that tragic summer. A lump grew in Kimberly's throat. She couldn't dance or sing after that accident, even when her broken bones had healed. What are you thinking about? His voice was quiet. About my sister. 
You must miss her a lot. I do. The words tumbled down. For a while after she was gone, I used to go into her room, stay in her bed, and hug the soft blanket that, to me, still had the scent of her favorite coconut shampoo. I'd look at the photos of famous dancers on the wall and pretend that she'd just stepped out. That she'd enter the room, laughing, with a plate of cookies she'd just baked, and we'd share all our secrets. I'm so sorry. He hugged her again and ran his palm over her stooped shoulders. Tears stung her eyes, but she didn't let them overflow. She'd learned to hold them in with a lot of practice. I'll forever remember her the way she was at 18. Always with an easy smile, laughter in her eyes, and shimmering hair around her beautiful face like a halo. He didn't say anything, only kept rubbing away the pain between her shoulder blades. Then one day I came to her room after classes in college, and all her things were gone. My mother said it would be easier this way. Sharp shards filled her with pain again. He let her go, but only to cradle her face in his hands. Did, someone help you? Did you get grief counseling? You couldn't have dealt with all this by yourself. She chuckled, without mirth, and didn't answer. Shards of familiar pain sliced internal parts of her, parts where her heart should be, where that luminous crystal once glowed, showering her with love. Nobody had suggested grief counseling to her then, and she hadn't thought of it. But then, she'd received counseling from a therapist with the most reasonable pricing, one who'd always been in the office when she'd needed comfort, especially after Dad had left, too. She could only cry when she was drunk, could let her emotions spill, let grief rise to the surface. Alcohol had become that counselor for her, her friend, her confidant, her supporter, always there, always waiting. It didn't even matter when her mother had yelled at her after finding wine bottles. Her mom would find something to yell at her for, anyway. And when she'd said, you're just like your father, Kimberly considered it a compliment. She wanted to tell Mac. She really did. This would be a good time to tell him about her addiction. But she didn't want to lose him. He'd suffered a lot with his ex-wife. He wouldn't want another alcoholic in his life. Okay, she didn't have him to start with, and she'd have to leave soon enough. But everything in her begged to have a few more days with him, to have him touch her as if he still cared. Couldn't she have at least those slivers of happiness? Or at least one more day of illusions? Tomorrow, she'd tell him. Really? She stilled, drawn to him beyond measure. She was losing her heart to him again. I think that's it. I, I should go. Yes. You should get some sleep. He let her hand go. She felt strangely bereft. Obviously, he didn't even want her company any longer. She squared her shoulders as she slipped out of the car. He walked her to the door. Kimberly. Good night, Mac. Thank you for everything you're doing for me. It shouldn't matter. For Max and his daughter's sake, Kimberly couldn't have another chance with him, and it broke her heart all over again. There was no fairy tale ending for her. No longer a Rapunzel, she'd cut ties to people just like she'd once cut her long hair. Chapter 9 The next day, Mac waved at his younger brother as he slid into the church pew to follow his mother. Breakfast at his childhood place had hit a spot, and Danica was perky today. Despite his drowsiness after a sleepless night, joy invigorated him. His daughter seemed to be doing better, and Kimberly was opening up to him. Of course, his mother had peppered him with questions about his long-lost and newly found love, but when he didn't know what to say, she'd given up. Could he hope for a second chance as his heart was begging him to? The attraction between him and Kimberly had been something nearly tangible, and he'd exercised all his willpower not to kiss her. Lord, forgive me, please, for such thoughts, in your house. But besides a geographical distance, he sensed something Kimberly wasn't telling him, as if she were afraid he'd judge her. What was it? And could he be understanding enough to accept it? Kate and his wife stepped out to give him and Danica a place. A warm feeling spread inside Mac as he looked at his gem, so adorable in a little straffy dress, matching shoes with some sparkly stones, and a matching ribbon in her chestnut-hued hair. 
a rare occasion, her agreeing to wear a dress. This time, she'd chosen a ponytail as her hairstyle, and he was glad to oblige. He wasn't a talented braider at all. Hello, cuz. Danica gave her cousin a quick hug. Likewise, he gave a friendly hug to his brother's wife, who wore a white summer dress with large red flowers. Hello, Heather. He then opened his arms for his sibling. Did you lose your mind? Instead of a brotherly hug, Cade added an elbow punch with his words. What in the world? No. And I'd punch you back, but something tells me your son might still need his father. Smiling, Mac kept his tone light and low, then shook hands with Cade's six-year-old son. It was difficult to believe that Cade, with his easygoing, fun attitude would marry twice already, the second marriage thankfully a happy one. Of all his siblings, the entire town considered Cade the least likely to settle down. While Mac had already known who he'd wanted to be in high school and what girl he'd wanted to be with, Cade had gone from one job to another while dating a large share of Cowboy Crossing's younger female population, then married, moved to a different state, divorced, moved back, and married again. What are you thinking? Cade leaned to him. The first date the woman who's made you suffer is in town, and what do you do? Take her out on a date. Okay, that was what it was all about. While he'd never told any of his brothers how much Kimberly's leaving had hurt him, most of them had guessed. As the most outspoken one, Cade wouldn't leave it alone. Max suppressed a grimace. Oh, come on. First, that's coming from a former serial dater. Second, it was only a simple breakfast together. Nothing like taking her out on a date. His blood rushed faster over how close he was to kissing her again, how much he'd ache to take her into his arms while they'd been making pancakes. Again, not thoughts he should be having, especially in church. Lord, please forgive me. Not a date. Right. Kate snorted as he ruffled the hair on his boy's head. The entire crossing is talking about your non-date. I even happen to know that she went to your house after that non-date and spent a significant chunk of time there. Oh, and that you staked out in front of the BNB for some reason, like some sicko, though no one would ever see it that way about you. Mac cringed. Yes, the rumor mill in town was alive and well. Why couldn't some people mind their own business? That included his younger brother. We were cooking pancakes for my daughter. Are you kidding me? Something might have been cooking in that kitchen, but I'm sure it wasn't pancakes. Forgive me, Lord. Cade lifted his eyes. Now, boys, keep quiet. Their mother wiggled a finger at them. Remember, we're in church. Deacon Hudson is about to start the service. But, Mom, aren't you worried that your son is about to make the biggest mistake of his life? Cade gawked at her. Again? Her hazel eyes narrowed. Today her hair was hidden under a white hat brim, which was unusual for her. A crisp white blouse paired with a long black skirt, however, was what she often wore to church. Mac has his own head on his shoulders, and a great one. He's been the head of this family for a long time, and he possesses good judgment. And maybe if Kimberly came back to town, there's a reason for it. Yep, like taking a vacation and breaking my brother's heart for the second time in the process, Cade muttered under his breath. Uncle Cade, don't be mean to Miss Kimberly. I like her. She made pancakes for me. Fluffy. Danica nodded her little chin for emphasis. She braided my hair yesterday. Didn't she, darling? Mom waited for the girl to move to her, then placed a kiss on top of Danica's head. How about we all go for an ice cream after lunch this afternoon? Yay! The girl managed to jump up and down in the small space near the pew. Is Miss Kimberly coming? Oh no. Mac's heart squeezed painfully. The last thing he wanted was for Danica to get attached to a woman who'd never wanted to stick around Cowboy Crossing, never mind that he was getting attached already. Okay, fine, he'd never gotten over his attachment to her in the first place. But now, he didn't have just his own heart to contend with. While he was glad his daughter got over her initial disagreement with Kimberly, this was taking it in the other direction way too fast. 
Huh. I'll make a correction. Make that two broken hearts when Kimberly leaves. Okay, okay, I'll keep quiet. Cade raised his hands in mocking surrender and corrected the collar on his son's little jacket. Then his brother kissed Heather's cheek. Sorry, darling. His face lit up as he looked at his wife, and the irritation in his eyes melted into love. Based on a slight frown, she wasn't happy with this conversation, but she didn't interfere and smiled when Kate kissed her. Kimberly had a valid reason not to return here over twenty years ago, he whispered in his brother's direction. What, one tug from his wife and a glance from their mother, and Kate shut up. Then he lifted Heather's hand and kissed it. I guess not everyone can find such a great treasure as my beloved. Best not to mention that Kate hadn't found Heather. He hadn't even noticed her for years until she'd asked him to marry her. Look at them now. Joy with just a tiny hint of envy filled him as Mac observed their marital bliss. The pressure squeezing his heart intensified. Did his brother have a point? Kate was only looking out for him just like Mac had tried to look out for his younger brother and begged him not to marry the woman who'd nearly turned his life into a disaster, Kate's first wife. His heartbeat picked up speed, racing to escape the pressure holding it, pumping unease through his veins and chilling his body. Though he'd spent a lot of his time with cows and horses, he'd learned to read people while managing the ranch. Kimberly had a secret she wasn't disclosing. As Danica bounced back along the pew, he dropped a quick kiss on the top of her head and inhaled the sweet scent of her papaya shampoo, then pulled her up on the pew near him. But even as he rested his arm around his darling daughter, the cold inside him remained. While Kimberly didn't have to disclose anything to him, secrets usually spelled disaster in his life. Danica's mother had kept her drinking a secret until he'd uncovered it after marrying her. His now former accountant had tried to steal money from the ranch, funneling funds to a secret account. When he'd been a kid and cut his hand, he didn't want to upset his mother, so he'd kept it a secret until pus had started coming from the wound. He stifled a wave of irritation. Didn't she trust him? Was he wrong about the attraction simmering between them again? The way she'd looked at him yesterday, the way her eyes widened when he'd touched her by accident sent a certain signal. Then why hide things? Sorry, I'm late. His sister, Liberty, squeezed into the pew. A single leaf-shaped earring moved in her ear as she plunked herself on the bench. I had a sick animal to take care of. Auntie L. Danica threw her hands around her aunt, who hugged her and laughed. Then greetings were exchanged while other people waved to Liberty. Despite being loud, outspoken, and rough around the edges, she was well-loved in town and on the ranch probably because she'd rushed to help in the middle of the night if someone's pet was sick or because she'd groom horses, turn hay, clean stables, or do anything else that needed to be done if she had a respite and all the ranch hands were busy. Sadly, after a brief marriage in her twenties, she'd remained single, and Mac's heart broke a little every time he thought about the pain she'd endured then. He'd wanted so badly to fix it for her, but some things couldn't be fixed or healed. He said a prayer for her, and then, after a hesitation, for his other sister. Jenna had left the ranch for Europe when she was barely out of high school. She'd come back for their father's funeral, nothing more, and only called on Christmas. His heart aching, he shut his eyes and counted his blessings. Somehow, his daughter resembled her Aunt Liberty much more than her birth mother. She'd begged him to let her color her hair emerald green like her aunt's, but he'd said Danica would have to wait until she was fifteen, though he'd rather go with thirty. When he saw Kimberly's uncle, Bob, with his wife, Annie, slipping into the pew behind them, Mac perked up. Then the pressure around his heart returned. Kimberly wasn't with them. They all exchanged handshakes and quiet greetings as the service was about to start. Kimberly might have been too tired to get up and go to church today, Bob said as if apologizing. Mac and his mother exchanged sad glances. They both understood tiredness was probably not the reason for Kimberly missing church. She'd seemed uncomfortable when he'd said grace yesterday, and sadness passed through the pressure into his heart. Lord, please help her find her way back to you. Ice cream, ice cream. Danica clapped her hands, obviously still excited about the idea. We gonna get ice cream. 
chuckling inwardly, he kissed her cheek. He'd been blessed with an amazing daughter and a great family, and the ranch was doing exceptionally well. This was what he should be concentrating on. Not on the returning feelings for a woman who'd be out of his life again soon. Lord, please forgive me. I don't want to feel like this. Please help Kimberly and give her what she needs to be happy. And please keep my daughter, mom, brothers, sisters, and the rest of my family safe in your care, in Jesus' name, amen. He felt lighter after the prayer, and as the service started, he focused on the sermon. God knew what Kimberly needed to be happy, but he, Mac, couldn't figure it out. And it looked like she didn't have a clue, either. Kimberly sneezed and sneezed again as she navigated the debris, wood boards, paint cans, and sawhorses, into the B&B's kitchen. Dust particles danced in the air, causing a third sneeze. Her muscles still hurt after the long trip, then painting walls till late yesterday after she'd finally left Max's ranch and gone to her uncle's place. Uncle Bob had asked her to stop about a million times, but she felt the need to go on, as if to make up for all the years she hadn't seen him. But here she was, safe in the kitchen of the familiar, okay, maybe not so familiar now, B&B, and nothing had happened to her. Maybe her stalker was non-existent indeed, and the assault was a simple mugging. Cold shivered over her back as she recalled being thrown on the ground, a hit into her stomach making pain explode. More hits. Then she'd been tasting her own blood as he'd broken her lip, and sheer terror had threatened to consume her whole. She'd thought that was going to be the end for her. If not for Kansas. Enough. It was over now. Wasn't it? Her uncle walked into the kitchen, and she gave him a friendly hug. Good morning, Uncle Bob. I'll just make a cup of coffee and resume painting. She eyed the dust-covered counter. The enticing sense of bacon and potatoes came from a plastic container on a clean section. Her mouth watered, but she didn't touch the container, in case it wasn't for her. His gaze was sad. It's Sunday. You should be resting. Besides, you did more than your share yesterday. And, you missed church today. She missed church for over twenty years, but he didn't need to know. Her uncle and his family were good Christian people with true Christian values, and she tried to learn to be a good Christian when she'd spent summers with them. Sometimes she marveled at how two brothers, her uncle and her father, could be so different. Her uncle always took responsibility for his actions and treated everyone around him with love and respect. He'd worked hard in the BNB, but still found time for his family, who adored him and whom he adored back. His wife was caring, too, and always had a homemade bowl of soup, freshly baked bread, the scents Kimberly'd associated with this place forever, and a kind smile for everyone around. Between them, they'd created a well-loved haven in Mrs. Annie's BNB. And somehow, they'd managed to relax and be happy without alcohol, living instead on a prayer, love for each other, and hard work. Just like Mac, but she didn't need to remember that now. Warmth filled her nonetheless, and her blood rushed a little faster. How would it feel to grow up in a family like that, instead of just spending a few summers? Maybe then she could have stayed that joyful open-hearted girl instead of becoming a jaded woman who could freeze her feelings and facial expressions on a whim. Could it be something about the air in Cowboy Crossing? She nearly snorted. Of course not. But fact was fact. Mac resembled her uncle in his sense of responsibility and respectful treatment of people. She pushed the thought aside. No use thinking about Mac. Or dreaming of him, like she had last night. I brought you takeout. Her uncle gestured to the container. I know it's dusty here, so feel free to eat it in your room. Sorry, your aunt wanted to stop for lunch after church. No need to be sorry, and thank you for that takeout. She snatched the container. Besides, you did call me to invite me to lunch, and I declined. You're welcome. I'm glad to have you here again. And not only because you're helping me renovate. We missed you. Her eyes misted. I missed you, too. More than they'd ever know. He hadn't given her a single word of reproach, but had welcomed her with open arms. That was the kind of man her uncle was. 
Simple, solid, trustworthy, someone to rely on. That was the kind of man Mac was, too. Oh no. Why did he invade her thoughts, and her dreams, all the time now? She pushed away his attractive image again. If you don't want me to work, what would you like me to do? His gaze became thoughtful. Hmm, would you mind picking up ice cream from the ice cream parlor? After you finish your takeout, of course. I happen to have a craving. She placed a quick kiss on his rough cheek. I'll be glad to. That's the least I can do. What flavor? Surprise us. And thanks. He hugged her, careful not to squeeze the takeout container. Her heart shifted before she hugged him back. She didn't come from a hugging family. And her mother would get irritated if she tried to kiss her on a cheek. It had taken a long time before Kimberly had allowed Mac to hug her, much less to kiss her. Good thing he was persistent. No thinking like that. She hurried to her room. About half an hour later, she was on the way to the ice cream parlor. As she made a turn, she had a weird feeling she was forgetting something. Oh yes, the tail. She glanced in the rearview mirror and tensed at a black sedan with tinted windows. The same one? Though she knew the way to the parlor by heart, she turned in the opposite direction. Her fingers tightened around the steering wheel when the sedan turned, too. She made another turn. The sedan followed. Chapter 10 A shiver went down Kimberly's spine. Cowboy Crossing was a small town, so she wouldn't be able to keep turning like that for long. Finally, the sedan pulled up into the pizzeria's parking lot and she released a pent-up breath. She was getting too jumpy. When she walked to the ice cream parlor, which looked exactly like she remembered it, except for a fresh coat of canary paint on the exterior and white on the shutters, nostalgia twisted her heart. She'd been in this place so many times with Mac. She entered the parlor, basking in the kids' laughter. Ice cream cone-shaped wall lights sent a soft glow over the pink walls and matching ceiling. Even the chairs were pink. But the salad green counter, white tables, and checkered tile floor made it look less like she'd ended up inside a Pepto-Bismol bottle. She could nearly taste her favorite peach ice cream. Mac had bought it for her often, and something about the familiarity soothed her raw nerves. If only she could go back in time as easily. Then she stopped in her tracks. She cringed. Of course, he'd be here on a Sunday. His daughter probably loved ice cream. Mac with his daughter and his mother were in the line at the counter. If possible, his daughter looked even more adorable now in that pretty straw-hued dress and the ribbon in her hair. Tenderness tugged at her. It was beyond ridiculous to wish to become the kind of mother to this girl that her own could never be. Oh. Well, it was best to hightail out of here before they noticed her, wait in the car, and return when they left. Miss Kimberly. Danica catapulted in her direction. So much for that. Kimberly froze as if she'd been placed inside the large container with all kinds of ice cream flavors. Then a warm feeling melted her as the girl hugged her legs. This girl had no difficulty expressing her emotions, and obviously, she wasn't punished for it. Bending to Danica, Kimberly hugged her tiny frame as brimming tenderness overflowed her. I'm happy to see you, too, honey. Hello, dear. Mrs. Clark grabbed her in a hug. That hugging thing must run in the family. Once Kimberly was released and could breathe again, Mac hesitated, then embraced her, too. Hello, Kimberly. Now a different mix of feelings swept her up. She didn't have a chance, or desire, to untangle them as she simply enjoyed the feeling of being in his arms again, even if for only a brief moment and the woodsy scent of his cologne enveloped her while her pulse skyrocketed. She couldn't read much into this. It was just a friendly hug, right? There couldn't be anything between them again. But even friendly hugs were so rare in her life that she'd been thirsty for them and drank each one as hurriedly and desperately as she'd once drank wine. Well, dear, how about you join us for some ice cream? Mrs. Clark gestured at the tables nearby. What? No. 
Kimberly swallowed hard. My uncle is waiting for me. He, he asked me to bring ice cream. He had a craving. Was it a twinkle in the woman's eye? He did, did he? I think he can wait a few minutes longer. Without giving her an opportunity to answer, she turned to Danica. What flavor would you like, darling? Danica scrunched her nose. Pancake. Mrs. Clark smiled at her granddaughter. They don't have pancake flavor. But they have many others, and you can get it in a waffle cone. The girl's lower lip stuck out. Bacon flavor? Max seemed to suppress a groan. Darlin, I don't think they can whip up bacon-flavored ice cream. I don't think so, either. The memory of cooking with him yesterday appeared uninvited, being so close they could touch, breathing the same air. Snap out of it. He lifted his daughter to view the variety of colorful flavors. I thought you didn't want bacon yesterday? That was yesterday, Daddy, Danica said as if she were surprised he couldn't understand such simple things. Kimberly chuckled. Every woman reserves a right to change her mind. She leaned to Danica, breathing in a sweet papaya shampoo scent. How about a peach? That's my personal favorite. Yeah. Peach. The girl grinned, and three adults let out a collective sigh. Hmm, her parents had never cared what kind of ice cream flavor she'd liked. Whatever they brought home should be good enough for her. All three times in her life. Mac ordered two peach ice cream cones, one single scoop, one double, a double scoop of pistachio for his mother and a single scoop chocolate for himself. All in waffle cones. They found a vacant table, followed by many gazes and a few whispers hushed under Mac's and his mother's pointed stares. Mrs. Clark said grace. Amen, Mac and his daughter said in unison. Kimberly should say amen, too. She really should. She wanted to, but the word stuck in her throat. She'd accepted Jesus during one of her summers in town. But after her sister's death, something had broken inside Kimberly. With each of her mother's screams, it had crushed more and more. Where was your God when your sister died? When your father left us? Where? Kimberly swallowed a lump in her throat. Each of those words stung like a slap in the face. She would have preferred an actual slap, instead. Thankfully, unlike her fiancé, her parents had never hit her. No sorry. That would be showing too much emotion. You don't want a ice cream? Danica's voice drew her out of her memories. The girl was licking up her dessert fast. Yes, I do. Kimberly bit a droopy chunk of the creamy sweet concoction. Mmm. A strange look settled in Mac's eyes as he licked around the edge of his cone, keeping chocolate from dripping. Even with the air conditioning on, the ice cream melted fast. Um, you have a tiny dollop of ice cream at the corner of your mouth. On the left side. Oh, boops. Without a second thought, she flicked her tongue and removed the tiny piece of ice cream. Mac visibly swallowed. Mrs. Clark smiled as she took a bite from her cone. Hmm, considering that me and Danica here are going to have a girl's day out, you kids are going to have an entire afternoon to yourself. Seems a shame to waste a beautiful day like that inside, don't you think? Kimberly nearly choked on her cone. My uncle might need help with the renovations. Pfft, Mrs. Clark dismissed her answer with a wave of her cone. I know my friend. He wouldn't let you work on Sunday unless it's absolutely necessary. I... I don't know. Her insides twisting, Kimberly looked at Mac and had to stop herself from leaning in his direction. She'd said she didn't want them to get too close yesterday. Would he want to spend time with her now? She should stay away from him, really, she should. But she couldn't come up with a good excuse. Or maybe she didn't want to. Danica finished her ice cream fast, and Mac wiped her face and hands with a napkin, smiling at his girl with so much gentleness in his eyes that Kimberly's heart shifted. Then Danica blinked at her. Miss Kimberly, I don't want a daddy to stay alone. I'm gonna look after grandma today. I can't look after daddy. 
I wanna you look after him today. Mac nearly choked on his chocolate ice cream. Sweetheart, I don't need looking after. Danica sighed. When you're alone, you're sad. I don't wanna you be sad. Then she gave Kimberly that innocent irresistible grin again. Pretty, pretty please? Kimberly opened her mouth and closed it, the image of herself as a little girl appearing again. Nobody had taken her seriously then. Her requests had remained unanswered, and her chest still ached at the memory. No, she didn't think kids should get everything they asked for, but this request she could fulfill. Her increased heartbeat told her she wanted to fulfill it. Her fingers tightened around her waffle cone as if it were a chilled bottle of wine, and she could nearly feel the first burning sip of sweet liquid, anticipation building inside her. Then she nodded. How can one resist those eyes? She made sure she looked at the girl when she'd said it. But the truth was, she couldn't resist the girl's father's eyes either. They still held the same enticing effect on her, like a forest lake, and she drowned in their green depths, by her own volition. Hurrah! Danica screamed, ran to her, and threw her tiny hands around Kimberly's neck. As Kimberly's rib cage constricted, she couldn't say a single word. Then Danica sent a generous smile, her father's way, and climbed on her pink seat again. You're welcome, Daddy. Mrs. Clark chuckled. Giving a good impression of a man who'd been knocked flat by a five year old tornado, Mac emitted a choked, Thank you, sweetheart. Kimberly just needed to exercise all her willpower with this man. Easier said than done. It wasn't only about his skills in the kissing department or his rugged looks, or that apparently, she had a weakness for cowboys. For so long, she'd dealt with people who'd employed underhanded tactics while climbing a corporate ladder, including Susanna, that being around someone who spoke his mind was as refreshing as the hay-scented country air after the city's car fumes. He had honor, integrity, and fine, that broad chest she could lean into and hope she could become whole again. But with her shameful secret, how much honor and integrity did she have? I'm going to tell him today. A lump formed in her throat. Today? Later. The day wasn't over yet, right? As they left the parlor, he shifted closer to her and held her gaze in his. Then he whispered into her ear, would you like to go to the pond? He remembered. Their special place where they'd kissed for the first time. Her heart skipped a beat. I'd love to. She nearly stumbled on the even pavement as she reached her car. She closed her eyes, fighting down her doubts, ignoring the guilt assailing her. She shouldn't have said yes to spending more time with him. But as his face brightened before he leaned to his little girl and lifted her to put in his truck, she couldn't force herself to say no now. Um, I have a new phone. I wondered if you'd like, ugh. Her ears warmed. Maybe he didn't want to have her phone number, and here she was offering. Was that a hint of pink coloring his tan cheeks above that well-trimmed beard? I, uh, you called me last night, remember? I saved the number. Oops. How had she forgotten? Her self-defense instructor would tell her off for making such an elementary mistake as not blocking her number before making calls. But this was Mac. Her insides warmed with something completely different from embarrassment as she realized he had wanted her phone number. Even leaving him now to take ice cream cones home for her uncle and aunt left her with longing, as if she needed to wait over two decades again to see him instead of a few hours. Her stomach twisted as she waved farewell to the small family. Bye, Miss Kimberly. Danica waved, reaching a soft spot. Bye, sweetheart. Kimberly waved back. A deep longing filling her entire being, she climbed inside her vehicle. What was she doing? Going to the pond that held many memories with him wasn't the best way to stop herself from falling in love with him again. On the contrary. She breathed in the fresh car scent of her peach air freshener. She bought her father the expensive car he'd always wanted, too, drove it to the small condo she'd paid for, and left the keys on his desk. Thankfully, he'd been sober for years now, and he'd never driven drunk to start with. If he preferred to keep running, he might as well do it in style. The grand gesture couldn't return her sister or lessen her guilt, but at least she'd done something. 
Enough thinking about the past. She should call Mac and cancel. Really, she should. She started the engine and watched him drive out of the parking lot, leaving a few fumes. Oh, who am I kidding, she told the container of ice cream cones in the passenger seat. She was drawn too much to Mac to cancel. She'd just have to nurse her broken heart again when she left Cowboy Crossing, her hopes of being happy with him dissolving into thin air like the fumes from his truck. Chapter 11 Hours later, Mac watched the pond's peaceful waters. That peacefulness was interrupted only by occasional quacks of ducks or whispers of leaves in the breeze. When Danica was three, he began bringing her here to feed birds. Not exactly to this spot, but to one a little further west, with a small pier he'd built for her. He should bring her here soon, too. There was no need to keep this spot close to the water, with trees looking at themselves, tucked in like he'd kept his feelings for Kimberly tucked in deep inside. His heart squeezed. Was Kimberly running late? Or did she decide not to show up? Wouldn't be the first time she said she'd come and no-showed. No. That wasn't fair. She'd explained why. She'd be here this time. He knew that was something deep inside him, just as surely as he knew the sun would rise tomorrow. But unlike knowing that, knowing it would rise and set in return, he didn't know if she'd come back again tomorrow. He picked up a pebble and skipped it over the surface, careful to keep it away from where the ducks were. They still lifted in the air, of course, quacking out complaints. Another pebble skipped over the water, and he whirled around. I didn't hear you arrive. When did she learn to walk so soundlessly? There were bound to have been a few twigs on her way. I didn't want to interrupt the quiet, her voice was soft, nearly a whisper. Excitement stirred him, and something more, much more than he wanted to admit, even to himself. Huh. His pounding heart was probably interrupting the quiet well enough already. He drew a deep breath of air that smelled of grass, with a hint of algae. It was unreasonable to get so excited about her being back, even if only for a few days. But this was Kimberly. His emotions had never been reasonable when it came to her. He studied the familiar features of the lovely girl she'd once been. The rich chestnut hair he used to run his fingers through that was so much shorter now, probably styled in a modern fashion. The plump pink lips he used to kiss, which sent blood rushing faster in his veins. The girl who'd smiled easily and asked to ride in the back of the truck he'd gotten from his father because that way she could hug the wind. But she wasn't that joyful teenager anymore. Now, sadness shadowed her blue eyes, and responsibility weighed on her fragile shoulders. He knew all about how responsibility weighed a person down. After his father's death, being the oldest of three brothers had made him realize he was responsible for his siblings. That had forced him to mature fast. Maybe that had made him hesitant to get close to people, as well, especially after Kimberly never came back and years later his wife left him. Mac winced. He'd become too afraid to get attached because, once he had, he usually lost those people. After what had happened to Kimberly, they probably had that in common. How long are you going to stay, he blurted out. Not sure. A barely perceptible shiver went through her. Not long, most likely. Was she cold? While summer evenings were warm, today was cooler than usual, and a light breeze skimmed the pond. Her long silk blouse, the beautiful color of her eyes, worn untucked over her navy blue slacks, might not be enough for the wind. He shrugged out of his leather jacket and wrapped it over those fragile shoulders. His fingertips touched her neck as he did that, and his reaction to a simple touch startled him. His pulse became a staccato. Ridiculous. He wasn't a love-struck teenager anymore, but a single father and a ranch owner. A man who took his obligation seriously and knew enough not to make the same mistake twice. Her eyes widened, and her lips parted. His hand slid over her shoulders and stayed there as he savored a crazy idea of kissing her again. She licked her lips as she'd done with that dollop of ice cream in the corner of her mouth, and that wasn't helping. Only with a gigantic effort did he force himself to move back. I hope this will warm you up. Did disappointment flash in her eyes, or was it his wishful thinking? Thanks. 
She turned away, and neither of them said a word as they stared at the water. He felt her withdraw from him internally. She was so close he could reach out to her, touch her, hug her, and at the same time, she was so far away as if she were already back in Chicago. What was going on in her mind? What was going on in her life, besides the information he'd insisted she divulge last night? He'd received some information from the PI he'd hired, who happened to be a family friend, too. But he didn't want to talk about that yet. These quiet minutes with her needed to be treasured. Lord, what should I do? Max studied the profile that drew him despite his best intentions. Why, oh why, was he letting her back in his life? She'd become part of him so much. Losing her again would hurt almost as much as losing a limb. Then she turned to him. I should answer your question better. I have a week of vacation I want to use to help my uncle with the BNB renovations. But if he doesn't need me, and, she drew a shaky breath. And everything is quiet, I might leave early. So he had less than a week to win her back. Whoa. Where did that thought come from? He'd better concentrate on present matters rather than crazy ideas. The way the breeze played with the hair framing her lovely face. The way he wanted to gaze at each of the minuscule darker specks in her blue eyes. Or how much he wanted to forget what divided them and claim her lips, with his, and hope they could have a second chance. None of that nonsense. He was a practical man. And a practical man would concentrate on the fact she might have a stalker. Worry for her clasped his spine with cold fingers. With a determined look in her eyes, she shrugged out of his jacket and returned it to him. I'm not cold. Really. I'm fine. Well, okay. Dismissing any disappointment, he threw his jacket on the grass and gestured for her to sit. He should build a bench here. Even if Kimberly might never use it. She lowered herself on the jacket, and he sat on the grass near her. Bringing her here might not be a good idea if someone followed her from Chicago and was watching her. He was selfish. Maybe we should leave. Making no move to leave, he watched his surroundings for anything suspicious. No. Let's stay a while longer. It's so peaceful. Her expression relaxed as she stared at the water. He always thought, hoped, the ranch and everything within it could be healing. Lord, please heal her soul. She reached into her purse and gave him an insignificant-looking brooch. Here. This is the brooch Mrs. Becker gave me. Thanks. He placed it in his jeans pocket. His fingers itched to touch her, to trace the familiar outline of her face, and his lips were thirsty to drink hers in. Instead, he said, the investigator I told you about flew to Chicago this morning. She did some research and reported back to me. Her head snapped to him. Already? That was fast. I'm a man of my word. He cringed. Hopefully, that didn't sound like he hinted she didn't keep her word. Her gaze became pensive instead of being offended. What, did she discover? Not much yet. Vera checked her ex-fiancé's social media accounts and talked to a few of his co-workers and neighbors. Her eyes widened. On Sunday? And under what pretense? He shrugged. He'd used Vera's services several times for employee background investigations as well as when he'd suspected his accountant of wrongdoing. She'd always done the job well. He'd also heard she'd solved a few murders when she'd worked as a police officer in Kansas City. She'd once been best friends with his brother, Maverick, and Max suspected Maverick had even had a crush on her. So maybe now that she was back in Cowboy Crossing his brother could. No, Maverick loved his racing way too much to give it up. Even for Vera. He shrugged. She says she has her methods. I don't ask what those methods are as long as I get the results. What did she find out? Tipping her face to him, Kimberly pressed her lips into a worried frown. He ached to touch her hand, but stopped himself. So far, she'd been sending mixed signals, and he couldn't decipher them. She'd leaned into him yesterday when he'd hugged her, but then when he'd walked her to the door, she'd disappeared before he could say anything. 
She'd offered to cook pancakes for his daughter, had explained why she'd disappeared over two decades ago, his heart still ached at the reason, but then she'd told him there could be nothing between them. He resisted shaking his head in bewilderment. How was a man supposed to figure it all out? So he wouldn't. He'd try to help her and do his best not to lose his heart in the process. Well, Larry didn't sound happy with his life. He complained it was all because of you. She gasped. You're kidding me. Sorry. She shuddered. How, how could that be? Maybe he was pushing her too far. He'd never wanted to hurt her, and he was already hurting for her. He barely resisted the urge to hug her, not so much, because he wanted to feel her close, okay, he did, too, but to give her his support. He had more bad news. Did you know that Susanna had a brother in prison who was released two weeks ago? I had no clue. So much misery in her voice. She leaned against him and drew her knees close. Could she hate me that much and want that promotion so badly that she'd ask her brother? We'll figure it out. His hand found hers, and her fingers tightened around his as he watched leaves moving on the trees. Then she turned to him. Thank you. For helping me. For forgiving me. For being who you are. Compassion, and something else he didn't want to identify, squeezed his rib cage as he looked into her baby blues. He was losing his heart to her again, or maybe he'd just never taken it back. He'd be better off if he ran away from it, let Kimberly go. But he couldn't do it. He made himself go back into business mode, which wasn't easy when his heart pounded from her proximity and the scent of her peach shampoo made his pulse hum. If he ever decided to move to Chicago for her, he wouldn't know how to survive in a place like that. This land wasn't just his roots. It was his life. He lived and breathed ranching long before he became responsible for it. And Danica wouldn't be happy without her grandma, her auntie and uncle, and her pony. Wait a moment. Was he considering moving for Kimberly? When he'd been a teen, somehow things like that seemed possible. But now besides a great geographical distance, he sensed more. There was a distance inside her. Yes, she'd let him hug her and hugged him back, his pulse increased again at the recent memory, but she wasn't letting him close to her soul. Maybe she never would. His stomach clenched. He could reach out and touch her hand, but his heart couldn't reach out and touch her heart any longer. He looked at the pond's surface and the four ducks swimming there now. Looking into her eyes and knowing how far apart they'd become was too painful to bear. She rose, picked up his jacket, and gave it to him. I love it here, but you're right. We need to return. They walked to his truck and her little showstopper car. He lowered his tailgate and sat on it. He didn't want to be apart from her yet. So he wrapped his arm around her shoulders and drew her close, even if that made his heart hammer. He stilled, too, afraid she might pull away. Instead, she wiggled up beside him and leaned into him, and his pulse became erratic. Thinking straight became difficult now, but he had to do it. I have to ask this. Did anything else happen before the so-called mugging attempt? This time she did withdraw from him. Then something unexpected happened. She hit her face on his chest, and her shoulders started shaking while he heard muffled sobs. It's not connected, but... It was the anniversary of my sister's death, she whispered between sobs. A lump clogged his throat as he ran his palms over her shoulders. I'm so sorry. He couldn't imagine losing a sibling, and he had four of them, while she'd had only one. She'd been close with her sister. He knew that much from spending those summers with her. She'd missed her sister during vacations when Serena couldn't come to the BMB, despite Kimberly's parents playing favorites and dedicating more attention to the girl, in their opinion, more beautiful and talented than her. In his opinion, Kimberly was plenty beautiful and talented. The lump in his throat threatened to clog his windpipe as her sobs died down. She looked up at him, her blue eyes sparkling from tears. He cupped her face, desperate to find words to make her feel better. Probably unlike the city folk she was used to, he wasn't one for eloquent phrases. So he said what he felt. 
I have no clue what to say. I really don't. I just want you to know I'm here for you. For a moment, she stared at him, droplets of tears sparkling on her long luscious eyelashes. You need to know something about me. He tensed. That secret he'd suspected. She took a deep breath, then breathed out. Okay, here it goes. You know how my father was an alcoholic? He nodded, compassion, stirring him. Yes, and I'm so sorry you had to go through that. Misery settled in her eyes. Well, I don't blame this on him. I was a teen when I started drinking. After my sister died, and he left. His jaw slackened. What? An ache hollowed his gut. How? How could this be? Hadn't she seen with her own eyes how much grief alcoholism could cause to the person and the family? She, she looked so well put together. She was successful. She, she couldn't be an alcoholic. Her chuckle held no mirth. I guess I missed the scent of whiskey around the house. No, not that, of course. Alcohol helped me forget, gave me some moments of respite. He sat there, numb, waiting for the pounding of his heart to subside. Guilt tautened her features, and she'd suffered enough. He couldn't be judgmental, even if all the drunken scenes with his ex appeared before his eyes, even if her screams rang in his ears, even if worry about how it had affected their daughter had wrecked him. He'd only push Kimberly away. Lord, please give me patience and understanding. He found her hand. Then you became addicted. Please say no. Her eyebrows rose as she looked at their united hands as if she didn't expect him to support her now. She probably expected him to be as unbending and inflexible in moral matters as he used to be, and that stung. Actually, I thought I was managing it pretty well. She looked straight ahead of her. In the pause, he didn't say anything, still trying to process this whole thing. Kimberly drank. Kimberly was an alcoholic. Kimberly had trusted him enough to tell him. Honestly. I managed to graduate from college and make a career. I only drank on the weekends. I went through periods of time when I managed to quit. Of course, eventually, I returned to the wine. My old friend. The one who was always there for me. How could she call wine her old friend? Why hadn't she turned to him? Why hadn't she leaned on God, first and foremost? No judging. Just listening. He took a deep breath to calm his turmoil. His fingers laced through hers, not letting her go. Even now, he couldn't let her go. I'd have been there for you if you'd let me. Then you wouldn't have had Danica. Wouldn't have made the ranch into what it is. Everything happens for a reason, right? A wobbly smile climbed onto her lips, tried to stay, then fled. Do you, his voice dipped, still drink? He had to ask, though he wasn't sure he wanted to know. Her every lovely feature twisted, contorted by angst and disgust and longing? I've been sober for four years. You're not going to believe this. I saw Dad at Alcoholics Anonymous. What a family reunion. Lord, help me find the right words. Max stared into the blue depths of her eyes, focusing on what he saw, not what he heard. So much pain, so much shame, so much regret. He couldn't hit her with hurtful words. Instead, he needed to focus on her courage to quit, to stay sober for years. That must have been excruciating. He surprised himself by kissing her fingers and voicing his thoughts. I'm so proud of you. I know staying sober must have been difficult for you. Longing unraveled inside him, sweeping pain aside. Longing for that hopeful, innocent girl she'd once been. Thank you, she whispered. But you see, the craving never really goes away. Which meant. She could return to her addiction. Any time. His ex had promised to quit multiple times, had stayed sober for months. But it had never been forever. No. Judging. Why don't you call me when you have a craving? He feathered her hair through his fingers. I do. 
now. She leaned to him, and every cell in his body woke up to life. He had to exercise all his willpower to stay still, especially when she slipped her arms around his neck. But when she tipped her face, her eyes wide, he circled his arms around her waist. She shifted closer to him, and his breath caught in his throat. As her lips parted, his willpower evaporated like morning dew in the field. He dipped his head and met her halfway. Then he claimed her lips slowly, tentatively, giving her the possibility to retreat, though he'd hate to have that happen. She responded with such sweetness and eagerness that his head started spinning. Did she need this as desperately as he did, maybe more? They'd kissed as teenagers, many times, and those times would have been even more numerous if it were up to him. But this was a different kiss. At that time, it was curiosity and exploration of the world of new feelings. This time, it was coming back to something familiar and precious that had been lost and found. Even more precious, because now he knew it could be lost again any time. Amazing sensations swept him up as the wave of pleasure and delight covered him, and he didn't want the kiss to end. Soon, all too soon, she drew back. She blinked and drew her palm to her lips. Then she leaped off the tailgate as if the metal was red hot. I'm sorry. That shouldn't have happened. She stumbled. That shouldn't happen again. I, I need to get back to my uncle. His heart was still beating a staccato in the aftermath of the kiss, so it took him a moment to regroup. Then his heart tumbled to the grass. Wow. He had an opposite opinion about the situation. He wanted to kiss her again and again and again, and preferably soon. He raked his fingers through his hair. He wanted to, but he wouldn't because he respected her wishes. I'll walk you to your car. He had two reasons for that. First, he wanted to spend more time with her, even if it was just a few more minutes. Pathetic, right? Second, he didn't want her to be alone. The security system in the BNB was great, but he intended to follow her in his truck to make sure she got inside the building safely. Maybe she had nothing to worry about. Or maybe somebody had employed scare tactics to drive her out of Chicago. Or maybe there was something more than that. He hoped it wasn't the latter because as she clicked on the fob and he opened the driver's side door for her, he had a weird feeling of being watched. Chapter 12 The next evening, Kimberly stepped back, surveyed her handiwork, and smiled. Her muscles hummed with tiredness, but she could congratulate herself. The room looked great with freshly painted latte-colored walls. If you're not going to put that roller down, I'm going to wrestle it out of your hands. Her uncle's grumpy voice reached her from the hall. She chuckled as he entered the room. I just did. Now I only need to wash it and the brushes. What you need is rest and food. Thank you for your help, though. Annie is happy to have an excuse not to cook with the kitchen like that, so we're going out for barbecue. Care to join us? Kindness shone in his gray eyes as he stepped to her. Her stomach perked up. Hmm, juicy, tender barbecue with sweet and spicy sauce. Her mouth watered. That diner truly did have a local secret ingredient. She'd never tasted anything quite the same. And she'd been to some mighty fine restaurants. But she needed to call Kansas about work and her neighbor, Mrs. Becker, and that took priority over her hunger. Just bring me some takeout, please. I'll take burnt brisket with fries and coleslaw. I'll pay you back. He shook his head. No. No paying back. When had he gotten all that salt in his once pepper black hair? He used to wear a beard and mustache, but was now cleanly shaven, and maybe that was the reason his wrinkles were more pronounced. Wow, she'd been gone so long. She closed her eyes as if she could shut out the sight and the accompanying guilt. I'm sorry I didn't come back sooner. Light-headed, she needed to lean against something, but she couldn't lean against freshly painted walls. She needed to stand tall. That was what her mother always said. And I'm sorry I wasn't with you when, he stopped as if saying the words was as difficult as hearing them would be. I know. It's okay. Really. You had your own family to take care of. 
Tears burned behind her eyes again, and she blinked furiously. It had been over twenty years. Why couldn't she stop grieving? Why couldn't she let go? I shouldn't tell you this, but it wasn't because of my family. He rubbed a large hand over his eyes. They looked even more careworn when he pulled it away. His lips pressed tight, opened, and pressed tight again. What was he trying to, or trying not to, say? Your father didn't want me around. What? Wincing as if slapped, she reached to brace herself against the wall. No, not these walls. Stand tall, right? Surely, her father had some logical reason. He probably didn't want the reminder that his brother still had both of his children when he'd lost his favorite. But oh, how much that hurt. She'd needed support so badly then, and not from her favorite counselor. Then, when he told me he left his family, I tried to reason with him. He wouldn't listen. I called your mother, but she said I wasn't welcome. I'm sorry. I failed you when you needed help the most. She touched his forearm, trying to press as much reassurance as she could into her gesture. I want you around. You and your family are welcome to come visit Chicago anytime. I'll try to be here more often, too. I'd love that. He laid his hand atop hers, gave it a gentle pat. And I shouldn't have stayed away from you all these years just to please my brother or his former wife. I guess I'm more like him than I realize. Sometimes I run away from my issues, too. He was nothing like her father. She squeezed his arm. No, you're not. What are you going to do for the evening? And don't even try to paint another room, or I'll ask you to leave. I have some things to take care of. Work-related. It was the truth. Partially. After he left, she picked up the tray with the paintbrushes and roller covers, and marched to the nearest bathroom. As she rubbed the brushes under the water to get the paint out before it dried, her thoughts kept returning to the conversation. Was she more like her father than she'd realized, too? Was she running away from her issues, this time all the way to Cowboy Crossing? Just like she'd run yesterday, literally, after that mind-blowing kiss with Mac. A heat wave covered her. She must have lost her mind to go for that kiss, even worse, initiate it. She squeezed the water from clean brushes and rested them on the tray, now repeating the process with the roller cover. Yes, the kiss was wrong, so wrong. Yet, it felt absolutely right, so very right. No. No more thoughts like that. She squared her shoulders. Bad enough that she'd thought about Mac the entire day and longed to see him and his little girl again. The further she stayed from that little family, the better off they'd be. Once the water coming from the roller cover was transparent, she moved her fingers over the soft surface, getting it as dry as possible. She left the tray in the next room waiting for paint and walked back to her own. She smiled as she entered it. Her uncle had moved the white wooden furniture she'd once used to this room and even pinned up the posters she used to have on the walls. Mrs. Annie had plugged in a peach-scented air freshener, knowing it was Kimberly's favorite scent. A pleasant feeling uplifted her as she breathed in the aroma. Once again, she felt like coming home, and once again, she had to dismiss the feeling. Home was in Chicago, and she'd be wise to remember it. She changed from her paint-stained overalls into jeans that were supposed to be slimming and flattering and a long t-shirt she wore without tucking in, a few tricks she'd learned to look thinner. Then she snatched her phone from the nightstand. Oh. Three missed calls from Mac and two from Kansas. A pleasant feeling that Mac had called mixed with worry that something might have happened to him or Danica. She hurried to press the call back button without thinking twice about it as she sank into the soft peachy bedspread on her bed, letting it cuddle around her. After she'd been standing the entire day, her tired feet didn't want to hold her any longer. Hello, Kimberly. I could start to think you're avoiding my calls. Just the husky sound of his voice made her heart flutter. Of course not. I left the phone in my room while I was painting to avoid ruining it. Sorry, I missed your calls. So much for staying away from him. But she couldn't ignore him, could she? 
Well, if you're busy painting. No, I'm done for the day. Why did she jump in and say that? Her face heated up as she rushed on. My uncle has this weird idea of not letting me work more than nine hours straight. She should have told him she was busy. She should have. Her exhausted muscles concurred. Nine hours? I agree with your uncle. Well, if you can still stand upright, Danica keeps asking when you're going to come bake cookies with us. She even made me buy cookie dough today and sprinkles. Her heart warmed. But she didn't need to get attached to that little girl any more than she already had, and she didn't need Danica to get attached to her. Don't tell me you burned her cookies, too. Hey. Well, that's what my daughter claims, but I don't remember any such thing. You did, Daddy, a girl's voice piped up somewhere in the background. Maybe just a few. His playful tone sobered up and dipped low. There are also some things I want to talk to you about. She swallowed hard. So he didn't invite her because he wanted to see her again, but because he felt he needed to help her. He'd always had that helping streak. Being the oldest brother who'd suddenly had to take care of his siblings at far too young an age took those qualities to a new level. His ex-wife had made an enormous mistake leaving him, though Kimberly understood better than anyone the strong pull alcohol could have on a person. Mac was a rare treasure, and based on what Kimberly had heard from Mrs. Annie, nearly all the women in Cowboy Crossing considered him as such. Maybe with the exception of elderly Mrs. McGuire, and Kimberly wasn't so sure about that. If he'd ventured out of his hometown more often, the entire state of Missouri would consider him as such, too. I understand if you're reluctant to see me now, but, his voice dipped with a trace of hurt, this might be important. I'm not reluctant to see you. A deep longing confirmed her words. On the contrary, she wanted to see him more than she wanted to take her next breath. Even more than she craved the oblivion alcohol could provide, and that was saying something. She glanced at her watch. She'd rather wait for her uncle and his wife to be back before leaving, especially as they'd gone to the trouble to get her takeout. Well, barbecue was just as good for breakfast. I think I can be at your place in about an hour, if that will work. An hour sounds great. Yay, a child's voice cheered. The girl's enthusiasm touched Kimberly. Against her better judgment, she was getting attached. I look forward to seeing Danica and, and you. She might as well admit it. It was already obvious in her soft, warm voice. We can't wait to see you, too. He paused. You know, how about Danica, and I pick you up in an hour? You don't want me to drive alone, do you? She cringed. Come on. This is Cowboy Crossing. The crime rate here is nearly non-existent. Then why did a little shiver travel down her back? Humor us. His voice caressed her ear, bringing back memories of the tender things he once whispered to her. We might have to pick up more sprinkles on the way, anyway. Yes, daddy. Cookies gotta have lot of sprinkles, Danica's little voice insisted. See you soon. He disconnected. Even as Kimberly stared at the blank screen, she was reluctant to let the phone go as if her fingers were wrapped around his hand instead. Finally, she placed it back on the nightstand, the excitement of seeing Mac soon bubbling up. Now, what to wear? She got up to retired, and yes, protesting, feet. She couldn't look too dressed up for baking cookies. But she had to look nice. Slimming or not, old jeans and a ragged t-shirt wouldn't cut it. She should put her hair up, too. She eyed her wall mirror and pulled her hair up, then secured it with pins. Did Mac like updos? Oh, and she needed a shower. She couldn't show up, smelling like paint and sweat. She hurried toward the bathroom when she remembered Kansas's missed calls, turned around, and rushed back to the nightstand. Oops. Flinching at her negligence, she called her best friend back. Hello, Kimberly. Yikes, that was formal. He must be mad. She bit her bottom lip. Sorry, I missed your calls. I have news you might not like. Her heart dipped. 
It wasn't like her friend to skip pleasantries and go straight to business. No joking around, no teasing about Mac. What happened? Several things. As you know, I keep abreast of what's happening not only in my company but also in other companies. She rubbed her forehead, her former excitement diminishing. I know. Kansas was sociable and well-liked, and people often questioned his close friendship with a woman as conservative as she was who mostly kept to herself. The word on the street, by that, I mean in the building, is that Susanna is getting a leg up. She might receive the next promotion. Frankly, I don't want you to miss out again. You worked too hard for it. Blood thrummed in her temples. You know why I left Chicago. I can help you here. Hire you a bodyguard if needed. Anyway, I'm just passing you the information. Susanna is spreading rumors about your leaving. She makes it sound like you don't care about the company and the crucial bid they are working on. Her temples started throbbing. She didn't want to leave Cowboy Crossing, her uncle, Danica, and Mac. It was like ripping out her heart again. Baking cookies with Mac and Danica seemed like the sense of her life now. Go figure. Back to the present matters. I know you have your old flame in Cowboy Crossing. Kansas's voice dipped. But I also know how much you've worked for something that might slip away. You deserve this promotion. I thought I'd let you know. After a few peaceful days in Cowboy Crossing, the stalker seemed a distant, and unlikely, memory. And if he was a reality and someone was trying to force her out of Chicago, she was just playing to their favor. Should she return to Chicago now? She had to make a decision. Thank you. For everything. How is your little boy? Growing up fast. His voice warmed. Thank you for asking. And Mrs. Becker? Did you get me her phone number? He paused. That's the other thing I wanted to talk to you about. I knocked on her door. Twice. No answer. I'll keep checking. The throbbing began drumming against her skull. Another reason she needed to be back in Chicago, and fast, so she could check on her neighbor. Hopefully, nothing had happened to the lady. She pressed a cold hand to one temple, then the other. Would she have to request someone break into the apartment to make sure Mrs. Becker was okay? It wasn't like the older woman to be out quite this much. Thank you for doing all this for me. She disconnected, her mood quite opposite from before the call. Without excitement and adrenaline pumping in her veins, fatigue took over and exhaustion weighed on her shoulders. Then she straightened her spine to its full capacity. Well, if her boss could dismiss all her hard work and overlook her because she took a week vacation, the first time in five years, then maybe she was working for the wrong company. With her resume, done with Kansas's help, she could go somewhere where they'd appreciate her more. She grimaced. The corner office no longer held as much appeal. The hamster in the wheel was tired indeed. She marched to the shower. She'd stayed at the same company and the same city for so long to avoid being like her father, who'd changed jobs and places too frequently. But it was time to grow a backbone, too. When she stepped out of the shower, Kansas had texted and said one of the neighbors told him Mrs. Becker had decided to visit her sister down south. Kimberly could breathe easier without having to worry about the sweet older woman. She could always trust Kansas to come through for her. Why hadn't she fallen in love with this great, handsome, accomplished guy who'd clearly had feelings for her? Why had she told him they could only be friends? Mac. She might not have realized it before, but she'd never gotten over Mac. For all his faults, Larry was right. She'd never let him into her heart. Why had she gone out with him and then accepted his proposal? Maybe she'd been tired of staying in her tower of loneliness and they seemed to have a lot in common, and as for marriage to a guy she wasn't sure she loved. She and her sister talked so much about marrying one day and having kids who were going to be loved, unlike their own family. Kimberly felt obligated to make that part of the dream come true. As she dried her hair, the scent of peach shampoo spreading in a small room with marmalade-hued walls and matching towels, the longing inside her intensified. 
time to be honest. She wasn't keen on returning to Chicago because she didn't want to leave Mac. Maybe she was prolonging the inevitable, but she was hungry for a few more days with him and his daughter. After alternating between a business suit that was too dressy and a t-shirt and jeans that weren't dressy enough, she opted for an aquamarine shirt that complemented her eyes and designer jeans that flattered her figure and somehow even made her tummy look flat. She didn't tuck the shirt in because she looked slimmer with it worn over jeans. Then she sprinkled on drops of perfume that held her favorite peachy notes and slipped into her high-heeled shoes. A few swipes of mascara and a layer of pink lipstick later, she met her uncle and Mrs. Annie downstairs. You look beautiful. He smiled at her. I hope you're about to see Mac. Uncle Bob. It's a small town. Rumors spread fast. Mrs. Annie smiled as well, but a touch of sadness wobbled on that smile. He's a good guy. I know it wasn't your fault that you couldn't come back years ago, but, well, don't break his heart again. A lump formed in Kimberly's throat. The doorbell rang. Mrs. Annie turned to open it, but Kimberly stopped her with a wave of her hand. Wait. Let me check first, please. She glanced through the peephole. Chapter 13 Her heartbeat picked up at the sight of Mac. Holding Danica's tiny hand, he entered the B&B and smiled at her. You look great. He leaned a little closer. Smell great, too. Her heart started beating wildly. How come, even two decades later, he still had the same effect on her as in her teens? Thank you. A few minutes and one short ride in his truck later, she was inside his ranch house and stopped in her tracks at the side of the set table. A large bowl of brisket steamed next to one carrying baked potatoes and another with a garden salad. She breathed in the smoky barbecue scent and her mouth watered. After skipping inside ahead of her, Danica spun around and hugged her legs. Miss Kimberly, can you braid my hair again? Pretty please? And wanna see my drawings? Kimberly smiled at the adorable girl as she leaned to hug her back. I'd love to braid your hair. And I'd love to see your drawings. Straightening, she tilted her face toward Mac. Smells great. Thanks. He grinned. I took a shower. Just like in her teens, that smile made her heart flip-flop. She laughed. You know I didn't mean that. The barbecue, though I think someone talked about cookies. She hid her relief well. Baking cookies with her should come with a hazard warning. He shifted from one foot to the other as if caught doing something he wasn't supposed to. Danica changed her mind. And, um, I got a chance to be home early, so I barbecued. Besides, cookies are not dinner. Says him. She'd tried it a few times when she was working and had nothing else in the office. But she'd prefer this any day. Her stomach growled. She was hungrier than she'd realized. Looks awesome. She didn't mean just the barbecue. Even without his Stetson and cowboy boots, wearing faded jeans and a bright buckle with the ranch insignia and a simple t-shirt outlining his muscles, he could take her breath away. He chuckled. Let me wash mine and Danica's hands, and we can dig in. Kimberly rested her hand on Danica's glossy head. I'd love to see your drawings first. Maybe, she shouldn't have said that. He might be worried about dinner getting cold. She tipped her face up to him again, one brow rising. If you don't mind. A grateful smile lit his face. Of course. The girl rushed to her room and returned with large sheets of paper, mainly with kittens, ponies, and puppies. They are great. When Kimberly grinned at her, Danica beamed. This one is for you. She waved a kitten drawing. Do you like it? I love it. Thank you. Something shifting inside her, Kimberly placed a kiss on the top of the girl's head. Soon they sat at the table. Mac took her left hand, making her do that weird movement in her chest again, and Danica slipped her tiny palm into her right one. As the father and the daughter bowed their heads, Kimberly had no choice but to follow their example. Even if she couldn't pray anymore, 
she could listen to their prayer. I'm gonna say grace. Danica surprised her by announcing. Dear Lord, thank you for this food to fill our tummies. Please bless it. Please help Daddy find a new mommy for me. Someone who's gonna love him, too. The whole bunches. Please bless my grandma and my uncles, aunties, and cousin. We're hungry, so I ain't gonna name them all, but you know them, right? As the child paused as if thinking about something, her words reached deep inside Kimberly, a place she'd kept hidden since her sister's death. And crazy, crazy, craziness crawled into that place with them, bringing a longing to become that new mommy Danica had asked about and deserved. Kimberly did a mental head shake. That was probably impossible. Taking a deep breath, Danica continued, please keep my pony safe. And please help Miss Kimberly here. She always looks so sad. Amen. Amen, Mac echoed. After the girl's hand slipped out of hers and Mac had let her other one go, Kimberly couldn't move. A lump formed in her throat. Danica's words were so sincere, and Kimberly was grateful to be included in her prayer, but. Did she look sad? She'd achieved so much, proven herself with an expensive condo, luxurious car, and generous gifts to the people who should have loved her unconditionally. She was so close to a great promotion that she could smell it like she could smell the barbecue on the table. But was her heart in it? Did that make her happy? Was God showing her something now? She rubbed her forehead. She'd spent so many years away from God she wouldn't recognize if he showed her something right before her eyes. Are you okay? Mac's voice startled her. She forked a bite of delicious meat with a smoky, slightly tangy sauce that melted on her tongue. This was even better than at their favorite restaurant in town, and that place claimed to have one of the best barbecues in the world. I'm fine. This is amazing, by the way. Yummy. Danica confirmed, munching on her food. Mac threw his daughter a loving gaze, then wiped a glop of sauce from her cheek with a napkin. Glad you're enjoying it, munchkin. After a few more bites, the girl pushed away her plate. Can I stay with you or grandma tomorrow? I don't want to go to daycare. A worried frown creased his forehead. I have to work tomorrow, and grandma is going out of town for the day. Why? Don't you like daycare? Kids called me stupid and stubborn. They said it was because my mommy was an alco, Alci. Kimberly's heart squeezed at the child's words and the pained expression in Mac's eyes. She feathered soft hair away from Danica's eyes. Don't listen to them. You're a beautiful, smart girl. Can you be my new mommy? Then they won't tease me, and I won't have to hit them to make them stop. Wide-eyed, Kimberly glanced at Mac. A muscle moved in his cheek, tweaking his trim beard. I had a difficult conversation with the daycare owner. It took a lot of persuasion to keep Danica in the group. Danica clapped as if Kimberly being her mommy was a done deal. You're pretty. Dad says you got an important job in Chica, well, some big city. If you're gonna pick me up with Daddy at daycare, everybody will see how awesome my new mommy is. Uh-oh. Kimberly's jaw slackened. Mac coughed a little as he refilled her glass. Sweetheart. Miss Kimberly is not going to stay here long. She's just here for a vacation. Remember that important job in Chicago? Danica pouted. Huh. Oh. No, no, no. What could she do to help this sweet girl? Then Danica looked up, a fresh smile bunching up her cute face. Can we rent you then? While you're here? Daddy, you rented a pony for me when you couldn't buy me one. Miss Kimberly, pretty please? As a choked sound jumped from her throat, Kimberly didn't know whether to laugh or to cry. Uh, um, Mac visibly swallowed. Kimberly is not for rent. I mean, she's not a horse. Well, this guy knew how to sweet-talk a lady. Kimberly took a few hurried sips of her drink. Thank you for that observation. I didn't mean it like that. I meant. I don't know what I meant. He raked his fingers through his hair. 
man, this parenting stuff is tough. We can't rent a new mommy. Danica let out a sigh, too deep for such small lungs. That's a shame. Laugh. That was it. Laugh, not cry. Chuckling, Kimberly grinned at Mac and his daughter. I'm sure that would be an interesting rental agency. Her heart warmed as she looked at this precious child. Her parents hadn't gotten up and left like Danica's mother, abandoning her. Instead, they'd abandoned her in their hearts and minds, no matter how much she'd acted out in a bid for attention or how much she'd tried to please them. They'd never lavished their love on her, leaving her soul bruised and broken even before her sister's accident. She ruffled soft curls on Danica's head, her heart brimming with a new, amazing feeling. Did it feel like this to love a child? She didn't know how to raise a kid, but she knew too well how not to raise one. Don't call her stupid. Don't leave her to her own devices in an empty room. Don't feed her cold, lumpy oatmeal without even butter or milk in it. Don't think cereal constituted a good lunch. Okay, she could make a long, long list. Her gaze moved to Mac and met his. She read an unspoken request in his eyes. A request she couldn't refuse. If she could brighten this girl's days, even a few of them, how could she not do that? She placed a tender kiss atop Danica's head, breathing in the sweet papaya shampoo scent. I have an idea. How about I rent myself out to you? Well, that didn't sound right. If my uncle doesn't need me at the BNB tomorrow, I could stay with you for a day. Maybe watch movies. I'll braid your hair and your pony's mane, too. Yay! Danica slid from her chair and jumped up and down. We gonna go to my treehouse. Okay. Hopefully, the treehouse was sturdy enough to survive her weight, but Kimberly wouldn't say that out loud. I appreciate your offer. His eyes warmed, and she couldn't look away. Then he turned to his daughter. You do have to go to the daycare afterward. We can talk to the kids who teased you together. Hitting someone is not a good idea. You wouldn't like it if someone hit you. It's better to talk things through if someone teases you. The girl shook her head, sending her hair flying. They ain't gonna tease me again. I got them good. She sighed. Okay, I'm not gonna hit them again. She tapped her lips and scrunched her forehead, then brightened. I'm gonna wait until lunch and throw hot soup on them instead. He nearly choked. That's not what I meant. Kimberly's eyes widened. Raising a kid was a challenge. Raising this kid seemed to be a challenge multiplied by ten. Was she up to it? I can't stay in Cowboy Crossing. And he deserves better than an alcoholic who can return to her addiction any time. He'd been surprisingly understanding about it, but she just couldn't do it to him. Kidding, daddy. The girl giggled. About throwing the soup. Air left his lungs. Good. Duh. I'm not gonna go hungry because of other kids. Oh, Miss Kimberly, are you gonna show me how to dance? Daddy doesn't dance like a girl. Kimberly froze. Over twenty years had passed since she danced. But the girl's excitement touched her to the core. And so did the gratitude in Mac's eyes. I wonder why. I'll try to teach you to dance tomorrow, okay? Thank you. Mac grinned. I love my beautiful girls. He stilled as if realizing his slip. Not that. I meant, well, what I meant. We love you, too, Daddy. The girl's grin looked so much like his. Kimberly's heart expanding in her chest told her she was about to fall in love with Mac, too. No, that was wrong. She'd never stopped loving him in the first place. The next evening, Mac hurried to get home for more reasons than one. First, he'd always rushed to see his darling daughter. Now he also couldn't wait to see the woman who'd once stolen his heart and, by the looks of it, had never given it back. Kimberly will leave soon. His grip tightened on the steering wheel, as if he could hold her in place, make her stay. 
but she really wasn't a horse. He couldn't control her, and he wouldn't want to. Danica wasn't an easy child, according to the town's opinion, and for that reason, nobody agreed to babysit her any longer. Thankfully, with the exception of her grandmother and aunt. He twisted his hands on the wheel. He should have done a better job teaching Danica manners. Though it was no excuse, Liberty had taught her niece to be outspoken by example, and children could be cruel sometimes. When someone called Danica stupid or talked bad about her birth mother, the girl didn't know how to answer. So she responded with her little fists. After he'd taken her to a child psychologist, the episodes became rarer but didn't stop completely, no matter how he tried to convince her that using those little fists wasn't the best way to solve her problems. How had Kimberly survived babysitting today? Not that she'd call his daughter stupid, of course, but Danica also could have those moods when she sulked and became difficult. He parked in front of his house, hands still fisted to the wheel. Lord, please help my little girl. He'd checked the cameras on his phone through the day, justifying it to himself with the possibility of a stalker. Thankfully, they'd seemed safe. But usually, babysitters had hightailed out of his house with the promise never to return. He didn't want Kimberly to do the same. He forced his grip to loosen, one finger at a time. She was going to leave soon anyway. He didn't want to listen to his inner voice as he strode to the door. He'd made sure to leave work early today. One minute spent with Danica was one minute too many in some people's opinion. One had to be resourceful, open-hearted, and open-minded with his daughter, and Kimberly seemed a tad uptight now, with the exception of that amazing kiss. With Danica, people had to open their heart and go with the flow. He unlocked the door with his key, entered, and froze. This couldn't be happening. Was he hearing things? Almost holding his breath to listen, he followed the laughter to the kitchen. He'd done his best to make Danica laugh, but he'd rarely heard that precious sound. He rounded the corner, and his eyes widened. Covered in flour, Kimberly and Danica stood there, pointing fingers at each other. Not many times in his life was he speechless, but this was one of them. W.H., what happened? The flour bag got torn. Huh. It looked like Kimberly just went with the flow indeed. His heart shifted, and something important in his life changed in that moment. How he missed the sound of their laughter. He missed seeing Kimberly and Danica happy. His shifting dreams readjusted. Seeing these two precious girls happy became his dream. He was a simple guy with simple dreams. But Kimberly had always been a complicated woman whom he could never figure out. One thing was clear, though, her dreams led her far away from cowboy crossing. He straightened his spine. What mattered right now was the smile on his daughter's face, not the ache in his heart. Well, I'm glad this went better than with Ms. Tucker. He ruffled his kid's flower-stricken hair. Danica's giggle subsided, a pout forming on her lips. Ms. Tucker said she'd spank me and I'd never see my pony once she became my new mommy. Breathing became a little difficult. He'd succumbed to the town's matchmaking and gone out with Sally Tucker a couple of times, partly because she'd been so attentive to his daughter. But then Danica had put glue on the woman's chair the second time she'd agreed to babysit. It had taken a lot of effort to separate the chair and the woman, and he couldn't say he'd enjoyed any part of it. Something had to be said for the quality of the glue, though. Dating Ms. Tucker was history and he'd found himself feeling relieved. Munchkin, she wasn't going to be your new mommy. At first, after his divorce, many local women vied for his attention. But as soon as they spent any time with Danica, their enthusiasm evaporated. Danica was his test to prove if any relationship could last. One of them had gotten an extra helping of pepper in her lunch, and Mac had learned words he hadn't heard from his roughest ranch hands as she ran to her car. Another one had tried to spank Danica, but couldn't catch the fast-moving child. When she tried to leave, she found her hand glued to her car door. Danica must have brought the glue from her aunt's house because he'd made sure she couldn't get any of that or sharp objects in the house. Again, the glue's quality was beyond admiration, and the woman's vocabulary was beyond rich. There were more stories, his daughter had been resourceful, 
and word had spread fast that dating Mac and consequently babysitting Danica could be one of the most hazardous things in the world. He'd had long talks with Danica and had a lawyer draw up the agreement he'd have any babysitter sign before she even stepped inside the house. Kimberly was still here. He dismissed the thought as he approached his darling girls. Let me shower and change, and I'll join you. Hurry up, Daddy. Danica grinned, giving him an amazing feeling that never got old. That will give us a chance to freshen up and change, too, right, sweetheart? Kimberly leaned to his little girl. We shouldn't be wearing flour for long. Or at all, for that matter. But it's fun. Danica protested. Kimberly chuckled. It is now. Now, let's all get cleaned. Sending up a prayer of gratitude, he hurried up indeed. After taking a quick shower, he stayed in the closet longer than usual and ended up wearing new jeans and a dressier shirt than baking asked for. Not that he was trying to impress Kimberly. Not at all. When he rushed back to the kitchen, a new surprise awaited him. Chapter 14 Fun dancing beats reached Max's ears. He nearly laughed when he saw Kimberly and Danica. Still covered in flour, besides their faces, they were dancing their hearts out. Unlike Kimberly's, Danica's moves didn't exactly follow the tune, but Kimberly didn't correct his daughter. Instead, she gave her an encouraging smile. Then Kimberly clapped and changed the song to a slower one. How about a father and daughter dance? How come he'd never thought of that? Might be one of many reasons Danica needed a mother. The girl's hair was braided perfectly, too. And far more precious was the happy expression, brightening her face. Joy buoyed him as he lifted his little girl and whirled around the room. Later, she'd need fashion and makeup advice, then advice about the boys, and so many other things he had no clue about. He could give her all his love, but would it ever be enough? He stole a glance at Kimberly, amazed by the enormous tenderness glowing in the eyes focused on his daughter. One would think she was Kimberly's daughter, too. But, while he could give all his love to Kimberly, as well, the past had shown it would never be enough. Sadness wove around the sweet tenderness in his own heart. Maybe his precious child's smile, the one she had on now, could stay the sense of his life. It didn't matter if he missed Kimberly already with his entire being. He couldn't make her stay. Danica giggled. But in a few minutes, she gestured for him to put her down. Daddy, now you dance with Miss Kimberly. Kimberly's eyes widened, and so did his. To hold her in his arms again, to whirl her around the room. His heart started beating faster. That first summer, he'd taken her to the country fair that included dancing on the stage. He could never forget the feeling of having her close for the first time, his arm around her waist and his heart thrashing in his chest. Daddy, down. Danica patted his arm, regaining his focus. Oh, munchkin. Sorry. He placed her on the floor. Daddy, you have flour on your shirt. You gotta brush it off. She giggled as if the flower coating his front, where she'd snuggled, close, had nothing to do with her. So much for his good shirt. He did his best to remove the flower. Now invite Miss Kimberly. Danica gave a demonstrative sigh as if saying, Do I really need to teach you how to do this? Right. He lingered. Huffing, Danica tugged at Kimberly's hand. Invite Daddy to dance, pretty please? I invited a boy to dance at the daycare dance. He looked too scared to say no. He could only hope that one day she'd meet a boy who'd love her as much as he did. Around the age of 30, preferably. Eyes still wide, mouth open in a wordless appeal, Kimberly swallowed visibly. It's been a while since I danced. Same here. Busy life at the ranch didn't leave much room for entertainment. He stepped to Kimberly and extended his hand, his pulse as erratic as when he'd asked her to dance for the first time. Okay, he'd had to ask her to go to the dance about ten times before she'd agreed, but his pulse had been erratic every time. May I have this dance? She shook her head and nodded all at the same time. I might be stepping on your feet. 
Daddy has big feet. He's gonna be okay. With a wave of her hand, Danica dismissed the excuse before he had a chance to. Kimberly leaned to him, but the hesitation lingered in her eyes. Why? Maybe she didn't want to be close to him any longer. He winced as the thought cut deep. I mean. Miss Kimberly, you're not gonna dance with my daddy? Danica's little lips trembled, and she jammed her hands on her hips. A smile warmed Kimberly's face as she slid her hand against his. Of course, I will. But don't tell me I didn't warn you. A new song started that, of course, spoke of love. Despite not having danced for years, either, he led her with confident gentleness. She missed a few steps, without ending on his feet, though, but soon followed his lead, and he let the music carry them away while keeping Danica in the corner of his eye. Today is the first time I've danced since my sister died, she whispered. He closed his eyes, breathing in slowly as every bit of him ached for her. He'd learned that first summer that dancing and singing was something the sisters had in common, though it was obvious only one of them had wanted to make a career out of it. No wonder, Kimberly couldn't dance all these years. She'd never healed from that tragedy, had she? Seeing her dance with his daughter, having her dance now, with him was a precious gift, not only for Kimberly, but also for him. A new feeling, or maybe a long-forgotten old feeling, enthralled him, making his heart swell. Oh, how he loved having her close, breathing in the sweet scent of her peach shampoo, looking into those baby blues that seemed to mirror his longing. Everything about her was sweet and dear, like returning to a place he'd never wanted to leave. A place where he might not be welcome anymore. He didn't want to think about that. He just wanted to cherish this moment and make it last as long as possible. He knew her so well, her scent, her tiny birthmark on her earlobe, the kindness hidden so deep in her blue eyes only a few people knew about it, even if they bothered to look. Most people probably didn't bother, put off by the cold front. He wasn't most people, and neither was his daughter, who could often see with her heart much better than others could with their eyes. He glanced at Danica, who was watching them with the wide grin of a person who'd done her job well. And she had. Maybe someday he could thank her. Right now, though, he hurt too much, felt too much, feared too much. I missed you so much. He brought Kimberly closer as they swayed to the music as if that could help reduce the real distance between them. The longing in her eyes deepened. I missed you so much, too. I didn't realize how much until I returned to Cowboy Crossing. A new song started. But he didn't let her go, and she didn't ask him to. Same here. He'd never been the conversation type. Horses didn't require much conversation, though he'd probably talked to them more than he talked to people. He'd rather show his affection with actions than with words, the Missourian in him. But when he hadn't showered his dates with compliments, some of them blamed him for being uncaring. Large gatherings could be difficult sometimes, but Cade usually took care of the conversation with jokes and stories. But with Kimberly, he could be silent, and that was all that was needed. It was like she understood him better than anyone else had, even when he'd said nothing. Maybe when he'd said nothing she understood him best of all. But had she understood herself? She'd been hurt so badly, she'd learned to push people away, if not physically, then in her mind. It was easier for her that way, but did it make her happy? Did her success in the corporate world make her happy? Or did she feel something important had been lacking in her life for years like he did now? I'm here to stay. I'm not going anywhere, he said, hoping she could hear him over the music. Her fingers tightened around his as if she tried to hold on to him without realizing it. I know, but... I'm not what you need. Why don't you let me be the one to decide what I need? He glanced at Danica, making sure she hadn't gotten bored and decided to scurry somewhere else. But surprisingly, his daughter who could make him tired running after her, stayed glued to the floor. Okay, glued wasn't the best choice of words. Why don't you stop running, Anne? I have. Hurt flashed in Kimberly's eyes, and he scolded himself for causing it. I stayed in the same place and at the same job for many years. That wasn't what he meant. He wanted to say she'd been running from herself, but he held silent, unwilling to cause her more pain. 
He was probably one of the few people who knew how fragile she was, just like the porcelain horse statuette she'd once given him as a gift. Clumsily, he let it slip from his fingers, and it broke. Just like that, he let her slip through his fingers, too. His rib cage, constricted with a sense of loss of things that couldn't be glued, ahem, put, together. The tempo picked up, and he moved faster, glad when she followed his lead, with ease. What I meant. If you need me, you know where to find me. Her eyes softened. I know. It means more to me than you'll ever know. The end of the song seemed to ask for dipping, so he dipped her. When he brought her back, he stared into her blue eyes after the song ended. Danica clapped, bringing him from his mental fog. Daddy, let's make brownies. Whoa. He needed a second to regroup and think straight again. Letting Kimberly go with reluctance, he leaned to his daughter. Munchkin, I thought you wanted to bake cookies? He'd gotten cookie mix after all, not brownie mix. What the girls were doing getting into the flour, he'd never know. Exasperation crinkled her little forehead as if she couldn't believe he couldn't understand simple things. Daddy, brownies should count as cookies. Why? He smiled. Because they are made with chocolate. She spread her hands, apparently bewildered he even had to ask such things. He couldn't help grinning. He'd learned early enough that it was best not to argue with a woman. Kimberly chuckled. Okay, let's make brownies, then. I have no clue how to make them, though. All the brownies I ate have come from a bakery box. Well then, internet to the rescue. He ruffled Danica's hair, still sporting plenty of flour. But promise not to cover me with any more flour. He glanced down at his front. Fresh flour on his shirt and jeans showed where Kimberly had moved close to him in the dance. Daddy, that was an accident. Hmm. The mischievous look in her eyes suggested that might not be entirely true. He and Kimberly laughed. An accident we now need to clean up after. Her laughter sang into his ears, loosening the remaining tension from his shoulders. Remember that statuette. Look, what happened to that porcelain beauty? He couldn't keep it whole. Maybe he couldn't keep Kimberly whole, either. He should learn from his mistakes and move on. The thought added tremendous weight to his shoulders. Face it, he didn't want to move on from Kimberly. He pulled up a brownie recipe on his phone, then placed it on the counter, closer to her. He knew so much about her. That she liked to wear dangling earrings and took her coffee with two French vanilla creamers. That she had difficulty letting people in her life. Once upon a time, he'd known every tiny freckle on her face and what she liked for breakfast. Knew her favorite color, car, movie, song. But even then, he didn't know how to make her stay. He didn't know how to make her happy, and that seemed very important right now. About half an hour later, he placed the tray into the oven and set the timer. Well, that's done. Daddy, don't burn them. Danica pressed her face close to the oven door. Careful, sweetheart. That door gets hot. I wasn't going to burn them. I set a timer. We'll check on it. Kimberly smiled at his daughter, then high-fived her. He swallowed hard. A bond was forming between Kimberly and his child. What would happen to Danica when Kimberly left for Chicago? If things went like this, Danica might be heartbroken. Did he make a mistake introducing her into his daughter's life? His daughter had been hurt so much already, and he couldn't bear the thought of her being hurt again. While the delicious scent of baking brownies spread in the kitchen, he placed the cooking utensils into the dishwasher. The girls' laughter rang from the bathroom where Kimberly and Danica were cleaning off their flour coating, now with extra cocoa from the brownies. But his stomach twisted. He was about to surrender his heart to his first love, but he was a grown-up. He could survive a broken heart, again. But could he survive seeing his daughter's little heart shattered to pieces? She was so fragile, despite everyone's opinion otherwise, so could she survive it?
Kimberly approached the black mare, with white spots in the stable, carefully, very carefully, apprehension, swimming in her belly. This was so not a good idea. But she wanted to be part of Mac's world. The stalker hadn't shown up so far, so she persuaded herself and Mac she could take a short, very short, please, ride. This is Inkblot. Hello, Inkblot. Mac touched the horse's neck, his voice soft, soothing. Here's my friend, Kimberly. I hope you'll like her. What was she supposed to say? Greet a horse? He turned to her. Inkblot has a mild character, and I think you'll get along just fine. Kimberly wasn't so sure. Even the name was a little frightening. Okay, so the creature looked like someone had shaken ink all over her. But if she'd been named that for making ink blots out of those who rode her. Uh, okay. He leaned to her, his breath caressing her cheek. Talk to her. About what? Don't you think, ink blot, it's fine weather today? Kimberly swallowed. Hi, ink blot. Maybe it would help to wave, so she did. Ink blot eyed her. Let her get used to your scent. Then you can groom her. Giving her a treat wouldn't hurt either. He passed her an apple. Right. Her mind foggy from his proximity, she gave Inkblot the apple, hoping the mare wouldn't help herself to a few fingers, as well. Those were some big teeth. He brought her brushes, and she brushed the mane. The horse seemed to like having her hair brushed as much as Danica did. Good. Good. Lord, I know I haven't talked to you in a while, but maybe you could please help me survive today? Did God still listen to her prayers, or was she still on her own, still in her tower of loneliness? The horse whinnied, as if feeling Kimberly's distress. They can feel what you feel, he whispered to her. Well, great. Wasn't this getting better and better? Kimberly spread her lips so wide they hurt and tried to think happy thoughts. Maybe this could help calm her raw nerves, too. There was horse therapy for a reason. Mac had told her he needed to discuss something, and she thought it would be a great idea to do it while strolling, or whatever the word was, on horses. After all, he loved them so much. Not a great idea at all. After she'd groomed the mare, he saddled Inkblot. He led them both outside to the meadow where his younger brother, Cade, whom she'd met in one of those summers as a teen, waited for them. Cade led two ponies, one with Danica perched in the saddle, the other carrying a boy of around the same age. So cute in their cowboy boots and helmets, they both sat there looking like naturals. Kimberly wasn't going to look like a natural. Not one bit. She suppressed a sigh. Danica squealed at her. Hello, Miss Kimberly. Look at me. You're doing great. Hello, Cade. Kimberly. Welcome back. His voice didn't sound welcoming at all, but then it softened as he introduced his son, Landon. Wait for me. I'll bring a horse so we can ride together. Max strode toward the stable. Wait for him? She nearly snorted. Like she could mount on her own. He reappeared leading a magnificent stallion, and even she, who knew nothing about horses, felt admiration unravel inside her. And the way he looked at that horse. Wow. Let me help you mount. He lifted her as if she weighed nothing, and moments later, she was in the saddle. Those moments in his arms still made her heart beat a staccato. He showed her how to use the reins and how to make Inkblot turn right or left just by squeezing her knee or laying the reins alongside her neck. The mare started trotting, and Kimberly was very proud of herself for staying in the saddle so far. He left her to mount his stallion. Danica on her cute pony approached. Miss Kimberly, are you gonna stay a while? We gonna have coconut cookies later. Wanna some, too? Coconut cookies. Her sister's favorite. Kimberly froze, but somehow managed to smile for the child's sake. Thank you, sweetheart. Some other time. Then the accident's image flashed in front of her eyes. The screech of metal crashing. The scent of something burning. The metallic taste of her own blood. 
Kimberly shuddered with her entire body as her veins seemed to fill with ice. Inkblot whinnied as if Kimberly's distress somehow passed to her indeed. The next thing she knew, the horse went into a gallop. What? Kimberly clutched onto the reins, but she wouldn't be able to stay in the saddle for long. She was sliding to the right already. How? Did. One. Break. On. A horse? Her feet weren't even in the stirrups. She was going to fall. She shuddered again, and it didn't seem to reassure Inkblot one bit. Chapter 15 The thunder of horses' hooves behind her reassured her, but not enough to stop her insides from trembling. Her heartbeat thudded in her ears as hills and meadows passed in a blur. What if? What if something ahead blocked them and the horse needed to jump over? Reins. She tried to pull on the reins, but they slipped from her hand. Just great. Now what? Clutching the pommel, she couldn't breathe and could barely think. This was going to be it. The realization sank in, and blood crystallized in her veins, teeny shards poking at her. Lord, didn't I ask to survive today, please? This wasn't what I had in mind. Mac appeared near her, catching up without a visible effort. Mac. She thought she screamed at the top of her lungs, but no sound left her lips. He leaped in the air, and the next moment he was behind her, his arms stretching around her to catch the reins. Once he did, he pulled on them gently. Her jaw slackened. How? How did he even manage to do that? Of course, he was an experienced rider, but this. Wow. Inkblot slowed as if feeling the reassurance of a familiar, confident rider instead of a trembling mess who didn't know what she was doing. It's okay. It's going to be okay. He patted Inkblot's neck. She wasn't sure whether he was talking to her or the horse, but his words seemed to calm both of them. As she felt close to him, her heart didn't try to break her rib cage any longer, and she managed to get some shaky breaths into her starved lungs. Thank you, Lord. The unexpected prayer appeared in her mind, but she had no mental energy to examine it. Mac turned the horse around and guided her toward where his thoroughbred had been galloping. Huh. It looked like the horses were trained to return home if riderless. Thank you, Mac, she said as if he could hear her over the wind. Now, safe and without her insides trembling like jelly, she eased back against his chest. Feeling his large form near her, enveloping her, filled her with yearning beyond comprehension. A yearning that only grew with every passing minute. He leaned forward, his lips near her ear. Would you like to stop for a little while? Oh, to feel the earth under her feet again. Yes, please. She perked up. Then added, no offense, inkblot. The horse whinnied. She'd have to ask Mac to translate later. They stopped at a meadow, and he dismounted, then helped her dismount, sending a wave of awareness through her body. While Inkblot munched on the grass, Mac made sure they stayed hidden by a large tree and searched Kimberly's eyes. Are you okay? I can imagine how scared you were. I'm fine. Sorry about this. If I ever do this again, that was a very big if, I will need the oldest and slowest horse in the stable. Just make sure she can support my weight. Wrinkles crinkled around his eyes while his lips stretched. It was my fault, too. I should have given you more lessons first. Tenderness filled his eyes before his face took on a neutral expression. I have some new information. Oh, okay. She did her best to school all disappointment from her features. She missed that tenderness. On a positive side, that competitor who once threatened you with never again words retired right before the mugging attempt. Not so positive, Susanna's brother is living with her now, drinking a lot and not working. She grimaced. I have difficulty believing she'd want that promotion enough to ask him to harm me. Or maybe he volunteered. Talking to the neighbors didn't result in much. People saw you, but that was about it. Rubbing a sudden chill from her arms, she took a deep breath of fresh air. 
How sweet that smell of grass and foliage, so full of life, so like Mac, so unlike her and her world. Yeah. I know. I'm not the most sociable and trusting person in the world. But to me, you're the most beautiful. He coughed a little as if he'd said too much. How well do you know that Kansas guy? He considered her the most beautiful person in the world. Breath caught in her throat. She tucked the thought away to treasure later, when? Best not to think about it. Um, what did you ask? Oh, about Kansas. I've known him over ten years, but we became friends about four years ago. Why? Don't you find it strange that he usually jogs with you, but that evening he was running late? And then he showed up exactly when you were mugged. She shrugged. Things happen. Do you? Have you? He cleared his throat again, dug the toe of his boot under some decaying leaves, and watched them fliff away. Have you always been only friends? Um, I'm asking purely for investigation purposes. That jealousy flashing in his emerald green eyes contradicted him. His hint of jealousy warmed her, though, frankly, there was no reason for it. He wanted us to be more than friends, but I couldn't make myself fall in love with him. But he wouldn't harm me, because I refused him. A muscle moved in his jaw, his beard moving with it. No man wants to be friend-zoned. Saving you from the mugger would make him a hero in your eyes. Make you look at him differently. Oh please. She rolled her eyes. This is ridiculous. He's the one who found me a self-defense instructor after the mugging. Why would he follow me in a black sedan with tinted windows? Ransack my apartment? He frowned as he looked around. To make you scared and make you run into his arms. She shook her head, sending her hair flying around her face. But I left instead. Did he want you to come back to Chicago? Did he promise to protect you? Yes, she whispered. But it couldn't mean much, could it? He stepped to her and ran his fingers along her jaw, sending a delightful shiver down her spine. Do you even realize how attractive you are? He opened his mouth as if he wanted to say something else and dipped his head. Her pulse skyrocketed. Then he stepped back. I don't want us to stay out in the open long. Was it disappointment in his voice, or was it her wishful thinking? Again, he helped her mount and swung himself up on inkblot behind her. Her aching awareness of him only threw her thoughts and emotions into more turmoil. But by the end, she even had a little stab of regret when they entered the meadow near the stable and he helped her dismount. Cade and the kids rushed to her, this time accompanied by Liberty with her signature green hair. Kimberly had met Mac's sister one of those long-ago summers, but a gut feeling warned her that after the way she'd left she wasn't Liberty's favorite person in the world. Considering Liberty had been outspoken and rough around the edges even as a teen, Kimberly could imagine the warm reception she'd be given now. Guilt stung. She deserved that. Miss Kimberly, we worried about you. Danica wrapped herself around Kimberly's legs. But I knew Daddy was gonna bring you home. Kimberly's heart squeezed. Thank you, sweetheart. Daddy gonna bring you home. I'm so glad you're okay. Relief shone in Liberty's eyes, too. Thank you. Kimberly braved a wobbly smile. Maybe she was wrong, after all. Liberty lovingly stroked the horse's neck. I was talking to Inkblot, who you spooked. But yeah, good thing you're alive, too. Comforting to know that some things, and some people, never changed. The next evening, Kimberly paced the bee and bee's hardwood floor. The call from her boss, she'd given him her throwaway phone's number yesterday, in case of emergency, had rattled her. The company might lose the bid. Her stomach tightened. It wasn't about the promotion anymore. It was about company loyalty, and he'd made sure to emphasize that. She didn't want to be like her father, leaving work when they needed her the most. Drawing a shaky breath, she felt like someone jerked the round green rug from under her feet. She'd started to hope she'd found a place where she'd belonged, be it in this small town or in Mac's arms, but she'd been wrong. Her place was in Chicago. 
wasn't it? But she could hardly bear the thought of leaving, as if she'd put roots here already, and they'd taken. Mac and Danica. Kimberly groaned. She knew she'd have to leave, but not so soon. Too soon. Not enough time. What to do? At the movement downstairs, she rushed there. She smiled as she greeted her uncle and his wife. I hope you had a great dinner. He studied her, and his gray eyes dimmed. You have to return to Chicago, don't you? He knew her well. A lump grew in her throat so big she couldn't say a word, so she just nodded. Please eat dinner first. Mrs. Annie handed her a phone box, its delicious sense enticing. Can you wait until the morning? Maybe fly back? I don't want to leave my car. I know it's a long drive. I'll eat, sleep for a few hours, and then leave. Unless. Unless you need me to help you finish the renovations. What I need is for you to be happy. He rested his hands on her shoulders and squeezed. Come back any time. The lump grew even bigger as he hugged her. Leaving now was so much more difficult than at seventeen when she'd had an illusion of returning in a year. This time, the pain was crushing her heart, and a sense of betrayal weighed down her shoulders. Leaving Mac and Danica behind tightened her chest and crushed her breath. How could she do this a second time? Mrs. Annie hugged Kimberly next and whispered in her ear. What about Mac and his daughter, dear? They'll be better off without me. Mac and I both know we're not meant to be. Did she try to persuade them or herself? I think Mac and Danica would have a different opinion. Her uncle shook his head. It's not like I'm running away from my feelings for Mac and getting attached to his precious daughter. I mean, I do need to be in Chicago. He'll meet a woman better suited for him than I am. Mrs. Annie pursed her lips. He met plenty of women already. Well, it's your life. Just be careful, okay? Now, go eat. Yes. Thank you. Kimberly tried to swallow past the lump in her throat. Despite the enticing smells, she doubted she could eat a bite. She had the difficult task of calling Mac and telling him she wouldn't be seeing him or his little girl soon. If ever. Chapter 16 Mac tossed and turned most of the night. Finally, he gave up on sleep, slipped from his bed, and tiptoed to Danica's room. He held his breath as he watched his little Jim breathe evenly, the dim nightlight holding her in a warm glow. Printed ponies pranced over her tiny pajamas, and the high-spirited creatures frolicked on her white blanket. Danica was the reason he hadn't jumped behind the wheel of his truck and followed Kimberly after she'd called and told him she was leaving for Chicago. To make sure she was safe or stop her from leaving, he wasn't sure. His hands fisted. Maybe Cade was right, and letting her into his heart again was ridiculous. Look how it all ended. Again. He'd done his best to close his heart to people after his father died. But he couldn't do it when he'd met his ex-wife. And he couldn't do it when Kimberly appeared in his life, knocking the air out of him with her elbow. One way or another, she could always take his breath away. For a few minutes, he looked at his daughter, tenderness filling the achy empty spot Kimberly had left inside him. Then he tiptoed back into his room. He checked the time on his cell phone. Two o'clock in the morning. It was too late, of course. But Kimberly must be driving, and most likely, she had a hands-free phone. He stared at the phone screen. What kind of sucker for punishment would want to call her after she'd hightailed out of his life again? Whatever. Didn't matter what names he called himself, he wasn't ready to break the bond between them yet, even if she was. No matter what common sense told him, he couldn't let her go this time. Maybe they could try a long-distance relationship? He said a prayer for her, then found her phone number and swiped the call button. She answered on the second beep. Do you hate me? Whoa. Not the greeting I expected. Maybe he should hang up. I mean, she gulped, for leaving for a second time. I'm sure you had your reasons. Hold on. He didn't hear a motor. 
Hope stirred. What if she'd come back? Where are you? Please tell me you're still in Cowboy Crossing. I'm in a rest area. She gave the landmark number. My eyelids were drooping, so I decided to stop and stretch my legs. Deflated, he suppressed a grimace. Sorry for waking you up. Don't apologize. I. I'm glad to hear from you. W. Was Danica upset we didn't get to bake cookies? She'll outgrow it eventually. Besides, I did bake a batch of cookies with her. Didn't burn a single one. Somehow, though, it would have been more fun if Kimberly was there. Danica thought so, too, and wasn't shy about voicing her opinion. Oh. Good. I probably would have. I don't remember the last time I baked cookies. It's a shame. He wished he could see her eyes, touch her hand, hold her close. It's a shame you had to leave, because of your job demands. While a long-distance relationship was better than nothing, he'd miss all those things. He missed them already. He missed. Kimberly. It is. She paused. I'll be back as soon as I can. Which probably would take years. He rubbed a cold hand over his face, trying to slow his breathing, slow his thinking. Say the right thing. Maybe you should fly back. I don't know if it's safe for you to drive at night or stay in a rest area alone, for that matter. What was he thinking? He wasn't there to keep her safe. Sure, he couldn't leave Danica. And waking her up now and taking her to her grandma wouldn't be good for the girl. But someone should be with Kimberly. Maybe he should have asked his brother or sent a ranch hand with her. I have my gun. I didn't make it far yet. Still the same peaceful county. I'll be fine. Really. She disconnected before he could stop her. He paced the room. Whether her stalker was real or imaginary remained to be seen, and he couldn't let her drive by herself at night. Restless, he sent up another prayer for her. What to do? A key turned in the lock down the hall. Wincing, he snatched the key from the nightstand drawer and hurried to open the safe before retrieving his gun, he'd kept the safe locked because curious little girls could get into things they shouldn't. Heart pounding, he crouched into the hall. What, are you going to shoot your mother? The familiar whisper reached him before he could do anything crazy. Lowering the gun, he shook his head. He rather smelled her perfume than distinguished her silhouette. Mom, what are you doing here in the middle of the night? He kept his voice low. Good night vision, by the way. Right now, doing my best not to wake up my granddaughter. The scent moved toward him. Whom I'm going to babysit for the rest of the night and morning. That meant he could catch up with Kimberly. His chest expanded as he turned on a lamp on the side table. Do you mean? Go bring your girl back. Or follow her to make sure she's safe. Do whatever you need to do. And next time, do me a favor. I need to hear about things that happen in my son's life from my son. Not from my neighbors. Mom, you're the best. He kissed her cheek. I know. She waved him off. He knew the rest area where Kimberly had stopped. It wasn't that far. If he floored the gas pedal, he might catch up with her. Lord, please help me. And please keep my little girl safe in your care while I'm away. Promotion or no promotion, Kimberly couldn't risk Danica's well-being for her career. She stared at her phone long after she disconnected. On the other hand, investigating what was happening would be so much more difficult far away from Chicago, even with Mac helping her. And she wanted answers. Her life had revolved around her job, and she deserved that corner office. Her boss needed her help. And unlike her father, she wasn't going to run away from her issues. Her stomach clenched, demanding the sweet oblivion of the liquid that could make everything better, even if for a little while. But wasn't it what she was doing now? Running away from her feelings for Mac that scared her? Loving someone meant opening herself to pain and guilt, and she knew it too well. 
Was her job her reason to return or her excuse? Lifting her chin, she forced herself to turn the key in the ignition. Her phone rang, and she flinched. Another car pulled into the rest area, and she drew her purse closer. Cold traveled down her back. Mac was right. Stopping here wasn't a good idea. She should be more aware of her surroundings. She was so not cut out for this. She glanced at the screen, and relief escaped her lungs. And then she felt something else, something she didn't dare to name yet. Hello, Mac. I'm on my way to you, almost there. Are you still in the rest area? Are you okay? The fact that he cared this much, even after she'd left him for the second time, reached deep inside her heart. I'm still at the rest area, but I'm about to leave. I'll come back. There was a pause. Why? I thought you'd be glad. Did that come out defensive? I am. Very much so. But you sound tense. Weird. And I'm not glad about that part. A suspicious car just pulled in near me. She took the gun's safety off and waited, every cell in her body on high alert. I'll be with you as soon as I can. The car pulled to a stop ahead of her and didn't move. She eased her car into gear and moved forward. Something tightened around her lungs, making breathing more difficult. Why are you so nice to me? I think you can take a guess. She watched the car, then searched inside herself and found hope. Despite everything? Because of everything. The next evening, Kimberly strolled the aisles of the only grocery store in Cowboy Crossing, rolling the cart in front of her. If she was going to stay here longer, buying groceries was only fair, and she'd talked her uncle into giving her a list. She'd slept through part of the day to recover after the night's drive, then completed more painting. Yesterday, Mac had followed her to the B&B, walked to the door and then inside. There, he'd kissed her senseless, igniting more desire than she'd ever experienced. She still had lightness inside her and delirious bliss as a well-kissed woman should. Careful joy warmed her as she placed tomatoes, then onions in the cart, to join many items already there, loving the normalcy of the task. Returning to Cowboy Crossing, and into Mac's arms, felt like returning home. While that didn't make sense, she cherished her peace now. Huh. She found herself singing a tune and stopped in her tracks, causing another shopper to bump into her. Sorry. She moved forward. She hadn't been singing since, since the accident. Could this place heal her? Feeling even lighter, she went through other aisles until she reached the cookie aisle. And there they were. Coconut cookies. Her sister's favorites. The crystal reforming inside Kimberly shattered again as if a brick was thrown at it. The shards cut over existing wounds, then punctured her lungs, making every breath excruciatingly painful. Why? 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 It had been over twenty years. Why did it still hurt so much? Her legs took her to a different aisle, as if her body knew what she needed before her mind realized it. She stared at the rows of wine bottles, white, red, rose, and yearning filled her every pore. She. Needed. This. No way around it. This was the balm to soothe the pain. This, and only this, worked. So what if it destroyed her liver, and probably her mind in the process, made her a shell of her former self? She needed the sole painkiller now, and it was right in front of her. Just for tonight. Her uncle might be upset, but he wouldn't judge her, would he? She grasped the bottle and ran her fingertips over the smooth surface, the gesture like an intimate caress. She didn't even want to wait until getting to the BMB. Oh, how she was desperate to take several sips right then and there. Okay. Okay. A deep breath filled with the scent of fresh vegetables. Of course, she wouldn't do that. But she could already taste the sweet liquid in her mind, anticipate the relief it could bring, even if for a few hours. Wine could be good for you. If used in moderation. The issue was the moderation, but maybe she could stop after one glass. Couldn't she? 
Her phone rang, and she placed the bottle in the cart and pulled the phone from her jeans back pocket. Something inside her shifted at Mac's number on the screen. Guilt? Nostalgia? Longing? Attraction? Everything rolled in one? Her heartbeat picked up as she stepped aside and swiped the screen to answer. Hello, Mac. I wanted to make sure you're okay. And, um, if you're not too busy, could you please come over? Danica made a drawing for you, and, um, she has something else for you, too. I hope that doesn't sound silly, but... Breathing became easier as his voice swept away the glass shards in her lungs. I need to finish getting groceries and drop them off at the BMB. But then I have the evening free. She stared at the bottle. How about I'll see you both in an hour? Well, her evening wasn't free before he'd called. It was going to be occupied by a rendezvous with Chardonnay. Great. His voice perked up. Danica will be thrilled. Just Danica? She cringed. What about you? She had no right to ask when she had nothing to offer in return, and she still blurted it out. Me, too. The softness entering his voice cradled her, held her up. See you soon. Wait. I'll bring cake. I'll pick it up at the store right now. I know I helped you cook twice and everyone stayed alive. But miracles don't happen three times in a row. Any preference on your or Danica's part? She loves red velvet. Thank you for asking. After he disconnected, she slipped her phone back into her pocket, able to fully breathe again. Sorry, darling. Our rendezvous just got cancelled, she whispered to the Chardonnay bottle, low enough no one would overhear her and consider her crazy. She gave the smooth bottle one gentle stroke and eased it back on the shelf before she could change her mind. About an hour later, she was at his house, greeted by the enticing aromas of grilled chicken and potatoes, as well as Danica squealing, Miss Kimberly. As she leaned to hug the girl, emotion clogged her throat. She was going to leave a part of herself in Cowboy Crossing, a much bigger part this time. She'd need a notion of Chardonnay to soothe the pain from that. But for now, she could treasure every moment. I hope you like red velvet cake, she told Danica. Another squeal. My favorite. I love you, Miss Kimberly. Tears burning behind her eyes, Kimberly whispered, I love you, too. More than you'll ever know. Something changed inside her. As she held the precious, precious girl who knew too much suffering in her short life, Kimberly knew Danica was her daughter. She just knew it. No, of course, she realized that they weren't blood-related, but it didn't matter in the least. Danica was her daughter, and images flashed in her mind. Danica telling her about her first boy crush. Them shopping for outfits and makeup. Having their hair and nails done. Talking about everyone and everything. Danica informal where at a high school party Mac and Kimberly were sure to chaperone. Danica in a graduation gown. Danica in a wedding gown. Kimberly wanted it all. To be there for this girl when she fell in love, graduated, got married, had a child of her own. Kimberly wanted the impossible, and she blinked fast not to let her tears spill. The girl eased out of her embrace. I'm gonna be right back. She ran toward what Kimberly guessed was her room. Straightening out, Kimberly handed Mac the cake. Their hands brushed against each other, and she went liquid like the drink she craved so much. The memory of yesterday's kiss made her heartbeat go wild. His eyes widened. He must have felt it, too. He cleared his throat. I'm glad you're here. Me, too. Though being near him and not touching him, not hugging him, not kissing him, well, that was torture. He took her hand, and a longing blazed through her with incredible intensity. I couldn't let you go. Not yet. And she could never let him go. But she'd have to do that. Her pulse buzzed from his simple touch. Miss Kimberly, look at the drawing I made for you. Beaming, Danica gave her a large sheet of paper. Her breath caught in Kimberly's throat. 
there were three people holding hands on it. A tall bearded man with green eyes, a woman with shoulder-length hair and blue eyes, and a girl in green overalls, her hair in two braids. A gray kitten curled up nearby. It was a family. Yet, one person didn't belong on this drawing. Kimberly. Do you like it? Danica grinned. Did she ever. It was a masterpiece, the best one in the world, to be held forever in the museum of her heart. I love it. Thank you so much. I'll treasure it forever. She placed the drawing on the coffee table to take with her later and did her best to concentrate on something besides the waves sweeping her up. She recalled the pet in the drawing. So you got a kitten? Ahem. Matt cleared his throat. Well, not exactly. The girl shook her head, sending pigtails flying. No, you got a kitten. Kimberly's forehead creased as she looked from Mac to Danica and back. I don't understand. But she started having a feeling what this was about. Gonna be right back. Danica darted away again. When the girl returned with a gray kitten squirming in her hands, Kimberly chuckled. Another stray, she whispered to Mac, who nodded, having the decency to look a little guilty for setting her up. Danica's lower lip stuck out. He needs a new home. He's gonna love you forever and ever. You're so nice and kind. Please take this kitten. Pretty, pretty please? The kitten meowed pitifully, doing his part. Laughter burst from Kimberly's throat. I can see how nobody could refuse you. He shifted from one foot to the other. Well, not quite nobody. But we've supplied many homes in town with pets. My sisters, check this kitten. The little fella is healthy. He's had all the necessary vaccines. But you don't have to take him if you don't want to. Daddy. Danica sent him a reproachful look, then lifted the kitten. See? He wanna be your pet. Kimberly wasn't so sure. But as she stroked behind the tiny animal's ears, he didn't scratch her, so that qualified as something. An unexpected wave of tenderness unraveled inside her. She thought about her empty condo without even a single plant. She didn't choose this pet, didn't even think she needed one, but as she took the kitten from Danica's hands and stroked his soft fur, she had a similar certainty to the one before. This was her kitten. And as she looked at Mac, the same certainty permeated her entire being. This was her man. Her stomach twisted. Well, she couldn't have this man or this girl, but at least she could have the pet. For the time being, they left the kitten in Danica's room. After eating a yummy dinner and tucking Danica in bed, they tiptoed back into the living room, and Mac gestured to the sofa. Her heartbeat kicked up, but his serious expression told her this was about something other than sitting side by side holding hands and, okay, kissing. Disappointment sliced her. I need to talk to you. He took a seat. Chapter 17 Kimberly claimed the space near him, apprehension, clogging her throat. Oh, okay. Remember the investigation I started on your behalf? He didn't wait for her answer because clearly this was a rhetorical question. I have some results. Less than I'd like, but still. Go on. She folded her hands in her lap, focusing, even though it took a gigantic effort to be near him and remain in a business mode. Dara checked the backstory on Susanna's brother. Guess what he was in prison for? Her insides went cold. Theft and burglary? Yes. Might not mean anything, or he might be the guy who mugged you. Now, I hope it's okay to talk about your ex-fiancé? It's okay, she said fast. I got over him a long time ago. Maybe she'd never loved him, just did her best to. Like I said before, he's not doing so great. After you left him, his business fell apart. What you don't know is that he's been heard at bars saying it was all because of you. That you wrecked his life. And he drives a black sedan with tinted windows. She sighed. I still have difficulty believing it could be him. I have to pass the information to you. He took her hands. Now, about Mrs. Becker. 
puzzled, she frowned. What about her? Nobody with the name Mrs. Becker lives on the floor beneath your condo. It belongs to a guy who has been working in California for months. He couldn't be suspecting a sweet old lady of hiring a guy to mug her and beat her up and then ransacking her apartment, could he? Why would she do that? Well, Mrs. Becker is his aunt, condo sitting for him while he's away. Beneath his beard, his jaw tightened. I hope so, too. After some research, Dara managed to connect with him. And guess what? He couldn't mean, her mouth slid open as the realization sank in. She licked her lips and forced herself to ask anyway. He didn't have an aunt condo sitting for him. He didn't have anybody living in the condo. Bingo. Then. Then the old lady deceived me. More than that, she'd moved into a place she shouldn't have after breaking in? I know it sounds strange. The entire situation sounds strange. One more thing. The brooch Mrs. Becker gave you? Yes. Turns out, it's antique and probably valuable. He reached into a pocket and passed it back to her. She took the brooch from him, warm in her hand from his body heat. It was all too much to comprehend. How, was this possible? We need to get to the bottom of this. Here's what I'm thinking. He drummed his hands on his thighs. My mother wants to take Danica for a few days to travel to her sister, and Danica is excited about it. My aunt has a bunch of pets. Kimberly's lips curved up, though she was going to miss that cutie. I can imagine. I think we should fly to Chicago and visit the condo where Mrs. Becker was staying. See what we can find. The owner already gave me permission. I don't know how we're going to enter the condo, though. She blinked. I have a key. Mrs. Becker gave it to me, in case she had a fall or was ill and needed help. Great. Let's see if we can talk to Susanna's brother and if he looks like the guy who mugged you. Pay a visit to your friend Kansas. Might as well visit my wonderful ex, too. She did want to solve this mystery, and compassion for Mrs. Becker, whoever she was, stirred her. The woman must have reasons for her actions, after all. Are you sure you don't mind? Not at all. He tucked a strand of hair behind her ear. She gave out a little gasp while the blood rushed faster in her veins. With an effort, she pulled back. The attraction between them swirled, nearly tangible, and she knew him enough to recognize the look in his eyes. He was about to kiss her, and she wanted it with every fiber of her being. But she needed to tell him something. Wait. The single word she spoke seemed to strike him like a slap in the face. The light in his green eyes dimmed, and she hated it. I understand. You're not ready. I respect that. Really? She was ready yesterday, but now she wasn't. And people complained about women's logic. She couldn't suppress a groan. It's not that. I was looking at a bottle of Chardonnay today. I was desperate to drink it right there in the store, before you called. A muscle moved in his cheek, one side of his short beard twitching. Did you? What? Did you drink it? His eyes darkened a little becoming a shade of emerald that hid his emotions. No. I put it back. But it wasn't easy. Sometimes just the scent of coconut or the sight of coconut cookies can make the craving overwhelming. How could she make him understand? She couldn't. Nobody who didn't go through this himself or herself could comprehend. But you're trying to do your best. You're sober. Yeah, but for how long? Fisting her hands, she looked away. You deserve better than this. Especially after everything you went through with your ex-wife. He drew her into a hug, soothing her raw nerves. There's a big difference between you and her. You asked for help. You did everything to get better. She refused to admit she had a problem. She never accepted my help, and believe me, I tried. I'm sorry. For what? He stroked her back, every stroke healing another broken part of her. 
for not being there for you when you needed me the most. She'd been swimming in an ocean of guilt for most of her life, half-drowning sometimes, gasping for the air of self-forgiveness her starved lungs needed the most. It wasn't your fault. I need to know you forgave me, she told his chest, then looked up. At the overwhelming tenderness in his eyes, she nearly came undone. I forgave you a long time ago, and now I know your reasons, there's nothing to forgive. He was kind. He'd always been. And he wasn't as judgmental as before. But even if he'd learned to compromise, she'd hurt him once, and she might hurt him again. Him and his little girl. Despite that, when his lips found hers, she couldn't gather enough willpower to withdraw. As she drank in his kiss like that air of forgiveness saving her from drowning, she let the incredible feeling sweep her up, breathe delightful hope into her every cell. She dissolved in those incredible feelings until she felt breathless, until she couldn't think of anything else. Until she knew she'd never taken her heart back. Two days later, everything felt surreal as a taxi carried Mac and Kimberly to her condo building. Without paying attention to the streets around them, he allowed himself the luxury of taking her hand in the cab and laced her fingers through his, but her gaze was sad. His mind still whirled after her admitting how much she'd craved alcohol, that she nearly drank again at the mere reminder about her sister and the accident. He'd been shocked when she'd told him about her alcoholism the first time, but he'd taken it as something she'd left behind. Could he trust she wouldn't relapse when she didn't even trust herself? Was he putting his daughter in another bad situation? He'd be willing to risk his heart a second time, but he could never jeopardize his daughter's happiness. He closed his eyes and rested his head against the headrest, fighting guilt. He should have thought about that before kissing Kimberly. And more than once. His heartbeat skyrocketed at the memory. Just like decades ago, he had zero resistance to her. Zero. But he wasn't a hormone-charged teenager any longer. He had responsibilities, a lot of them. Maybe that was why her gaze was sad. She understood they'd have to go their separate ways eventually. For now, he promised to be there for her. He was a man of his promises. Minutes later, they were in front of Mrs. Becker's door. She hesitated. Is this considered breaking and entering? He chuckled. It's a bit late for that. Besides, I have permission from the condo's rightful owner. Still, might be a good idea to wear disposable gloves. He pulled some from his pocket. So they did. Okay. She slid the key from her purse and opened the door. They entered, and Kimberly gasped. This place was burglarized, too. Mac cringed and nodded as he pulled his phone from his jeans. I'd better call the condo owner. A few minutes later, he stepped to her. He'll call the police, and he'll be on his way back here as soon as he can. He gave us permission to look, but very carefully, not disturbing anything. She sighed. That would be a challenge. Okay, I'll look in the closet, bedroom, and bathrooms. I'll cover the living room, the kitchen, and the office. He opened the desk drawers. At the second one, he bent closer. Kimberly, you might want to see this. She came running. What is it? A clue where she might be? He showed her a gray wig. Maybe a clue of the person she is. Or rather, who she is not. I don't think she was an old lady. Nodding, she edged closer. I found makeup and stomach padding to confirm that. Why the act? To hide one's identity. We don't even know if Mrs. Becker is a man or a woman now. A woman. Surely I would have realized if she wasn't. The things in the bathroom, the clothes left behind. I feel a female touch. There are, um, female hygiene items, too. He cleared his throat after a pause. Any clue how to find that woman then? The corners of her lips turned down. Nope. He hated to see her disappointed, but it was not the place or the time to draw her into a comforting hug, no matter how much he wanted to. We'd better get out of here, before the police arrive. 
Once outside, he braced himself for the big city fumes and sounds and missed the peacefulness of his ranch. His chest tightened, a reminder that he and Kimberly lived in different worlds. Back to the present matters. Are you up to visiting Susanna? It's a weekend, so she might be at home. Maybe we'll even get a chance to meet her brother. She grimaced, then nodded, bravely. He studied the beautiful face he loved and the background he didn't like at all. He ached for some magical door to open and take them to a place where they could both be happy. For him, the ranch was such a place. For her. Was Chicago? He wasn't sure such a place existed. She'd built a tall tower around her heart and locked the doors and windows there, but it didn't seem to make her happy. Not like when she'd spent summers at the B&B in their small town in the Shomi State. He'd spend as much time as needed to climb up that tall tower, but would she ever let him in? Kimberly pulled up their rental outside the two-story stucco house in the Chicago suburb where Susanna lived, grateful for having her address because Susanna had once hosted a small office party here, probably eager to score brownie points with the boss. Mac opened the car door for her, and they walked to the house, her hand in his, as if it always belonged there. The rhythm of her heart was higher than usual, and as much as she tried to attribute it to their investigation, she knew better. Just like the responsible, caring man he was, he'd stood by her side when she'd needed it, no matter past hurts. While it healed a part of her, it had also added a few boulders to the mountain of guilt she'd already carried on her shoulders. As soon as they reached the door, he pressed a finger to his lips as if he heard something, and she froze. Sure enough, someone was shouting. She hesitated, then pressed the doorbell. Go see who that is, a male voice bellowed. The door opened, and Kimberly's jaw slackened. She'd never seen Susanna like this. Susanna had always been perfectly made up and dressed in the office. Now her face was puffed as if from crying, her blonde hair ruffled, and her bathrobe tied askew and her slippers stained. Worst of all, she had a black eye. Susanna's eyes narrowed. Yes, I got the promotion you wanted. Now leave me alone. The door started to close, but Mac placed his foot to stop it. We just have a few questions. May we enter, please? Though quiet, he spoke with an authority one couldn't ignore. Susanna stared at him. Who are you? Kimberly stepped forward. I don't care about that promotion any longer. But, are you okay? And can we do anything to help? She realized it was true. She didn't care about that promotion anymore. The news about losing the job she'd coveted and worked so hard for left her, relieved. The promotion would come with more hours in the office and more pressure, and suddenly, she realized she could breathe better without it. She'd wanted to make something out of herself as if that could compensate for her sister's death, earn enough to buy her parents' love that should have been given to her unconditionally. But now she wanted something different. She didn't know what it was yet, except that she wanted Mac and Danica to be part of it and had no clue how to make it happen. The thoughts whirled in her head as Susanna gawked at her. You'd want to help me? Are you kidding? What's going on there? A stocky man with beefy cheeks and beefy hands, dressed in gray sweats, shoved Susanna aside and stepped onto the porch. His facial features were similar enough to Susanna's to show they were siblings. A stench of stale alcohol drifted to her, mixing with the scent of freshly cut grass, and bloodshot eyes with a map of dark blood vessels showing on his face proved it wasn't the first time. The night of the assault flashed in her mind, bringing a mental hit to her solar plexus. Just like then, she struggled to breathe, but she needed to remember. No, that guy was taller, much taller, and less stocky. She didn't see the mugger's face, but that much she remembered. This man probably had mugged other women. But not her. She glanced at Mac and gave him a barely perceptible headshake. Oh, hello there, you cute thing. The guy's tone changed as he leered at her. Goosebumps erupted on her skin, and she couldn't say a thing. Mac stepped forward, shielding her, and towered over the guy. This is Susanna's co-worker, Kimberly, and I'm Kimberly's boyfriend. What? Boyfriend? The guy retreated. 
Hey, I didn't mean a thing. Then he looked at his sister. Hurry up and finish this office meeting. I'm getting hungry. He disappeared behind the door. Blood seemed to drain from Susanna's face. Well, you know my life. Happy now? Actually, no. Kimberly fished out her business card and scribbled her throwaway cell phone number on its back, before handing it over. You don't have to live like this. Give me a call. We'll try to come up with something together. Mac flexed his knuckles. I could have a talk with the guy, too. Susanna's shoulders slumped. Just leave. Compassion stirred Kimberly, and an urge to hug Susanna surged through her. And to think all these years she couldn't stand her. She was supposed to be upset with Susanna for using her vacation to steal the promotion. Instead, she was grateful. Okay. We'll leave. Congratulations on your promotion. I mean it. I really do. She and Mac turned around and walked down the steps and sidewalk to the rental car. Footsteps behind them made them both whirl around, Mac's arm already lifted as if to defend her. Susanna stopped, breathing hard. Why do you have to be so nice? You make me feel guilty. Kimberly placed her hand on Susanna's forearm but removed it fast in case the gesture was unwelcome. Don't be. Guilt will corrode you from inside until nothing is left. Believe me, I know. She hesitated, then added, if your brother ever decides to go to Alcoholics Anonymous, I can get you a lot of information. Susanna's mouth opened, closed, then opened again. How do you? My father was an alcoholic, though thankfully, a non-violent one. Anne. I used to be an alcoholic, too. How freeing saying that felt. Susanna's eyes widened. She kept quiet for a moment, then nodded. Thank you. Anne. I'm sorry. The corners of Kimberly's mouth lifted a little. Don't be. Do call me if you need me, please. She felt lighter, as if a few boulders rolled off from that mountain pressing on her and making it hard to breathe. As if, at least when it concerned Susanna and the promotion, she'd have some sort of closure. Chapter 18 when Kimberly and Mac drove away from the suburb, he found her hand. You're pretty amazing. You know that? Her heart fluttered as she made a turn. No, I didn't know that, but thank you. She wanted to talk to him about so many things, but she couldn't. So she switched to something much sweeter as she glanced at his handsome profile. How is Danica? He'd talked to his daughter on the phone most of the way to Susanna's place. His face lit up, and for some time, Danica dominated their conversation as Kimberly negotiated the vehicle onto the freeway. Then his tone took on a businesslike mode. Are you up to seeing your ex? You don't have to if you don't want to, you know. She sighed. It needs to be done. Larry lived in a different condominium building than she did, and she was grateful it was far enough from hers. When he opened the door, dressed in casual jeans and a t-shirt, so unlike his usual polished suit and sleek hair, he grimaced. If you're here to apologize, you're too late. I'm getting married. He frowned at Mac. And who are you? If he was getting married, he couldn't be holding a grudge against her, right? Congratulations, she sang out. And nope, I'm not here to apologize. I think it should be the other way around. By the way, he's my boyfriend. Though technically it wasn't true, a pleasant wave spread inside her at saying the words, and a part of her, okay, all of her, wanted it to be real. Did jealousy or sadness flash in Larry's eyes? Then it hit her. What if he'd beat his new fiancé, too? Should she warn her? She exchanged a silent message with Mac, who probably thought the same thing. Pleased to meet you. The guys shook hands, though Larry looked anything but pleased. Based on his sour expression, he wasn't excited to get married at all. Well, I'm kind of busy right now. Larry waved them off. We wanted to know why you say, everywhere, Kimberly ruined your life. Mac's voice was authoritative again. 
Larry sighed. Just drunk and talk. Believe me, I won't be mentioning Kimberly any time soon. Mac nodded. See that you don't. Another deep sigh. Ah, my fiancé is a bit on the jealous side. Who's there? A solidly built woman appeared near Larry. She stared at Kimberly, eyes narrowed in an unwelcoming glare. Kimberly nearly stepped back, recognizing the owner of a large corporation she'd helped Susanna do an advertising campaign for. The woman's publicity photos didn't tell the whole story. The very tall woman with a stocky build seemed to have more than a few pounds on Larry. Rumor was she used to box in high school. Larry's voice turned to honey. Just a co-worker, my love, and her boyfriend, with some business things that couldn't wait until Monday. They're already leaving. His eyes begged them to go. Yes, we are. Kimberly could barely suppress a horrified chuckle as she and Mac hurried back to the rental car. As she started the engine, Mac said, well, at least I can't imagine him hitting that woman. No, me neither. Now I've met her, I can't help wondering if she was the mugger. I assumed it was a man, because he, or maybe she, was so strong. She risked a glance at Mac. The concern in his eyes almost undid her. Do you want to go to the police? I have no proof. And she's a respected businesswoman, so it's hard to imagine. What other leads do we have? Is it me, or do all the roads lead to Mrs. Becker? He nodded grimly. I think they do. I wish we knew where to find her, or at least what her last name is. Praying for it. She had a hunch to check her business email before driving off. First, she might as well send a kind email to her boss for giving her promotion to someone else. But then, she hadn't shown up when her supervisor had asked her to. Besides, relief that she didn't need to compete any longer made her bones light. Okay, maybe not. Second. She couldn't explain it. It was as if someone tapped on her shoulder and whispered into her ear to do it. Hold on a moment, okay? She opened up her business email account on her phone. She scrolled through a bunch of unopened emails and disappointment stabbed her. She ran a search on Becker and it yielded zero results. Well, it would be ridiculous to think she'd send me an email, right? I threw away my phone, so she doesn't have my phone number either. He rubbed his temple. How about checking for direct messages and private messages on your social media accounts? Even if you're not friends or not following each other, she could send you a message, right? She pulled her shoulders back. Right. Now, I'm the one who is supposed to be good with social media, and how did I not think of that? Well, I should be useful for something, too, right? He grinned, quirking his beard up on one side. Oh, even with his beard, that grin was going to be her undoing. Just one look into those green eyes, like the hills and meadows he loved so much, and her skin prickled with desire. Concentrate. She checked her social media accounts, then froze. You were right. She showed him the screen. This is Mrs. Becker. Please call me. She'd listed a phone number. Her pulse accelerating. Kimberly punched the numbers. No answer. Her stomach dipped. Hmm. She doesn't know this is your phone number. Maybe she's afraid to answer the phone, thinking it's someone else. His voice was quiet. Right. She sent the person she knew as Mrs. Becker a PM. I'm going to call you from this phone number. Kimberly gave the phone number for her throwaway phone and waited a few minutes then called again. The woman answered on the second beep. Are you okay? We need to meet. How about Café Citroën? Kimberly knew the place. It was small and secluded. Would you be able to see me there in about half an hour? Depending on the traffic. I'll do my best. There will be. My boyfriend will be with me. A pause stretched. Okay. Thank you. See you there. She disconnected. As Kimberly drove off, she glanced at Mac, excitement and worry building up in her belly. 
Can this be it? We'll finally find out what's happening? Praying for it. Though, he seemed to stop himself from saying more. Though? When this is all over, you'll return to Chicago. I won't see you for another two decades. Sadness permeated her, soaked her every pore, as if she'd just run under a pouring rain of desperation. I. No. I mean, I have to return here. Yes. But it won't be that long before I'm back. Would it? And did she? Did she have to return to Chicago? The job had lost its luster like a swanky car after a wreck, all scratched and dented, and not even a cat waited for her in her empty condo. However, a kitten did wait for her at the ranch. I could never forget you. I don't want to forget you. His hand reached for her as she made a turn. Her breathing went shallow from his simple touch, and concentrating on her driving became more difficult. Her entire being craved the love and stability he'd once promised. Her mother's shouts rang in her ears. You're a ticking bomb. I never know when you'll start drinking again. More memories. Their father had left a few times, and then the sisters had been yanked back and forth between the two households. More scandals, more shouts, more broken dishes. You can't be responsible for them. You're either drunk or hungover most of the time. Well, you don't care about them at all. You just want them out of spite. Kimberly winced as she passed a truck. She was a ticking bomb, too. Like father, like daughter. Mac and Danica deserved better. Much better. Realization prickled at her with tiny shards. I can't forget you, too. But. I'm not good for you. For you or your daughter. He removed his hand. Why don't you let me decide? If you think about it, you'll find you have doubts. After what you've gone through with your first wife, you'll never trust me completely. Besides, we live in two different worlds. I want to trust you. I want to make this work. To figure this out. I still have feelings for you. Her heart leaped into her throat as she moved into a different lane. Oh how badly she wanted to make things with him work. Me, too. On all accounts, though I'm trying not to be selfish here. The rest of the way he was quiet, and she ate. If only she could go back and redo so many things, from staying at home the day of the accident to avoiding that first glass of alcohol to coming back to Cowboy Crossing to make amends sooner. But she couldn't. She had to live with the consequences. As they entered the café that smelled of coffee and freshly baked pastries, she zoomed in on the patrons, wondering if Mrs. Becker was already there. Not that Kimberly knew what the woman would look like now. A few young couples hovered over their meals with eyes on each other. A clean-shaven guy in a suit sipped coffee while texting on his phone. An old man with a white mustache and beard in a wrinkled suit hunched over a glass of water and a pastry. A twang of disappointment. I don't think she's here. Maybe she's not coming at all. We don't know that yet. Mac gestured to a table where he could sit with his back toward the wall and have a clear view of the entrance. So they sat and ordered coffee. After a few minutes, the old man joined them. Excuse me, but, Kimberly gasped. You can't be. The person leaned forward and whispered, yes. It's me. The voice was unmistakably female. I'm sorry, I'll need to explain. It's a long story. Her mouth still agape, Kimberly nodded. I used to work in the theater, so I'm good with the makeup and have the supplies. I had unofficial access to a theater's costume department for the props I needed. I had to look like someone else to be safe. Pain flashed in Mrs. Becker's eyes. I married a wealthy and powerful but very abusive man. He's ruthless enough to kill me rather than let me get away. I needed to escape and disappear, so I'd been planning things for some time. He didn't let me access a bank account and the credit cards were all in his name. All I could take was a few clothes and what I'd managed to squirrel away from my allowance. Folding his arms on the table, Mac kept his voice low. So you became a house squatter? 
How did you get the keys? The owner is someone I've worked with. When I heard he was leaving to work on the West Coast for most of the year, I dropped in on his farewell party. Easy enough to borrow his keys from the kitchen. I slipped out, made copies, and returned his keys. She snorted softly. I didn't want to break the law. The funny thing is, if I'd asked him to let me stay there, I'm sure he would have said yes. But I couldn't risk anyone from my old life, knowing where I was. The waitress interrupted the recital with their coffees, as well as the old man's water and pastry. Thank you, my dear. The quavering voice of the old man switched back to a younger woman's as the waitress moved out of earshot. After your neighbor left Chicago, I waited till my husband was on a business trip, then I made my move. I stayed at the condo while I tried to get fake documents so I could make it abroad. That proved harder and more expensive than I expected. I didn't have the right criminal contacts or enough money. So why did you give me the brooch? The question popped from her mouth, though Kimberly kept her voice barely audible, too. I brought it with me. I can give it back to you if you want. She reached into her purse. No. I gave it to you because I wanted you to have it. The other woman touched her hand to stop her, and a smile tugged at the fake beard. You were so nice to me, kind to someone you believed to be a much older woman. It's been a while since I encountered that type of kindness. I wanted to show you I appreciated it. A peach cobbler would have done the trick. Kimberly tried to comprehend everything that was happening. That elicited a low chuckle. Yeah. Well, like the apartment key, I also wanted you to have it in case something happened to me. I knew my husband would find me sooner or later. He's not a man who gives up easily on anything he thinks is his. When I ran out of money, I took a big risk. Dropped the disguise, went to my husband's bank, and talked them into letting me take some of the jewelry. The brooch was part of it. So all this was about the brooch? Mac had told her it could be valuable. Kimberly's jaw dropped as the pieces of the puzzle fell into place. Since you gave the brooch to me, I've suspected I'm being followed. She racked her brain, struggling to recall the timeline. I'm almost certain the stalking started the next day. Could he have been trying to get the brooch back? I was wearing it the day my apartment was burgled, so whoever broke in wouldn't have found it there. Even through the disguising makeup and the white beard, the woman's surprise and alarm were obvious. She reached out a hand to Kimberly. Oh no. I'm so sorry. I promise you, I wouldn't have given it to you if I imagined you'd be put at risk. He surely wouldn't be after the brooch, it's nothing compared to his wealth. It's mine, anyway, not his. It belonged to my great-grandmother, but he took it off me for safekeeping. What day was your apartment broken into? Friday. The same day she'd run to Cowboy Crossing and to Mac. Hunching over the table, Mrs. Becker clutched her forehead. I received a warning on Friday morning, an anonymous Facebook message telling me I wasn't safe and to move on. I took it seriously and disappeared again. My guess is my husband somehow found out about our friendship and thought you could lead him to me. Your burglary probably wasn't looking for the brooch, but for clues they could use to track down me. But how? Kimberly glanced at Mac, but his focus was on the door. Then his eyes widened. Get down. Before she could realize what was happening or make a move, he threw himself over her. Shots thundered in the air. The blood turned to ice in her veins. As she struggled to breathe under his weight and pushed against him, something hot and sticky slicked her fingers. Everything became still as if somebody turned off the sound. She knew people were shouting, knew more shots thundered. Yet she couldn't hear a thing, not even her own heartbeat, though her heart was thumping with almost enough force to break her rib cage. But she needed to hear. Oh how desperately she needed to hear Mac breathing. Because the liquid on her fingers was his blood, not hers. Chapter 19 It was just a scratch. Mac scowled. Just why was everyone making such a big deal out of this? Thank God, the bullet had only grazed his shoulder. He'd had worse injuries after falling from a horse. 
Still, Kimberly had gone ballistic, okay, the wrong choice of words, and had dragged him to the hospital, then insisted on him being admitted overnight. Women. Well, a small part of him warmed that she'd cared that much, and his skin prickled as she held his hand in a dimly lit hospital room. It's not a scratch. You were shot at. All, because of me. Tears pooled in her beautiful eyes. He used the thumb of his free hand to swipe them away. Really, it's little more than a scratch. Nothing serious. I'm glad I was there for you. And it wasn't your fault. I'm guessing when we get Vera to check it, she'll find there's some type of tracking device attached to the brooch. A sigh escaped her lungs. The brooch that was in my purse. And I dragged you into this mess. If he wasn't all bandaged up, he'd pull Kimberly into his arms and kiss all her doubts away. Or Mrs. Becker's Facebook account could have been hacked or her phone calls traced or all of the above. There are loads of possibilities. With the culprit dead, we have no way of knowing. Hopefully, what Mrs. Becker did will be ruled as self-defense. If she hadn't been a good shot, we'd probably all be dead. Kimberly's shoulders slumped. Rage rising inside him, he took a deep breath of air filled with antiseptics and a welcome hint of her peach scent to calm himself down. I can't believe there are men like her husband, who believe they can own another person. I know all human lives are valuable, and I hate saying this, but at least he can't hurt her any longer. Or me. She leaned to him, then sniffled. I, I was so afraid I was going to lose you. You won't get rid of me this easily. Forget his injured shoulder. He hugged her, grateful for her presence, even more grateful that she was okay and safe. His chest expanded with all the love it could hold, and he wanted to keep her in his arms forever, but he couldn't do that. When she eased out of his embrace, her eyes were dry, but an emptiness in them hurt him, hurt him far worse than being shot, scared him far worse than seeing that gun aimed at them. As if he were losing her already. His gut twisted. He couldn't let that happen. Yes, she was an alcoholic, but he'd learned from his past mistakes. Learned that someone with a drinking problem needed support, not judgment. Learned to be more patient with a woman he loved. He'd already called Danica, listened to her day, and told her about his, omitting the shootout, of course. He'd asked her opinion about having Kimberly in their lives and received an enthusiastic response. He took another deep breath, doing his best to find the right words. His heart thudded. Would you ever consider staying in Cowboy Crossing? With me? What I am trying to say is. Her lower lip trembled. Don't. Please don't. I only bring grief to the people I love. I can't do this to you and Danica. His heart tumbled to the floor. What? How can you think that? Do you know how happy you make me feel? How happy you make Danica? You're in the hospital because of me. I wouldn't call it happy. She placed both her hands around his. Don't ruin this. I want to enjoy the minutes and hours we have left. Please. How could he make her understand that he didn't want just minutes and hours, but a lifetime with her? The next day, Kimberly looked at her packed suitcases near the bed in the B&B, feeling a hole in her chest. Her uncle and his wife had given her privacy after expressing how much they'd wanted her to stay. It was hard to say no to the people who'd been much better parents to her than her own. Then she squared her shoulders and climbed the stairs to the third floor and her childhood room where Mrs. Annie had said a present waited, whenever Kimberly was ready. It was for the best for everybody if she left, right? She carried enough guilt already. She looked out the window at the spectacular landscape of luscious hills and meadows she'd grown to love. Without her realizing it, this place had claimed her heart forever. Then her eyes widened. It couldn't be. A few letters were wobbly, but there was no mistaking what they spelled in the meadow in front of her. Love you, Kay. How had he done it? With a tractor? It didn't matter. Her heart flip-flopped. She could so easily imagine herself staying in Cowboy Crossing, helping Mac raise his precocious girl, spending a lifetime with him. 
though with the all-consuming feeling toward him that permeated her entire being, even a lifetime didn't seem enough. Happiness could be at her fingertips as if she could touch it like she could touch the window. But that happiness might come at a cost of suffering to others. Probably to her, too, because if she ever slipped back into her addiction, he'd be as judgmental of her as he was of her father. How could she walk away from this amazing declaration of love? But walk away she must. A small selfish part of her yearned for him to compromise for her, to show that her job and life was valuable to him, instead of him expecting her to drop everything and move to Cowboy Crossing. Not that she'd accept that sacrifice, but it would be good to know he'd offer. Egoistical on her part. She knew that. How she wished she could talk this over with her sister, the way they shared everything in childhood and adolescence. Maybe she should ask for guidance from God, but God stopped answering her questions a long time ago. Because you stopped asking them. The thought was crystal clear, but she dismissed it. She opened the nightstand drawer, and her heart twisted at the sight of a photo album. Knowing what she was going to find there, she sank onto the bed when her knees went weak. As she opened the cover, she was nearly shattered all over again. So many pictures of her and her sister as children, running around in the fields, laughing, making peach cobbler, bringing home armfuls of wildflowers, and of course her sister dancing, dancing, dancing across pages, across time, across Kimberly's heart. A ballerina who stayed forever young and beautiful. So much life and love that was gone. So much guilt that stayed. Her fingers shaking. Kimberly placed the album on the nightstand. She couldn't have the conversation with her sister in reality, but she could have it in her head. I'm so sorry, sis. I'm so sorry. Please forgive me. Why do you have to be sorry? Why do you carry the guilt? Kimberly winced. This thought was crystal clear, too. I wanted to have that stupid makeup. If not for me, you'd still be alive. Nonsense. It wasn't your fault. It was the drunk driver's fault, the guy who t-boned the car. Wide-eyed, she stared into space. Was it her sister? Or was it God talking to her? Then why would God bother to talk to her now, when he hadn't done so before? Because you never opened your heart. She placed her palms between her knees to stop them from shaking. Was this true? Was it what she'd done? Closed herself to God and to people to avoid getting hurt again, nursing her pain and guilt as if that would somehow keep her sister alive. What about Mac? It was my fault he was shot. You weren't the guy who fired the gun. She rolled the answer in her head. Okay. Okay. She could breathe easier as if some pieces of her started assembling again, glued by God's love. Some, but not all. Regret sliced along her wrists, like a knife, to cut veins. What if I start drinking again? She waited. You can't live your life, based on what-ifs. Well, she did a good job of that so far. She'd never forgive herself if she hurt Mac and Danica. Why do you let your guilt be bigger than your love? She didn't know the answer, except that she needed to let go. She needed to set her guilt and her pain free, like she and her sister had set butterflies free after capturing a few. Let love fill her. More shattered pieces of her pulled together. Drawn by the sunlight, she looked out the window again. Lord, I can't do this on my own. If Mac is the man you meant for me, please guide me on how to make it work. I love him and Danica so much. Please forgive me for walking away. Please heal me. Please make me whole again. In Jesus' holy name, Amen. His heart beating fast, Mac brought his truck to a stop near the BMB that now boasted a large welcome sign, open for business again, and helped Danica out of her harnessed booster seat. Most of his family was already here, and he wasn't sure whether to cringe or be grateful. When he'd shared what he was about to do, they'd decided to show their support. Kimberly paused in front of the large dark red brick building, a pet carrier with her kitten in her hands, her bags obviously already in her car. Her gaze was so forlorn that his heart constricted. His little daughter's palm in his, he strode to Kimberly. I want to find a compromise. 
I could spend some time in Chicago. Maybe you could come here for long vacations? There's teleconferencing, though I'd rather see you in person. I just want to be with you. There. He laid it all out there. Bear. Eyes wide, she gave him a long look. You'd do that for me? Yes. A pause. No she shook her head for emphasis. No? His heart tumbled down into the grass. This wasn't going well. At all. She waved around. This is your place. You're needed here. You're loved here. You told me once this land claimed you. This is where your heart is. My heart is with you. His pulse erratic, he stepped to her and searched her eyes. I love you. The words he should have said all those years ago, but hadn't. I think she already figured that out. That was his charming brother, Cade, of course. Not helping, Mac threw over his shoulder. Cade harumphed, probably from Liberty elbowing him. Kimberly's lower lip trembled. You can love me, knowing everything about me? Yes. Just the way you are. Now and always and forever. He meant every word. Danica agreed to go to Chicago, too. Yeah. Daddy promised me a kitten and a dog. Danica grinned. And we'll be visiting here lots. Okay, maybe he had to use a few bribes, but a man had to do what a man had to do. And now was the time to show that he meant business. He waved, and his family plus her uncle and his wife rolled out a large sign that spelled Marry Me. He leaned to his gem. Aren't you forgetting something, Munchkin? Oh. Yeah. She searched in her pocket and came up with a small velvet box. Then she walked to Kimberly. Will you be my new mommy? Kimberly gasped, and tears filled her eyes. Liberty muttered, that was not the way it was supposed to go. Kate's son ran to Danica. Cuz, you need to ask her to marry your daddy. The little girl placed her palms on her hips. Well, how else is she gonna be my new mommy? She's gotta marry daddy. Duh. A few chuckles erupted in the crowd. The love of his life smiled at him. Only a few days ago, I probably would have said no. But I'm a different person now. There's something about this place that can be cleansing to old wounds. Something healing. Hope unraveled inside him. It is. There is no other place on the earth like this. Her eyes became pensive, but she stood taller than before. I've held on to guilt and pain for so long that I didn't let anyone close to me. I don't want to live like that any longer. I know one can't relive the past, but maybe we can build a different kind of future together. Cade picked up his boy and placed him on his shoulders. I sure hope that means yes. Kimberly laughed, the sound music to Mac's ears. Yes. A million times yes. One of the BNB guests stopped and muttered to her friend. I think I'm going to love this small town. His heart soaring, Mac took the ring from the box and placed it on Kimberly's finger. She flung her arms around his neck. I have to return to Chicago for some time to finish things, but I'm going to return. Forever. His heart wanted to leap out of his chest. What? He was afraid to believe it. I turned in my resignation letter. I decided to get off the hamster wheel. I can work as a marketing manager online. I already have a significant client list. Basically, I can do freelance work from anywhere. Why not Cowboy Crossing? Yay! Danica rushed to her and hugged her legs. Then she looked up at him. I'm still gonna get a kitten at least, right? The kitten in the carrier meowed, and Mac lifted his precious daughter. Yes, this one. Head tipped sideways, she thought a minute. A mommy and a kitten. The bestest year ever. As his family cheered them on, he agreed. This was a moment he'd cherish forever, for years and years to come. As people congratulated her and delirious happiness filled her to the brim, 
Kimberly felt warm as if someone enveloped her in an invisible hug. And she wasn't sure, but there seemed to be a faint fragrance of coconut shampoo in the air. Epilogue A month later They are going to kill each other. After they'd listened to his future wife's suggestion, Max surveyed those at the conference table in his childhood home. As much as I love you and respect your ideas, I don't think we should do this. Besides, isn't this family meeting about planning our wedding? He still could hardly believe his dream was about to come true. His heart swelled as his gaze stopped at his beautiful fiancé to become his wife in less than a month. Their wedding day couldn't arrive soon enough. Don't be selfish. Kimberly playfully swatted at him, turning his insides to mush. Let me play matchmaker for once. There's still time to talk about the wedding. For years, I wanted my best friend, Kansas, to find his match and for his boy to have a mom. They are both awesome, even if a little stubborn. Today, I realized Liberty could be his match. Cade stretched his legs, doubt pinching his brows. You did meet our sister, right? I prayed for my friend's happiness today, and then I had this image of Liberty. I think this is a sign she'd be perfect for him. And, truly, it's perfect. He needs someone hard-headed enough to butt heads with. Oh boy. Until Kimberly had the family agree to help her matchmaking, there'd be no talk about the wedding, and that didn't sit well. Besides, Mac guessed his future wife didn't realize yet that ranch life was extremely busy, especially in summer, and every minute counted. And he wanted to support her in everything. But mostly, he wanted to obey God. He straightened his spine. We have to follow God's leading. But how do you imagine them even meeting each other? He lives over 400 miles away, and Liberty is not keen on traveling. She'd been in her summer vacation home twice for all the years she had it. Oh, very easy. Kimberly perked up, waving off his doubt. First of all, he's going to be here for my wedding. After all, he's my maid of honor. Kate coughed a little. But, when Mac narrowed his eyes at his brother, Cade lifted his hands in surrender. If Kimberly wanted to have a guy as her maid of honor, then Kimberly was going to have a guy as her maid of honor. Liberty agreed to be a bridesmaid, Kimberly continued. Eventually. Though I have a feeling it took a lot to talk her into it. This time, Mac coughed slightly. Took a lot was a major understatement. If getting them together doesn't work out, I'm thinking of inviting him and his boy to our resort-style ranch that we hope to open up someday. The cabins for foster teens are going to be ready soon. Besides, we have a pond for fishing, horses and ponies for riding, and other activities. As she turned her hopeful gaze on those around her, Mac nearly groaned. While he loved the idea, they already had their hands full. Adding a place where families could ride horses, fish, enjoy the hot springs, and most of all relax and spend time close to nature was just too much work. Someday and maybe were key words about that project. But the family had agreed to the foster teens camp and started building the guest cabins. And his future wife had poured her enthusiasm into the project, so the least he could do was support her. So your friend and his son are going to be guinea pigs for the family vacation ranch? A teasing grin crinkled Kate's face. Kimberly's eyes dimmed, then brightened as she lifted her chin, her chestnut color hair swishing over her shoulders. I was thinking more in the sense of the test drivers. Do you think he'd want to come here? From what I understood, he's more of a city guy. Mac tapped his fingers against the oak table's smooth surface. He's totally a city guy. But he'd do it for his son, so I can talk him into it. Mac could look into those luminous eyes forever. Okay, then I'm in. Let's talk about the wedding now. Hold on. Kate raised his hand. You all know how much I love our little sister. But, frankly, I feel sorry for that guy. Besides, we all know about her, well, secret. Swallowing hard, Mac pulled his shoulders back. It's been twenty years since that happened. How long are we going to wait until doing something? Until she's sixty? Cade sent an apologetic glance and the charming smile to their matriarch. No offense about the sixty part. 
Count me in, too. Heather looped her arms with her husband's and smiled. Liberty might smack me upside down later, but I'm in. His eyes soft, Cade laced his fingers through hers. I'll take the smacking for you. Now I'll chime in. All eyes turned toward the older woman. No matter that Mac was in charge of the ranch, her vote would be deciding. Silver highlights in her hair glistened beneath the chandelier's glow as she nodded. I'm in, too. Now, Kimberly, tell us about your idea. Well, for one, I can tell Liberty that our new instructor quit and ask her to give Kansas a writing lesson. And then I have an even better idea of how to make them spend time together. After she explained everything and the family had voted unanimously for it, Mac gestured to his fiancé's stack of wedding magazines. I guess you want a big fancy wedding with a reception in a popular Chicago restaurant, right? Kimberly beamed at him. Not at all. I'd love to get married in our small church here with the reception in your backyard. After all, you're rumored to have the best barbecue here. The main thing, I'm going to marry the man of my dreams. He couldn't help himself. As his heart swelled, he drew her to him and kissed her cheek. And that's one of many reasons I love you. I love you, too. An adorable smile curved her lips up to her cheeks, rounding them beneath her blue eyes, making her look even more beautiful than before, if possible. She picked up her folders from the table and passed them to everyone. I've studied menus online, invitation design, and the dress. Here's what I've got. If anyone has any suggestions, I'm open to them. Cade grinned as he opened the folder. Great. Saves us a lot of time. Impressive work. A blush flamed her cheeks. Designing a wedding isn't much different from designing an advertising campaign. Besides, I started working on it when I was 17. Just had to update some things. I already knew then who I wanted to marry and where. His chest expanding, Mac hugged her. I knew it then and there, too. I meant what I said before. I'm in. I'm in it for life. You make my family complete. You make my life complete. I didn't realize this before, but I need you like the air I breathe. After a low whistle, Cade muttered, and I'm supposed to be the eloquent one in the family. Well said, bro looks like you've got your wedding vows down, too. Heather hugged Kimberly, then joined her husband. I'll help book the church and caterers, get the dress, and everything else. I know this town and the people here well. After all, I've lived here all my life. Thank you. Kimberly sent her a grateful smile. I'll help, too. Mac's mother opened the notepad where she kept notes old-fashioned style. When Heather tried to computerize their meetings, she flatly refused. Take a five-minute break, get refreshments, and we'll move on to the ranch agenda. Kimberly turned to Mac. I can't say it better than you did, but. I'll thank God the rest of my life for giving you back to me. Happy tears prickled behind his eyes as he drew her into another hug. You just did. Liberty fumed as she stomped at the backyard reception. Not only had she allowed Mac to talk her into being his bridesmaid, meaning twice now she'd let her family bully her for a wedding but she'd also had to wear a long sticky sweet peach dress and, wait for it, a hat. An honest-to-goodness floppy hat like some joke of a genteel southern belle. Kimberly's maid of honor was afraid she'd grow pink under the Missourian summer sun and had suggested hats with ridiculous flowers. Seriously, why wouldn't Stetsons work for the same purpose? The whole mess was beyond liberty. She drew the line on the shoes and wore cowboy boots, though. Probably something about how she'd been holding the peach-hued stiletto, heel out, had persuaded Kimberly to let her choose her own footwear. No matter her irritation, Liberty wore the stupid dress, ridiculous hat, and a wide smile for her brother's sake. And he looked so happy with his first love who turned out to be his forever love, his green eyes luminous. Liberty hugged him in earnest, and he was one of the few men whose ribs didn't seem to crack slightly when she did that. Congratulations! I'm so thrilled for you. Love ya. 
Such a bright smile illuminated a face once dominated by sadness. Love ya, too, sis. And thank you. Congratulations. She gave the bride a lighter hug, no need to realign those fragile bones yet. Then she breathed in the sweet scent of Kimberly's peach shampoo and whispered into her sister-in-law's ear. If you break my brother's heart a second time, in return I'm going to break every bone in your body. Kimberly winced. That was right. She let Kimberly go and widened her lips in a smile. Welcome to the family. Th, thank you. The newlywed visibly swallowed. Oh, I'm sorry my friend Kansas wasn't able to come. His son got sick. Liberty shrugged. Doesn't matter to me. Her job done, she returned to her seat. With so much happiness around her, her heart should be singing. And it was, but sometimes it turned into a sad tune. Not just because of the weddings, but because of the many kids running around, including her precious nephew and niece. Something broke inside her all over again. Well, nothing a steak and some potatoes couldn't fix. Still, a small part of her couldn't help wishing. Wishing for what? Since that horrible night that had doomed her marriage and left her empty forever, she'd learned not to wish for love. Could that ever change? The end. Acknowledgements. First of all, thank you to God for putting up with me and for all the blessings. A million's thanks to you, my readers, for reading my books, for sending me encouragement, and for supporting me. Heartfelt thanks to author Jesse Gussman for coming up with the idea for this series and for helping me so much on the way. Jesse, you make me laugh, you make me smile, and you make the world a better place. Many thanks to my street team, Alexa's amazing readers, and to my beta readers, whom I love to pieces. Kim, Trudy, Paula, Susan, Jean, Deanna, Sarah, and Andrea, you're all amazing. Thank you, Renata and Edwina, for helping me to name several characters in this book. Thanks to Robin and Lisa for helping me name the horses. I thank you wonderful editor, Deirdre, for coming through for me every time. Last, but in no way the least, thank you, Autumn. You're the best part of me. You've been listening to Show Me a Second Chance. A Cowboy Crossing Romance. Written by Alexa Verde. Text, copyright 2020 by Alexa Verde. Production copyright 2022 by Alexa Verde.